Hey everyone, and welcome to the best of December 2022. For this video, we have 7 hours of horror stories. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. It only takes just a quick second and it helps out the channel immensely. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated as I post long videos just like this one every Tuesday. I hope you all had a good year. I hope you all have a good New Year's. Let me know down in the comment section what some of your New Year's resolutions are. Anyway, sit back, grab a coffee, pack a bowl, whatever it is that you do to relax, enjoy, tell someone you love them, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I'm not sure the proper way to post this, or where to post it, but I'm doing this on behalf of my brother, and this seems like the best way to get his story out. He's always been kind to me and others, but he's battled something I can't explain any better than the words you'll read below. By the time he talked to me about this, it was too late to do anything. I feel helpless. I'm sure he did as well for all those years. Other than this post, I really don't know what else to do. He asked me to transcribe this exactly as he told it and let his story speak for itself. I made a promise to my brother and I intend to keep it. Word for word, this is how he dictated it. If you finish reading this and want to help, I guess the least I can ask of you is to pray. Please pray for my brother. No one deserves this. I guess the best way to start is at the beginning. Ever since I was little, I mean real little, like the toddler years, my existence on this pathetic excuse of a rock has been miserable in some form or fashion. Growing up, life felt off, an insurmountable umbrage during the day, especially bright and sunny days. I didn't really enjoy playtime like my parents said I would. Running around felt hopeless. Toys were just lifeless objects whose only purpose was to placate me for a moment. When my parents looked at me, I could see it in their eyes. They were tired. Hopeless, even. There was always a spark of hope that blew out the second I didn't react in some way they would come to describe as normal. They kept trying, though. In the end, it never worked. While the day had its own trials to battle, the nighttime was the worst of it. I couldn't dream, and when I did, I would awake screaming and terrified. My parents took me to doctor after doctor, and child therapists and psychologists in an attempt to garner literally any modicum of a sense as to what was wrong with me. Some prescribed sleep medications, some called it night terrors. One suggested I've had depression since I was about the age of four. Mom and Dad found it hard to believe that was possible, but the doctors assured them it was a possibility. The amount of time and effort and strain they exerted trying to help me never ceased. All that did was make me feel guilty. Around the time I started to recognize this, the voices started. I grew up in a lower middle class family, so we didn't exactly have money to afford all the visits I would have to the aforementioned doctors. Hell, they couldn't even afford a sitter when they had to go to work. My sister, a few years older than me, used to watch me when mom and dad were gone as both of them had jobs to keep us afloat. Mom and Dad would pick up graveyard shifts from time to time to get a full eight hours during the daytime. The times when I was more manageable, the nighttime made it impossible for both to sleep. So, much like work, they took turns bearing the weight. Mom would try to comfort me as I screamed bloody murder. My dad just held my hand and cried. At least, according to my sister. I think my sister saw the most of it, and thus she tried the hardest to figure it out. She would pry a lot, which I knew she was just trying to help, but it didn't. 
Describing emotions and thoughts I had wouldn't remove the crushing weight I felt from them. On the contrary, it built them up. I stopped speaking about them around age 8 when the voices started. Along with feeling off each day, I would hear them. At first it was just whispers on the wind telling me my life has no meaning, that it was pointless, as were my endeavors. No one actually loved me. Their lives would be better off without me. Despite all this, I did okay enough in school. I tried my best to excel and usually held a decent average. Not high enough to stand out, but not low enough to place me in a special class. English was my best subject and was typically the biggest discussion during parent-teacher conferences. Based on my writings, my teachers knew there was a good kid inside. They just didn't know how to break the mold, so to speak. They noticed my quiet demeanor and tried to get me to play with others and see if they could get me out of my shell. They used that phrase a lot. I tried my best to be what my parents called kind and polite to the other kids, and they were always nice to me. Their words, though, were always drowned out by the replies of the voices. Because of this, I didn't really make any friends through school. My parents shared my medical history with my teachers and the school board in hopes that someone would notice something and figure out the problem. Hell, you're reading this, so you already know nothing ever came to fruition. They couldn't pin it on anything specific, so they could do nothing. Around 10 years old, my teachers started to notice I was squinting a lot whenever I was sat at the back of class and I often sat back there to avoid being noticed, as they put it. They mentioned to my parents I might need to see an eye doctor, and I went shortly after. Turns out I was nearsighted and was prescribed glasses. I'd be remiss to ignore, it felt better with them on for those first couple hours, as I could finally see the sharpness of the world around me. I'd just always thought things were blurry the further they were like the human eye could only see so far. For a few moments, things seemed okay. Mom and Dad said I'd actually smiled. Genuinely. When the doctor tested out my vision with the glasses on, we'd stopped and got ice cream on the way home, and I remember for just a second enjoying that ice cream. For the first time, actually enjoying something. It didn't last long, though. When we got home, the temperature started to drop as a cold front was moving in. The man on the radio had said the front was bringing a thunderstorm with it, but that it would be gone by morning. The sky to the west grew darker as we made our way home. When we got out of the car and walked towards the door, I heard them on the wind. Angrier. More sadistic in nature. They spoke as if through gritted, snarling teeth. Like they wanted me dead. Needless to say, I didn't sleep all that night, and neither did my sister. I had complained of pinching, itching, even scratching and scraping feelings I had while laying down trying to sleep. My sister had looked over my arms, legs, torso, and back but found nothing. I knew it was the voices, but I didn't know how and there was no evidence that this was happening. I told my therapist about it the next day, and the following night, they were worse. I logged that in my mind as another thing to not speak about. They wouldn't let me. I continued to visit the eye doctor in the coming months. It seemed the longer I wore the glasses, my peripheral vision was degrading. When the doctor moved his finger further past my line of direct sight, it would fade and disappear. Each time I went back, it would fade sooner and sooner after leaving the sight of the lenses. Around the lenses, they were just a void. The void diminished when I removed the glasses, but it was still there. Around 12 years old, I started to feel as if something was in the void, watching me, perched in the background, waiting for the night, 
waiting for me to remove my glasses. I was willing to try anything at this point. My sister, my mom, and my dad were all exhausted any time they looked at me. There wasn't malice in their eyes, but I could tell that I was an anchor hanging around their collective necks. So I went to bed one night with my glasses still on my head. That night, I had slept through. Dreamless, but a full night's sleep nonetheless. I felt better in the morning, but couldn't shake that feeling of something hiding on the edges of my line of sight. I kept on this way for the better part of that year. Shortly after my 13th birthday, my glasses broke sometime in the middle of the night. Both lenses. A shattered spider web of clear images. Where the cracks weren't, I could see just fine. At the cracks, though, I saw them. You can call them shadowy figures. Demons, or any other verbiage that basically means dark visions. It doesn't matter. They were there, and they were furious. I don't know how I knew, but I knew I was right. On the way home from school, one outstretched its hand towards me, one finger proudly protruding forward. It reached my glasses and scraped straight down the center of the lens, digging a rough trench straight down, cracking the right lens further. I saw more of them from my right eye after that. Mom and Dad were none too pleased to find my glasses in the shape they were in. They scheduled a visit with the optometrist the next day. My dad was irate. Mom just sat in silent worry. What little sleep I got that night was plagued with nightmares. I was at the age that I could finally recall them by the next day. I was running down a road, flanked on all sides by trees and shadows. I couldn't stop. They were behind me. If I stopped, they were going to get me. I would wake up screaming the second they were on me, clutching me in an embrace that was suffocating. I woke to find my sister holding me and stroking my hair, wet drops falling on my head. That morning, I awoke and the left lens had a similar slash across it. I refused to take them off until the doctor basically forced me that morning. He gave me some glasses of my prescription to test my vision before proceeding with his consultation. My vision was still the same according to him, but my peripheral vision was almost completely gone for some reason. He spoke to my parents on the side to figure out how exactly the glasses broke. But neither they, nor my sister, had an answer. The doctor thought it might have been a bully at school, but that didn't matter in the end as the glasses were still broke. My dad had asked about tougher lenses that wouldn't damage. So easily. If that was the case, but the doctor said I'd already been prescribed the best lenses on the market. At this point, he recommended we try contact lenses and after a brief discussion, my parents conceded. He showed me as well as my parents and sister how they're put in on himself, as he wore them daily. I took the sample glasses off, and immediately the shroud around my peripheral vision gained strength. The voices started in strong, and the shadows were reaching for me. In a rush, almost as if my life depended on it, I put the contacts in. My breathing shallow and frequent. The second I got the left eye's contact in, something happened. My head went quiet. I could see the world around me in such sharp resolution. My peripheral vision returned, as if my eyes had opened for the first time in years. The shadows were gone. I smiled so widely the doctor flinched back and then returned my smile. I think we might have found a solution, he blurted out. I turned to look at my parents and saw them staring in amazement. Mom started crying. I didn't notice until I looked into their eyes, but I was also crying, smiling. 
It felt as if a thousand pounds had been lifted off of my shoulders. My chest. My soul, maybe. I jumped up and hugged my mom. My dad embraced me from behind. Their warmth spread through me, and I was filled to the brim with this feeling of ecstasy. It was the happiest moment of my life. I let go and my sister looked down at me and grabbed my shoulder and rubbed gently, tears welling up in her eyes. She could see it, could feel it. I don't know how I knew, but I knew. We got lunch on the way home at a fast food joint down the road. I hadn't realized until now, but I was starving. I ate two hamburgers and a large fry and even finished off my sister's scraps. From the restaurants to home and all through the day, I could not stop talking about how great the food was. How wonderful it smelled. How much better I felt after eating. I even commented how gorgeous the day was. How great the house smelled. How beautiful trees sounded with the breeze playing at their leaves. I went quiet around dinner time mainly because I didn't want to speak too much and annoy my family. I was quiet for about 10 minutes before mom spoke up. Are you okay, honey? I couldn't help but smile. Yeah, mom. I feel okay. Great even. I elated. Tears welled up in her eyes, one breaking the dam and streaming down her face to her wide open smile. She reached out and grabbed my hand, but said nothing. I don't think she could muster any words. None of them could. But I felt their happiness around me. I knew then and there that all I wanted was to see my mom smiling. To see them all happy. I don't know where the shadow people went. Nor do I know where the empty, off feeling I've had since I was a child went. I only knew one thing. I could not take my contacts out. That night I dreamt. I dreamt of waterfalls and mountains, and of ocean waves tapping at my toes, and the warm, ethereal feeling the sun enveloped me in, of that warm embrace at the optometrist's office, happiness encasing me entirely. The contacts the doctor had given me were supposed to last only for one day, and by the time I had woken up, my eyes were red and slightly irritated. I went to the bathroom and opened the brand new box of contacts the doctor had given as samples, as the ones we ordered wouldn't get there for a week. I stared at myself in the mirror for a long time. I don't know why, but I saw myself for the first time as I truly was. My black hair was thick, my eyes the same piercing blue of my father's. My smile and facial structure matched my mom's almost to a T. Despite how insignificant and degraded I felt day by day before that, it felt good seeing the face in the mirror this way. The feeling pervaded me to my core, and I couldn't stop smiling. I wasn't sure what was going to happen when I removed my contacts and put the new ones in. I thought back to how quickly the beings in the shadows started to invade once my glasses were off, so I could only imagine it would be similar to that. I couldn't have been more wrong. I opened the two new contacts and set them aside the sink so I could grab them quickly. I hesitated, looking at my reflection one last time. Taking deep breaths, I reached up and removed my right contact. Their onslaught was immediate. My right eye's vision started to get swallowed in darkness, and I saw them clearly. They weren't just angry. They were pissed. Several of them reached out and started slicing at me, cutting my arm and chest and cheeks open. I couldn't see the blood, but I felt the warmth leaving my body felt the pain and irritation at their shadowed claws. I stifled my screams and sobs as hard as I could, only a few whimpers escaping. I tried my best to fight through the pain as I reached for the new contact and put it in. 
I almost couldn't get it into my eyes, their attacks heightened. At one point, one of the demons sliced my pinky finger off. Or so I felt. I rushed and jammed the contact in my eye and closed my eye, hoping that it seated properly and wouldn't fall out. The pain all over my body stopped. I blinked a few times, the relief spilling into me. They were gone. They were only going to get stronger. It was an ironclad thought in my mind, as clear as two plus two. I knew the left would be just as hard. It had to be done, and I took several long, deep breaths before making my move. This time I perched the left contact on my middle finger so I could swiftly put it in without taking an extended amount of time reaching down for it. Good thing, too. The second I removed my left eye's contact, they sliced my pinky and ring finger off of my left hand. I started to scream but suffocated it with all my might. I flipped my middle finger over my left eye and shoved it towards it before they could reach my hand again. The contact seated and I closed my eyes. I blinked and the pain once again receded. I looked at my hands and body. No missing fingers, no cuts. The shadows were gone. I exhaled a few tears streaming down my face onto the bathroom counter that I was clutching as if it were a cliff wall and I would fall if I let go. The redness of my eyes retreated, but the sight irritation that was present that morning persisted. The best way I can describe it is that it felt like something was in my eye, like a piece of dust or something. My dad's allergies were horrible in the spring and fall, and he'd sometimes rub his eyes when his sinuses acted up. It was kind of like that. I wasn't sure this irritation would go away, but I knew one thing. I can't take my contacts out. Not again. Not after this. I went a week with the contacts in, and other than the inflammation I felt in my eyes that pained me in bright sunlight and windy days, I was fine. Happy, even. Being able to sleep through the night and not have the voices plaguing my every move was far worth a steady headache and soreness in my eyes. Or so I thought it was at least. I went to the eye doctor for my follow-up visit. And needless to say, he was aggravated at what I had done. He explained to me, as well as my mom, that I would need to take the contacts out and replace them daily. He explained in detail the types of infections and bacteria that could form under the contact if I left them in for long periods of time. He spoke about the painful conditions that can form and how it can worsen. He did say it wasn't a guarantee but that it was pertinent that I replaced them. I asked him how long someone had gone with contacts in, but he refused to tell me. Somehow I think he knew if he told me a threshold before issues could arise, that I'd try to beat it. He stared at me. Son, you have to replace these daily. No exceptions, okay? I told him how difficult it was for me to remove them. That it was painful to do. He asked me to elaborate, but I didn't know how I could tell him, so I didn't. I knew no amount of sophisticated vocabulary would convince him, and I couldn't say anything anyways. They would hear me. He offered to remove them himself, but I declined. I promised him I would replace them as soon as I got home. He protested, citing that he needed to inspect my eyes and take a sample of the inside of the contact to ensure no bacteria had formed nor would form. I assured him I'd be okay, that I didn't feel anything like what he had described earlier. I promised my mom I would change them and she could hear the resolve in my voice. Doctor, I believe my son. He'll change them out. The doctor threw his hands up in capitulation reached under his desk and grabbed a bottle of gel tears and handed them to me. He told me to use them to help with the redness once I removed my contacts. 
We picked up the box of new contacts from his assistant and left. When I got home, I went to the bathroom with the new contacts and stared at the two new contact packets that sat on the counter. I would have to be quicker this time. I put the new contact on my middle finger again and positioned it to next to my forefinger in hopes I could place the new one on at the same time I removed the old one. I reached with my right thumb and index finger and grasped the old contact. As I squeezed it to remove its suction to my eye, I could tell they were surrounding me. As I pulled it away from my eye, I felt something grab my wrist and hold it in place. I strained against the force, trying to push my middle finger towards enough to touch the contact to my eye. Maybe my eyelid could have grabbed it at the edges and push it into my eye. It was worth a shot. I barely moved my middle finger when the shadow figure that was holding my wrist grabbed my hand to stop all motion. Anger filled me. A fire that raged inside my chest, along with the pain of the demon, now starting to claw at my back, ripping chasms into my skin. I yelled furiously, almost cried when I jerked my head forward towards my finger. The contact seated immediately, and the grasp on my wrist was gone as fast as it had appeared. They were getting smarter and I knew I wouldn't be able to do this twice. The left contact I decided to try to hail Mary. I put the new contact on my left index finger and brought it up to my eye. I looked to the left as hard as I could and placed the contact on a bare part of my eye. It settled onto the side of my eye and when I looked forward I felt it slide into my eye socket. Instantly pain shot into my head, but I worked as fast as I could to remove the old contact. It peeled off my eye. A sticky substance trying to hold it in place. Almost as if it had glue on it to keep it there. The pain seared, but I held the contact tight. When I pulled it out, I threw it into the sink in defiance and spat at it. The headache that had started was now building into a migraine and it hurt to have the lights on. I shut them off and grabbed the bottle of gel tears the doctor had given me and squeezed two drops into both eyes. The pain subsided some, but my left eye still hurt a bit. I left the bathroom and my sister was standing at the door, staring at me with concern. Are you okay, Tommy? She asked, a reserved look on her face. Yeah. Left eye just hurts a bit. I replied. I think I'm gonna lie down for a bit. She muttered okay and watched me as I walked down the hall into my room. I grabbed a bottle of over-the-counter migraine pills on my bedside table and took two. I laid in bed and closed my eyes. Sleep didn't come and my thoughts circled me. I could feel the edge of my mind. The off feeling starting again. I thought about other possible ways to replace my contacts, but none came. I knew if I tried the Hail Mary tactic again, they wouldn't just stop me. They would try to kill me. I don't know how, but it once again felt concrete in my mind. I don't know if the beings or demons or whatever the hell they were could kill me. Hell, maybe death would be welcome at this point. At some point, I drifted to sleep. When I awoke, I felt tired and exhausted, drained of energy. My left eye still hurt, but the migraine had died down to a manageable level. I walked to the bathroom and looked at my eyes. They were bloodshot red, with the left visibly worse off than my right. I stared at myself. I debated my future, my life. The existence we purvey to each other, that it's all worth it in the end. What about this was worth it? I debated taking the contacts out and letting the beast that hid in the shadows rip me apart. The voice of doubt in my mind spoke up. What if they have no intention of killing you? The years that had passed came to mind and I knew I couldn't survive any longer than I already had. It was too much. 
Even if the painful attack stopped, the overwhelming weight of nothingness that swallowed me before the contacts would reach a point of unbearable, and I knew I'd have to off myself to make it end. Does hell exist? If I ended my life, would the demons finally have me for eternity? I shook the thoughts off. The future was uncertain, and the now only mattered. And all I knew was now that I'd never be able to take my contacts out. Months had passed by, and the condition of my left eye continued to degrade with my right eye following suit. The gel tears had ceased to improve the burning, itching feeling I had every day I kept the contacts in. Each day I awoke, there was a thick, crusted substance built up on the edges of my eyelids. For the last few weeks, I had washed my eyes and scrubbed my eyelids with warm water and a washcloth, doing my best to hide the condition of my eyes. This morning, though, my mom had woken me up and took one look at me and called the doctor immediately, and then called school to say I would be out for an unforeseen amount of time. When I walked into the doctor's office, he let out a frustrated and defeated sigh from his first look at me. He examined my eyes thoroughly. The bright, shining lights on the machine he had to use reinforced the steady headache that lumbered around in my eye sockets and frontal lobe. Aside from the pain in my eyes, I could feel blood loss from my right hand where my mother gripped it, holding on as if her life depended on it. The doctor took several samples of the fluid around my eye to confirm what he already knew. After leaving the office for what felt like an eternity, he returned with a piece of paper in his hands and a look in his eyes that confirmed I was screwed. My mom stared at the doctor and I could feel all strength and resolve leave her body. Please tell me it's treatable. Her voice sounded miles away. I'm past sugarcoating anything, ma'am, and you need to hear this straight. He started looking down at the paper and back up at her. The contacts in your son's eyes have now begun forming into his eyes. They have almost entirely replaced his cornea, and underneath them blood vessels have started forming into what's left of his cornea. There's a bacteria forming here as well, probably exacerbated by the gel tears. In short, we cannot take the contacts out now. What are you saying? She said, exasperated and beginning to cry. Surgery is the only thing we can consider now, and I'm recommending it immediately if we're to attempt to save your son's vision at all. If the surgery is successful, and that's a big if, he will have diminished sight in his right eye and lose sight in his left eye. If we're unsuccessful and his eyes are too damaged, we'll have to remove both his eyes permanently. My mom broke into sobs and a sharp pain shot through my chest. I couldn't watch her, and I looked back at the doctor. His glare said everything I already knew. That I had done this to myself and caused this pain. That I had once again become a burden to my family. I felt horrible. Belittled. Small. The only solution I thought would fix everything ended up sowing my fate. I asked my sister to transcribe this and she's sitting next to me as I lay on this hospital bed pre-operation. Mom and Dad went to get some food and to talk, they said, and they've been gone for quite some time. It feels pointless to try and put words to what has happened to me the past few years, but it needed to be said. My family has never been spiritual, nor have they prescribed to any theology. We never really talked about a higher power or being that created all of this, so I'm not sure if anyone is listening beyond this plane of existence. But please, just please, please someone. I know I don't believe in a god, but surely there's someone out there. There has to be, right? Maybe some deity that is unlike anything described in the multitude of religious texts out there. Something or someone truly powerful. Anything. Whatever or whoever is running this abhorrent show, can you please help? Please? 
take my eyes for all I care and take this curse or hex or demonic possession or whatever it is away from me, please. That's when he stopped speaking and asked me to let him rest a little before the operation, and I reluctantly agreed. He was in surgery for hours when the head surgeon finally walked down the hallway to us. As he was walking towards us, his gaze dropped to the floor for a moment and my heart sank. He reached us and told us there were several complications. The first being that the attempts to save my brother's eyes were unsuccessful and that they had to remove them entirely. My mom's face twisted into a horrified, agonized shape as my dad clutched her with one arm. The other rested on my shoulder in a grip that was hard enough to bruise my skin. The surgeon continued to deliver the bad news, stating that my brother had reacted negatively to the anesthetic they administered. He threw out a few medical terms I'm now googling next to this document to understand what happened, but the gist of it is... My brother succumbed to something called locked-in syndrome. Nurses and doctors frequently come in to test his reflexes and check on his vitals, but say little and provide no warmth or comfort. They know the score, and I feel as if I do now as well. His pulse and blood pressure spikes occasionally, but he shows no signs of communicating with us. Dad is asleep in the chair next to his bed, and Mom left to get some cigarettes a while ago. She hasn't smoked since my brother was conceived, but I'm not about to tell her not to. They're both distraught, and neither of them fully understand what my brother went through. I have no intentions of telling them this story, because what good would it do? It had only compiled the hurt they have into a whirlwind of depression and helplessness. Please pray for my brother. I don't know if he's still fighting these shadow people as he described them or not, but please, pray that he finds peace. All I can do is say thank you for reading this, and thank you for the prayers if you've given any. Susan For my daughter's 10th birthday, I got her a big vat of modeling clay. At first, it was a big success. I mean, why wouldn't it be? What kind of child doesn't love messing around with Play-Doh, right? Modeling clay was just the natural progression from that. A step up. It was an innocent idea, but as you will soon come to understand, I wish more than anything that I would have just bought her a dollhouse instead. Lily was one of the most artistic and creative people I'd ever met, despite her young age. I would always find her sitting in her room painting or drawing on a piece of paper, or maybe acting out a scene from one of her favorite TV shows, assisted by various stuffed animals. One time I walked in to find her working on a crude illustration of a pink unicorn, the day after that, I laid my eyes upon a beautiful castle, accompanied by a charming stick woman princess. Sometimes her drawings would even transcend beyond the paper and find themselves on various furniture and walls around the house. As a supportive parent, I felt it was important to encourage this kind of behavior and help further develop her artistic expressions as best I could. Whenever I look back to my childhood years, I find many fond memories of sculpting various figures and characters out of modeling clay. Whether it be for an arts and crafts project, or just for recreational use, I found the creative possibilities to be endless. It was like playing God in a sense. I used to be pretty good as well, through sculpting. I was able to transform concepts and characters that only existed in my mind into tangible, real-life objects that I could see and touch. The happiness it brought me back then was indescribable. I wanted my daughter to experience a similar joy to the one I had, to let her express herself through yet another artistic medium. 
I thought it would be the perfect gift for her upcoming birthday and hopefully it would serve as a distraction from what was currently going on with her mom. With the idea popped into my head, I immediately went over to my elderly neighbor Greg to ask if I could buy some modeling clay from him. He and his wife had been living across the street ever since we bought our house over a decade ago, and we had quickly gotten acquainted. Before he retired, he used to teach pottery lessons at the local community center in town. He was an extremely skilled potter, and had a gentle and kind aura surrounding him. He was a very beloved figure in our neighborhood, and would always go out of his way to help out members of the community. In a way, he was kind of like our own version of Bob Ross. I figured that since he had been retired for quite some time now, he might have some leftover clay that he would be willing to sell me for a fairly reasonable price. But when I went over to his house, a wave of sorrow washed over me as his wife, now a widow, answered the door with weary eyes. Upon hearing the tragic news, I offered my condolences and she invited me inside. I explained to her why I came over and she happily led me to Greg's workshop in the attic. The place was exactly like you'd imagine it. Terracotta pots and various other ceramic artifacts lay scattered everywhere. On his desk were several of those spinning pottery wheels where you spin the clay around on. His shelves were littered with all kinds of materials one would use for such a craft. And the icing on the cake? The smell. It smelt like fresh, wet, dirt with hints of iron in it. You know the one. Greg's wife, Isabel, was happy to part with some of the stuff that for so long had cluttered her attic. So she let me leave with a big vat of modeling clay that sat patiently waiting by his workbench. She said it was the clay Greg had been working with before his sudden passing and that it was some kind of rare, high-quality mixture from South America. In other words, state-of-the-art and extremely expensive. Immensely grateful, I thanked her for her kindness and offered to lend a helping hand if she ever needed one. A few days later, a quizzical grimace formed on my daughter's face as she unboxed her new birthday present. What is it? She asked, inspecting the packaging. I didn't blame her for not understanding right away. The gray plastic barrel didn't exactly present itself as some kind of toy a ten-year-old would receive as a gift. It's modeling clay, honey, I told her. My wife shot me a look from across the room. I hadn't informed her of the gift beforehand. For your art projects, you can make anything you want. Lily looked over to her mom, who sat on the couch with a glass of wine, before rising to her feet and attempting to pry the plastic lid open. I walked over to my wife, Evelyn. I could tell that she wasn't too happy about her daughter's latest gift. You'll be the one having to clean it up, she teased. You know how much of a mess this is going to make? Don't worry, I will. I reassured her and reached out for her hand. A loud pop sounded throughout the living room as the lid flew open, and Lily grabbed a handful of clay and started toying with it. If only I had known then what she had just unleashed. Over the course of the next few weeks, Lily got really into sculpting. What first started as mostly abstract shapes and vaguely humanoid blobs eventually turned into well-defined and surprisingly detailed sculptures and the special qualities of the clay made it really easy for her to use and disassemble as she wished. It hardened after only a couple of hours, and if she wanted to reshape it, all it took was a few drops of water to restore its malleable properties. I watched as she made various clay figurines, including a sculpture of one of the unicorns from her paintings, a couple of clay houses, and an elephant, among other things. But those aren't the focus of this story. No, if that were the case, there probably wouldn't even be a story to tell. 
the whole thing started when she made that thing. The wretched abomination she called Claymate. I never understood why she grew so fond of it. It was hideous. She was way too talented of an artist to waste her skills and time on something so awful looking. The first time I met Claymate was on a Sunday morning at the dining table. My wife and I sat down to eat breakfast when Lily walked into the kitchen carrying something over her shoulder. She pulled out two chairs from under the table and got seated. One for herself, the other for Claymate. Evelyn and I looked at each other. Upon the sight of Claymate, we initially wanted to laugh, as it looked hysterically despicable, but we managed to compose ourselves for our daughter's sake. It was the first time I had seen my wife smile in what felt like forever. Who is this, honey? Evelyn asked. Claymate, Lily responded, reaching over to pour herself a glass of milk as if there was nothing abnormal about the situation. My wife gazed over to me and shot me a look that said, Why couldn't you have just gotten her a Barbie doll? Claymate was a person-shaped blob of clay with vaguely human facial features. Two pinched-in holes for eyes and a slimly carved smile. It had no hair, no clothes, or any other identifiable details. Just a crude, humanoid clay person with an awful grin. It was about half the height of my daughter. And what is he? Where is he from? I asked, trying to show interest in her hobby. Oh, he's not from around here. He's just visiting. He says he wants to make new friends. I looked over to Claymate, intently inspecting the lifeless expression that contoured across his face. There was just something about his stone-cold eyes that almost gave me the creeps. I know it's silly to be unnerved by a ten-year-old's arts and crafts project, but there was something eerie about it that I couldn't quite place my finger on. Honestly, it made me even regret buying the modeling clay in the first place. That's great, Lily, Evelyn said. I hope you give him the warm welcome he deserves. Later that day, we had to leave Lily home alone for the evening as I drove my wife to the hospital. She had recently been diagnosed with an extremely rare illness called Prutzfeldt jacob disease. I'm no doctor, so I can't really go into all the medical details surrounding the disease, nor do I see any point in doing so. All you need to know is that it's a fatal condition that causes brain damage which rapidly worsens over time. There is no cure nor any effective treatment other than painkillers, antidepressants, and sedatives, which only serve to make the patient's remaining days as comfortable as possible. It was absolutely heartbreaking. As you can imagine, Evelyn didn't take the news too well, and neither did I. I was about to lose the love of my life at the young age of 38. It felt like we had gotten robbed, our future was stolen by forces beyond our control. We hadn't told Lily yet, but I suspected she already knew something was wrong. Later that evening, we returned home from the hospital to be met with Lily sitting on the living room couch, wa wa watching, watching, watching. Later that evening, we returned home from the hospital to be met with Lily sitting on the living room couch, watching cartoons on the TV. Beside her sat Claymate, motionless. At first, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary, until I stepped on something soft and squishy. I looked down to see what it was. Wet clay. Then I looked up and noticed a pair of muddy footprints trailing from Claymate on the couch and out into the kitchen. What's all this, Lily? I asked her and pointed at the mess she had made. It's just Claymate. His feet do that when he walks around. She responded, I know it's a little messy, but I promise to clean it up later. I tried to suppress the growing frustration within me. 
The last thing I wanted to do after a long day at the hospital with my terminally ill wife was to come home to a muddy mess of a home. Well, next time just carry him, Evelyn said, also with a hint of frustration in her voice. For some reason, I couldn't sleep that night. I laid awake in bed, tossing and turning. Was it too hot in here, or was the stress finally getting to me? I looked over at my nightstand. Bright red fluorescent lights displayed, 2.03 a.m. Jesus, had it been three hours already? I was due to wake up in only five. My wife was snoring per usual. Maybe I just needed a glass of water. I got out of bed and quietly made my way downstairs towards the kitchen. I didn't bother turning on the ceiling lights as I didn't want to ruin my tiredness even further. The street lights outside shone in through the windows anyway, providing just enough light to partially illuminate the house's interior. I poured myself a glass of water, and then a glass of milk because I had heard somewhere that milk makes you sleepy. I didn't know if it was true or not, but I didn't care at that point. A heavy shuffling sound behind me caught me off guard and I stopped dead in my tracks. I quietly put the glass on the kitchen counter and turned around. It was coming from the living room. Then I heard it again, closer this time. It sounded like someone was scuffling around. I slowly made my way toward the source of the sound, struggling to keep my breathing as still as possible. And then a loud thud sounded as if something had fallen to the floor. I turned the corner and saw... Nothing. Nobody was there. Was my mind playing tricks on me? I walked to the center of the room to further investigate when I noticed something rectangular on the ground. I picked it up and held it in front of the large living room window to let the lamps outside shed light on whatever it was that I was holding. A family photo. Taken years prior at some kind of amusement park. I can't even remember where we were that day, but we looked so happy. Without a care in the world, Evelyn looked so young, so beautiful. I reminisced for a while before placing it back on the shelf it had fallen off. I stepped back and froze. My primal instincts had taken over. My conscious mind hadn't even registered it yet. I felt a crippling amount of dread overcome my entire body. The kind of dread you feel deep in your chest. I felt like a deer in headlights. Frozen. Not knowing what to do. Then I noticed it, the shadow in the corner of the room standing right by the staircase, a humanoid silhouette standing just four feet tall. Oh, I rationalized. It was just Lily. A wave of relief washed over me and I chuckled to myself. You gave me quite the scare there. I laughed, trying to shake off the fact that I let a ten-year-old girl make me quiver in fear. What are you doing up this late? It's way past your... Before I could finish the sentence, Lily's shadowy figure hurried up the stairs at what seemed to be an inhuman speed. Hey, relax. You're not going to get into trouble. I whispered as loud as I could before I ran after her. But just before I got to the bottom of the staircase, I slipped on something. I landed flat on my back, groaning. After a speedy recovery, I got back up and immediately realized what I had slipped on. Wet clay. But it was impossible. We had cleaned it all up before we went to sleep. I was sure of it. It certainly hadn't been there when we went to bed, and it most certainly hadn't been there before I went down for a glass of water either. This had to be fresh, I reasoned. I followed a trail of small traces of mud up the stairs, and then I followed the trail throughout the hallway, around the corner, past the bathroom, and finally into Lily's bedroom. The door was slightly ajar, so I quietly pushed it open. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary, except for the muddy floor. Lily was sound asleep in her bed, or at least pretending to be. 
I walked over to check on her. Every parent knows that kids pretending to sleep behave very differently from kids that actually are asleep. You can tell by small erratic spasms in breathing, body language, and snoring. But by all accounts, Lily wasn't pretending. She really was asleep. I leaned in and put my ear to her to check again. Sound asleep. No signs of faking it. I contemplated waking her up and asking her about what I had just witnessed, but I decided against it. It could wait until morning. As I turned around to leave, I saw it. Claymate, sitting on a stool in the corner, observing me. Its blank, expressionless eyes, devoid of life, stared back at me as I exited the room. That thing gave me the creeps. The next morning, I asked Lily about what had happened, but you guessed it. She feigned ignorance. She was probably scared she would get into trouble. Had she found out about her mom? Would that explain the family photo? Maybe this was her way of dealing with it. I wish she'd just told me. Over the following weeks, Evelyn's condition worsened. Visits to and from the hospital became too regular. We would have to tell Lily sooner or later. So that's exactly what we did. We told her everything. Understandably, she didn't take it very well. She ran to her room, crying and throwing a fit. Of course I didn't blame her. I walked up to her bedroom door and put my hand on the doorknob, contemplating opening it. I stood there for a moment, listening to her crying. I don't know how long I stood there, but eventually, her crying started to sound different. She wasn't crying anymore. She was talking. I calmly opened the door to find her sitting on the floor, talking to a large mass of clay that had seemingly melted into the floor. What remained of Claymate's head had partially melted into the puddle. It seemed that in her rage, Lily had completely dismantled the poor thing. Good riddance, I thought. The morning after, I was horrified to see Claymate 2.0 sitting at the dining table ready for breakfast. This iteration of the abomination looked way more detailed. It was much bigger and had way more defined facial features. It nearly crossed over into the uncanny valley. It looked like a regular boy, made out of clay of course, much less of an eyesore, but it still infuriated me for some reason. Does he have to sit at the table with us, sweetie? I asked Lily, grinning my teeth. You're getting mud all over the tablecloth. My wife looked at me, but refrained from saying anything. He's part of the family, Dad. He has every right to sit here. Lily responded. For some reason, I had decided that I hated Claymate. There was just something about him that absolutely infuriated me now. And I didn't know why. I know it's silly, and maybe a bit hypocritical considering I bought her the thing, but still, I grew to hate him. Just remove him, please, I blurted out. He just wants to be loved too, she shouted. That's all he wants. Why can't he be a part of the family as well? I want him gone from the dining room. I raised my voice. Lily grabbed Claymate and hurried off toward her room. I tried following her, but Evelyn stopped me, a tear running down her cheek. That day weighed heavy on both Lily and me, but I cannot even begin to fathom how my wife had felt when she received the news. Due to her severely deteriorated condition, she would have to make an overnight stay at the hospital. I brought Lily with me this time. Her first time, actually. She didn't want to leave her mother's side, even when the clock ticked past midnight. To be honest, I didn't want to leave either, but my wife insisted I get Lily home and ready for school the following day. Heavy drops of rain splattered across the hood of the taxi as we exited the vehicle. The overhead street lamps lit up my path as I carried Lily over my shoulder across our driveway. I felt commotion on my shoulders and looked over to Lily. 
As she was being carried, she attempted to wave her hand. Why are you waving? I asked her. To say hello, she bluntly answered. Say hello to who? Her wave transformed into a pointing gesture. I looked up to the second story window. The window to Lily's bedroom. I strained my eyes through the thick downpour. It was hard to make out anything. Ready to just forget about it, I was about to look away when the headlights of the taxi behind me turned to briefly illuminate her room. There was someone standing by the window. A black silhouette held up its hand as if to wave back. It stood there motionless, lit up by the powerful beams of the car. The taxi then swerved around and sped off, allowing her room to be swallowed by the oppressive darkness once more. I came to a halt right in front of our front door. Someone was inside my house. I had seen it for only a brief moment, but I was sure of it. I didn't want to go inside, but I couldn't stay out in the rain either. Not with Lily. I quietly unlocked the door and stepped inside. I put Lily down and reached for the light switch. With the presence of light, a horrifying sight presented itself. There were muddy footprints everywhere. And I mean everywhere. They ran across the floor, into the kitchen, into the living room, up the walls and even along the ceiling. And they weren't boot prints either. No. The culprit appeared to be barefoot. Five distinct toes accompanied each footprint. But what was most off-putting was the size of the prints. They looked like they belonged to a child. Close to Lily's size, actually. A chill ran down my spine upon realizing who they belonged to. No, it couldn't be. I thought to myself as I rushed up the stairs and burst open the door to Lily's bedroom. There, standing by the window, was Claymate. The eerily boy-like clay sculpture stood as still as a statue. Both of its arms hung down by its side. Soulless eye holes blankly stared back at me. It was like I was gazing into the abyss. It was clear who the footprints belonged to. The trail led here. Claymate remained motionless as I picked it up and angrily walked down the stairs within. What are you doing? Lily cried. I paid her no attention as I opened the back door of the house and threw it as far as I could out into our garden. Lily tried running past me to save Claymate, but I held her back. No, you're done. You can't play with him anymore, I firmly told her. I watched as the rain hammered down on Claymate, burning through him as if it were acid. He started melting, his face contorted into a horrible grimace as the rain dissolved Claymate's horrible visage. I almost felt bad for him. Almost. I brought Lily back inside and put her to bed. It was way past her bedtime, and way past mine as well. She was furious, and we fought hard before she finally fell asleep. I decided I would clean up the mess the following morning. Before laying down in my bed, I glanced out the window overlooking our garden. Claymate, or what remained of him, was completely gone. Good, I thought, as I laid down and closed my eyes. The following days were actually pretty normal. Evelyn was still admitted to the hospital, but she seemed to be in a sound enough condition. I visited her every day, and even brought her flowers on one occasion. Lily was doing well in school, despite her terrible sorrow for her mother. I started working longer shifts so that I could be better able to provide for my family during these straining times. It was just a matter of time before I would get the call from the hospital. It was inevitable. I started preparing for the worst. Luckily, Lily didn't seem to mind spending most of her days home alone. She had grown to be quite independent. Although, she seemed quieter than usual. It was clear that her stress of losing her mother had a greater impact on her psyche than I initially thought. Then one afternoon, 
everything changed. I had just gotten home from work when laughter and giggling filled my ears as I stepped through the doorway. A familiar voice echoed through the house. I was in disbelief. I followed the sound to its source and fell down to my knees. There, sitting on the couch, together with Lily, was Evelyn. My terminally ill wife, Evelyn. Only, she looked better than she had done in years. Like her illness had been cured overnight. She looked energized, warm, and welcoming. As beautiful as the day I had first met her. I tried to speak, but was unable to let out even a single word. H how What? I finally mustered up. Evelyn looked at me and smiled. I hadn't seen that smile in what felt like ages. Her perfect white teeth and pink, voluptuous lips radiated warmth. Isn't it wonderful, Daddy? Lily excitedly yelled. Mommy's back. She's well again. But they... they said... was all I could let out before my phone started ringing. Evelyn stood up from the couch and walked over to me. I reached into my pocket and took out my phone. It's the hospital, honey. Might want to take it. I said to her as she reached out her arms and put them around me. Evelyn was so soft. I raised the phone to my ear and answered. Good afternoon, sir. This is Dr. Elliot speaking, calling from Eastmark General Hospital. The man on the telephone introduced himself. Evelyn's hands caressed the back of my neck. It's about your wife, sir. You might want to sit down for this. Dr. Elliot continued. Oh, I know, Doc. I replied in excitement. I'm standing right here with her. She looks so... Excuse me? No, I'm not sure you understand, sir. I'm sorry. The doctor interrupted. The smile slowly faded from my face and formed into an expression of confusion. Evelyn pressed herself up against my back and held me tight. What do you mean? I asked him. Your wife, sir. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but... She passed peacefully in her sleep 15 minutes ago. Dr. Elliot informed me. I dropped my phone and froze. That was impossible. It couldn't be. Was this some sort of sick joke? A prank call? It felt as if time stood still. Evelyn squeezed me tight. No, it couldn't have been a prank call. It was the hospital's phone number and Dr. Elliot was my wife's assigned doctor. None besides us could have known that, but she was standing right here. I didn't understand. I put my arms around her instinctually. She was so soft and so smooth, but something was wrong. She was too soft, and she was cold to the touch. I squeezed a little harder, and I felt my fingers dig into her flesh, leaving behind multiple indentations. I looked at her face. But you're right here, I said to her. I noticed Lily on the couch. She looked confused as well, worried. Evelyn stared blankly back at me. A familiar sense of dread had manifested itself deep within me. She wasn't... She wasn't Evelyn. I pushed her away, struggling to get her arms off me. I reached out and brushed my hand against her face. A sandy white powder stained my hand. It looked to be some kind of makeup. I glanced up at the spot I had just touched on Evelyn's face, and I saw what lay underneath the carefully constructed facade. I felt a thousand knives stab my heart simultaneously as I realized what I was looking at. It was clay. No, it wasn't Evelyn at all. It was Claymate. I shouted angrily at the top of my lungs. I shouted at the insult to my wife's legacy that stood in front of me. It filled me with anger. Whatever this thing was, 
I fully intended to destroy it. I threw a punch at the imposter and recoiled in pain. It was like punching a brick wall. I clutched my bruised hand and took a step back. Claymate looked to Lily and tried forming some sort of expression across its face. My wife's face. Whether it was one of sorrow or of anger, I could not tell. I'm not sure Lily even understood what that thing was. In a stiff and jagged motion, Claymate ran out the back door and out into the garden. It looked like a toddler who had just learned to walk. Mommy, wait! Lily shouted and ran after it. I tried stopping her, reaching out to hold her back, but I was too late. Lily was gone. I snapped out of my horror-stricken daze and ran after her. It was dark out. If she had run past the light fixtures of the garden and out into the adjacent woods, there was no way I would be able to find her. I ran out the door and stopped. In the middle of the lawn, Claymate sat bent down on its knees. In front of it stood Lily. Evelyn's face started molding, and she had quickly become unrecognizable. Her limbs began swelling, and it almost seemed like her skin was bubbling. Claymate's entire body started shifting. It grew larger. It burst out of the clothes it was wearing. My wife's clothes. It had returned to its base form, a muddy and crude sculpture of a boy, except it was larger than before. It was roughly the same size as me. It moved its grotesque, sandy mouth and looked as if it was trying to form a vocalization. A series of unnerving gasps and exhales escaped its malleable maw before they started to sound intelligible. Lily. A deep, growling voice spoke. It sounded like a dog or a parrot trying to mimic human language. It was incredibly off-putting. Lily, it said again, placing its muddy hand on her shoulder and molding its face into a happy expression. Its features reminded me of a theater mask. Lily screamed in terror and started wailing. I wanted to help, but I felt powerless to do so. Paralyzed with fear, I watched as Lily turned her back to it and attempted to make her escape. She locked eyes with me before she was yanked back. The thing had stretched one of its arms to monstrous proportions and used it as a tendril, wrapping itself around Lily and pulling her back towards itself. Let me go! She screamed, begging me to help her. I ran towards the monster, attempting to pry her free from its stone-hard terracotta grip, but it used its other arm to toss me back. I slammed into one of the exterior walls of the house and landed on my back. Wet mud stained my clothes as I rose to my feet and charged the clay monster again. Same result. Claymate started transforming, its form even more contorted and unnatural. Had it been in any other setting, its appearance would almost be comical. I saw Lily struggling to break free from the creature's grasp. And there was nothing I could do. I couldn't get close enough to her. I witnessed in terror as Claymate wrapped itself around her, engulfing her inside a mass of mud and clay. She was trapped inside it. I could see her arms and legs protruding out of the clay, struggling, fighting. She was going to suffocate, and there was nothing I could do. I once attempted to run towards it. My fatherly instincts overcame me, and I felt adrenaline power up my body. I clawed and punched the monster as best as I could, attempting to dig her out. But for each piece of clay I removed, another would take its place. It was in vain, but I had to try. I continued digging, listening to Lily's muffled screams from inside Claymates, only fueled by aggression. I looked back at the house, scanning the ground for anything I could use. A shovel, a big stick, knives, anything. I was desperate. 
Lily's screams faded and her protruding limbs suddenly went limp. That's when I noticed it. The garden hose curled up like a snake in the corner of our lawn. I remember how the rain had dissolved Claymate previously, how the water flowed through the being like a winding river. I rushed towards it, fumbling it with shaky hands as I picked it up and aimed it at the big ball of clay that had swallowed my daughter. I tasted a combination of salt and iron on my lips as tears ran down my cheeks. I was so tired, but I had to try. I turned the release valve on the hose, and I felt the hose go taut as water shot through it. I aimed a concentrated beam of high-pressure water directly at the monstrosity occupying my lawn. As soon as the water made contact with the beast, it bellowed in what I could only discern as pain. I relentlessly continued blasting it with water, moving closer and closer. I could see Claymate's gaping face slowly start to melt. Its previously rigid and hard body had turned soft and squishy. Wet brown mud spewed in all directions. Slowly but surely, more and more of Lily's body came into view. The creature attempted to flee, making its escape towards the tree line. Lily laid in the middle of the garden, covered in dirt and wet sand, but free from Claymate's hostage. Suddenly silence filled the air. Claymate was nowhere to be seen, except for the muddy trail it left behind. It had disappeared into the woods, hopefully for good this time. I turned off the hose and tossed it aside. I ran towards Lily and quickly picked her up and brought her inside the house. Before locking the door behind us, I turned around and gazed into the dark forest just a couple of feet away from the lawn. Nothing. No signs of our assailant. I closed the door and called 911. Lily survived. Paramedics were able to resuscitate her or whatever they did to save her life. I wouldn't know because I apparently collapsed from exhaustion shortly after they arrived at our doorstep. I'm not sure how this event will affect Lily going forward. I can't imagine how traumatized she must be. And to top it off with the death of her mother, I'm afraid it will just be too much for her. I have taken a leave from work in order to get things sorted out. I needed a mental break after everything I'd experienced during these past couple of weeks. Lily seems to have returned to normal, at least as normal as life could be after this. Lily hasn't shown any signs of trauma, and she still continues to pursue her artistic hobbies. Though, it will be hard to say whether these events will have a greater impact in the future. As for Claymate, I don't fully believe he, or it, or whatever you want to call it is gone. I didn't feel like I killed it that night, only injured it. This was only a minor setback. It needs time to regrow. I don't know what it wants, or what it intended to do with Lily that fateful night. Whatever its plans are, I'm certain they are sinister in nature. This morning, while fetching today's newspaper on the driveway, I glanced over to Isabel and her late husband, Greg's house across the street. I now know how she feels every day being a widow. How empty her house must have felt without him by her side anymore. I was lucky to still have Lily at least. Isabel had no one. No kids, no grandkids, and I was pretty sure most of her friends weren't around anymore. I thought about paying her a visit sometime when I suddenly noticed movement coming from the attic window of the house. I rubbed my groggy eyes and focused. Up there, standing by the window, stood a man. An old and disheveled man. It took some time before I connected the dots, but when I finally recognized him, my heart sank. Goosebumps covered my body. It was Greg. Greg stood there, staring blankly at me. An all-too-familiar expression stretched across his face. He slowly raised his hand and placed his palm on the glass. 
Greg stared at me for a moment and grinned before retrieving his hand and slowly retreating back into the attic. Before I knew it, he was out of view. Gone. Vanished. The only trace that remained of him was the muddy handprint he had left stained on the window. For as long as I can remember, people called me the Pregnant Boy. I was a tall, gangly kid with a protruding belly that extended far past my belt line. In kindergarten, kids poked my belly and giggled. Then in grade school and high school, even teachers asked, When's the baby due? Sometimes I joked back, made up a due date, or said I planned to name the baby Roger. Everyone laughed, but kids at school were vicious. These experiences bugged me more as I got older, especially as my stomach continued growing. I felt like the pregnant woman in that alien movie. Yet doctors insisted I didn't have a tumor. Some people just carry their weight in their belly. Said my doctor, despite my lack of belly fat. Still, my appearance made dating difficult. Sorry said one woman, laughing when I asked her out. I don't date pregnant guys. Too much baggage. I hung my head in shame, quit my job, and even contemplated offing myself. Meanwhile, my belly kept growing. The rest of my body remained thin, but my belly ballooned like an unstoppable force that I could neither contain nor extinguish. Then one day, I found answers after a medical emergency landed me on the operating table. Hours before, I was eating a Hot Pocket when something ripped. At first, it sounded like a zipper busting on a pair of too tight pants, but that wasn't the problem. Instead, blood seeped through my white Hanes t-shirt, oozing from my stomach like a crimson river. I called 911 and was rushed to the ER for emergency surgery. When I awoke from surgery, doctors huddled around me wide-eyed. What happened? I asked, groggy. Robert, we removed the fetus, one doctor said. I shot up in my bed. The what? The doctor nodded. Yes, Robert, you had a fetus lodged inside you. He'd been there all your life. Would you like to see him? He reached for the glass jar behind him. Good God, I said, panicking. Don't worry, the doctor said. You weren't pregnant. You had a rare medical condition called fetus in fee two. It only occurs in one out of half a million pregnancies. It happens during twin pregnancies when one fetus gets trapped inside the other. Usually, both fetuses die, but you survived and your brother lived as a parasite inside you. Another doctor chimed in. Yes, your brother was growing quite large. But I thought I would faint when the doctor showed me the contents he'd collected from my abdomen. My eyes bulged as I stared at the grotesque creature floating in the jar. A giant man-child, beard and all, floated inside the container. He had an adult's head with a full mane, a bulbous nose, and talon-like nails extending from all ten fingers and toes. He even had adult feet. As gnarly as the creature was, I followed the doctor's advice and took him home. I even named him Roger. At first, I didn't know what to do with him, so I placed him on my nightstand. The doctors told me to feed Roger like I would a goldfish. So, twice daily I sprinkled crushed nutrients into his glass jar, and observed his eating habits. The first two days were uneventful, and Roger didn't touch his food. Then, just as I was about to give up, Roger opened his eyes. I pressed my face against the jar, eyeing my twin like a ghoulish science experiment. I poked and tapped at the jar, studying Roger and taking notes. One day, Roger pushed to the surface and gobbled the food. Then he turned to me and smiled. He even had a full set of teeth. 
I gasped, then jumped back. Ah, oh, shit. I thought, what now? I wasn't expecting him to interact with me, yet here he was exceeding my expectations. So I kept feeding Roger until he almost outgrew the glass jar. Then I returned to the hospital for advice. It looks like Roger is ready for phase two, said the medical team. Phase two? I asked, confused. One doctor nodded. Yes, it's time to remove Roger from the jar to see if he survives outside the fluid. So the doctors removed Roger from the jar and placed him on breathing tubes, doubting he would survive. But you might want to prepare for the worst, said another doctor. He might not survive the transition. But when the doctors removed Roger from the jar and administered breathing tubes, they were amazed. Roger had not just survived, but thrived, even breathing on his own. Well, another doctor said, smiling. It looks like you can take Roger home. You'll have to be patient, though, because he'll need to learn to talk. But other than that, it looks like you've got a new twin brother. After taking him home, I marveled at Roger's progress. He was a rapid learner, catching on to English without difficulty, and speaking in complete sentences before long. I even arranged to get Roger a haircut and a manicure to trim his talon-like nails. And Roger had a quirky sense of humor. He made jokes, flirted with women, and was more popular than I was. I even felt a little jealous. But one thing concerned me about Roger. He played mean tricks on people and didn't feel guilty about it. Once he tripped a woman at the pharmacy and laughed when she fell face first to the ground, then spit out her two front teeth. Watch where you're going, he said, stepping over her and strolling off without a second thought. Roger? I said, you can't trip people like that. Roger shrugged nonchalant. Why not? Because it's wrong. But Roger looked unfazed. I hoped his behavior would improve, and I tried to stay patient, but events escalated, suggesting I needed to rethink my plans. As Roger grew more independent, I decided we needed to part ways. Roger, it's time for you to get your own apartment, I said one day. He shot me a sour look. You mean pay for my own place? Why would I want to do that? I sighed. Roger, no one wants to do these things, but it's what responsible adults do. Who says I want to be a responsible adult? My posture stiffened, annoyed. Roger, this isn't a request. I'm telling you, it's time to get your own place. But Roger didn't get his own place. Instead, things took a darker turn. Over time, Roger stayed out later, often returning at dawn. Where'd you go all night? I asked, feeling like a suspicious spouse. Out, Roger said, refusing to elaborate. I figured he had a new girlfriend and hoped whoever she was would ask him to move in with her soon, but Roger said nothing more. Later, after midnight that night, I awoke to a loud crash from the living room. Alarmed, I grabbed my baseball bat and prepared my cell phone to call 911. Then I tiptoed into the living room toward the sound, but I dropped my phone and gasped when I rounded the living room corner. Roger stood in the doorway holding an overfilled trash bag as dark fluid dripped onto the carpet. My hand flew to my mouth. Roger, what's in the bag? He glanced at the bag and shrugged. Oh, this? Nothing. Just doing some house cleaning. What's in there? Roger's eyes darkened and his body stiffened, sending chills through me and something told me to stop talking. I pretended to believe him then returned to my bedroom panicking, desperate for an escape plan. What was I supposed to do? 
If I reported Roger, the police would do nothing without evidence of a crime. And at that point, Roger had already disposed of the bags, so there wasn't evidence of anything. There were some dark stains on the carpet, but the police wouldn't have bothered with those. Besides, calling the cops would have worsened Roger's wrath. But what the hell was in the bag? I wondered. That night, I decided I didn't want to know. And I returned to sleep telling myself I was overthinking everything. But these incidents continued. Roger would return home late, sometimes carrying stuffed trash bags. Or I would find dark stains on the couch and carpet the next day. Sometimes I found random wallets and car keys hidden in desk drawers. But I learned to play dumb. Still, I felt like a fearful partner walking on eggshells to appease a volatile spouse. Then one day, I couldn't pretend anymore. It was time to confront Roger whether he liked it or not. One morning I was making waffles when a musty odor wafted from the basement. It smelled like old seafood or rotting meat. What the hell is that? I wondered. Roger wasn't home, so it was my chance to investigate. I usually avoided the basement because that's where Roger slept, but this time, I turned the basement doorknob and tiptoed downstairs. Roger? I called, making sure he wasn't home. Silence. Roger? I called again as I reached the bottom step. Nothing but the putrid stench intensified, forcing me to breathe from my mouth. The basement was piled ceiling high with junk. Sweat socks, dirty sheets, food crusted to dinner plates, but nothing looked amiss. But that stench, what was that? I inched toward the kitchen, then, as if by instinct, I hesitated before opening the refrigerator as though my body knew something my brain didn't. I took a deep breath, paused, then flung open the door, but I wasn't prepared for what awaited. On the middle shelf stood six severed heads staring back at me. All were twenty-something men with beards, their eyes bulging in horror behind wire-rimmed glasses. Chunks rose in my throat and I projectile vomited into the sink, unable to control the direction or intensity of the vomit. Then, with trembling hands, I dialed 911, shaking as I reported the incident. The police arrived minutes later and removed the severed heads from the refrigerator, but they never found anything, not even after their nationwide search. And Roger never came home after that. Or at least, he hasn't yet. Greetings to anyone reading this. I hope your day is going better than mine. My name is Eli Matthews, and by the time you read this, I will be dead. I work for an energy company that the government runs, and we have made a colossal mistake. A quick overview of what I am working on. Long before I began, a team of researchers discovered what they thought to be an alternate dimension that lies close in proximity to ours. They came up with plans to reach it, but the technology just never advanced enough to get there. It's like being in front of a locked door that could take you anywhere, but you can't find the key. That's where I come in. I was contracted by the government to take part in this project. I guess they thought I fit the bill for what they were working on, and when I saw the paycheck they were offering, I couldn't turn it down. After signing what felt like a never-ending stack of waivers and non-disclosure agreements, I was on my way to an off-book site in Washington State's countryside. I have a PhD in physics and have published a few papers that have helped me gain a strong foothold in my field. I'm no genius compared to a lot of people, but I have learned how to hold my own over the years. This is why when I was offered the job I jumped at it because it seemed like a great chance to increase my knowledge. 
When I got the rundown of what I would be working on, I felt like I had just been given the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, who wouldn't want to attempt to reach another place outside of our universe? A place that could reveal knowledge that would blow our fundamental understandings out of the water. It made me feel like I was one of the explorers of old, reaching untainted land for the first time. The leader of this whole thing was a lady named Dr. Amelia Gray. She was a physicist like myself, and she had already been working on the project for a while when I arrived. She was an attractive woman, around 35 years old, with short black hair. She was respected by everyone at the facility, and was a stern leader who knew how to give orders. After around three years of grueling work, we finally had what we thought was a working prototype that could finally pull off the impossible. We decided to call it the Mayflower after the boat that brought the pilgrims to the New World. This was the sixth rendition of the gate that we created that should allow us to pass through into this new place. The previous gates either didn't work altogether, or would only hold the proper conditions for a few seconds. The Mayflower should be able to hold it indefinitely as long as there is sufficient power provided. I say this because the Mayflower consumes enough energy to power a small city. The first day of testing began. For the first test, we were sending in a rover that was made by the engineers here at the lab. This rover was made with state-of-the-art technology that made it suitable for any environment. The rover was controlled by remote control and had to be attached via cable so we could keep the connection once it passed through. All systems checked. Ready on your command. An operator said as he looked at Dr. Gray for approval. She raised her arm and held out a thumbs up from the elevated room we were in. Gate opening in three, two, one. I remember looking at the gate as the white hog rings that surrounded the machine began speeding up and a loud hum filled the room. Then an impossibly dark portal appeared in the center. We had actually done it. The years of hard work had finally paid off. The rover we had equipped with just about everything you could think of rolled up just a few feet shy of the black abyss that awaited. There were people decked out in protective suits doing a last once-over before we sent it through. They gave us the all-clear, and we were finally ready. The team began inching the rover forward, and after a few moments the front half of the machine was through, then the back, and it was gone. There were a few applauses and people cheering, then everyone looked up at the big screen we had in the front of the room to display the camera feed. The screen showed static for a moment, and then lit up giving us our first ever view of this new place. Everyone in the room fell silent. We weren't getting an image at all, just darkness. Then the lights switched on from the rover, and we were given a few feet of visuals. This place seemed to have some sort of fog that blanketed everything. Even from the high-powered beams that the rover provided, it was struggling to get through just a few feet of it. It was a place encompassed by darkness. The ground that we could make out looked almost charred like it had been scorched by some of the most intense heat imaginable. That's when we decided to cut the microphone. The winds in this place were so strong that they could put out most hurricanes to shame. The anemometer was reading wind speeds around 160 miles per hour. That wasn't what was so strange about it though. The howls that this place produced sounded like deep guttural screams that were constantly going back and forth with each other, like a symphony of tortured souls. I remember that they shook me to my bones, and I had a cold sweat break out. I felt for the first time like we were somewhere we shouldn't be. The rover took a couple samples off the ground, and got some more readings of the atmosphere, and then started its way back from where it passed through. It was getting pretty close to the portal when we heard it. There aren't words to describe the sounds this thing made. 
It was so low and loud that the rover itself was shaking. People in the observatory were holding their palms to their ears in hopes of drowning out its cry. Hurry up and get the rover back through. Dr. Gray shouted to the people at the control station for the rover. They were frantically trying every control they had at their disposal when they looked over at Dr. Gray. Ma'am, we're trying everything. The rover is not responding. Then the cry came again. I looked over at the display screen and that's when everything went black. The only thing visible now was a text that read, Signal Lost, across the screen. Some of the rover operators started making their way to the gate. Let's try to pull it out manually. One of the operators suggested, There is a huge winch that can be used if control is lost on the rover. The men walked over and got to work firing up the winch. It roared to life and the cable started retracting back into the coil it was on. The thing is, after a few minutes of the cable coming in, we reached the final stretch of line and all that came out was a severed cord. The rover was gone. The next few days were spent reviewing footage and going over data that the rover managed to send back before the signal was lost. I wasn't getting much sleep then because every time I tried to lay down my mind would drift and I would hear that awful cry. That's when they told me we were going to open the portal again. But this time, we would be sending people through. The day had finally come when we would fire up the gate for the final time. We went through all the procedures as last time and double checked everything to assure no malfunctions would take place. We were sending a team of eight through the gate. I assume most of them were military because they all had the look of highly trained individuals. The only two who weren't soldiers were scientists from the lab, who will be sent to gather information. They were all equipped with suits that were made to withstand the harsh environments of this other world. The soldiers were also given rifles, just in case. They won't be able to go very far due to the fact that they are attached via cables just like the rover. With that, we went through all the protocols and the gate fired up once again. Remember, if there's any trouble, everyone is to return through the gates immediately. Dr. Gray said as she looked at the team. You don't have to tell me twice, ma'am. One of the scientists responded. With that, each person made their way through the gates, and we were once again greeted with the dark abyss that was a trademark of this other place. Each person was equipped with a monitor that kept track of their vitals, as well as a camera to display their visuals. With everyone through, they did a systems check and set off to find the rover. The trek was slow and meticulous due to the limited visuals and high winds. After about 15 minutes of traversing, they finally came up to where the rover should have been. Over the comm system, one of the soldiers said, Ma'am, are you sure this is the right position? Yes, you should be right where we lost connection. Dr. Gray said while checking her monitor again for reassurance. Everyone watched the big screen as we looked at the camera feeds, and sure enough, there was no sign of the rover. It's not like the wind would have blown it away. It was made for practically any environment. I remember wanting nothing more than for those people to get out of there. Alright everyone, the rover's gone. Time to head back. Dr. Gray said into the microphone. With that, they began the trek back to the portal and back to safety. Unfortunately, they never got back to it. As they were coming back, that piercing cry rang out just like the last time and everyone dropped to their knees, holding their hands to their heads. The suits they had were somewhat soundproof, which just goes to show how loud this thing was. Pick up the pace, everyone, one of the soldiers announced. Just as he said that, Dr. Riley, who was one of the scientists on the mission vitals, disappeared and her camera feed went dark there was no noise. She was fine one second and gone the next. This sent the observatory into a frenzy, 
and no one who was through the portal even noticed. What just happened to Dr. Riley? Her vitals and visual just went out, Dr. Gray said to the team. They all looked around and I noticed a heart rate spike from their vital readings. We have lost visual on Dr. Riley, a soldier responded. Everyone spread out and look around. Make sure to have eyes on someone at all times. We don't need anyone else getting lost out here. Then the roar came again, and all the screens went black. Pull in those cables now! Dr. Gray shouted at the crew we had ready at the winch. They pulled all the cables in, and just like last time, they were all severed with no clue as to what happened to the team. Then someone walked through the portal. It was Dr. Riley, but her suit was torn almost to shreds. She should have been dead, but somehow managed to walk all the way back to the portal and come through. Everyone in the observatory froze and stared at her. You should stay where you belong, Dr. Riley said in a low, torn voice that didn't belong to her. The place you have entered does not belong to you. I remember Dr. Gray looking at me, and I could see the fear on her face. What happened to the team? She asked with a shaky voice. After she said that, something happened that will forever be seared into my soul. She let out one of the most blood-curdling screams I've ever heard. Then her body started to change. She dropped to the ground, and I could hear bones breaking and flesh tearing. Her skin, which was melting off, was replaced by a viscous black substance. Her hands elongated and crimson claws sprouted from the ends of her fingers, at least half a foot in length. Her head was morphed into something akin to a bear, and sharp, jagged teeth filled its mouth. What used to be Dr. Riley began to stand up when other things came out of the portal behind her. I can only assume that it was the rest of the crew that went in because there are seven of them. Each one turned into something just as awful as the next. The only similarities they have are the jet black skin and yellow glowing orbs they have for eyes now. Then what used to be Dr. Riley reached out her new arm and took a researcher's head clean off. What follows is chaos. The cries of the creatures and the rest of the people in the observatory were something that will never leave me. For what little time I have left, I saw arms, legs, torsos, and chunks of flesh strewn everywhere within seconds. The creatures seemed to have one goal, and that was to get rid of everyone here. Guards with guns began firing at the creatures, but they seemed to only get angry at us. We need to get out of the control room, Dr. Gray said as she shook me out of my daze. We have to make sure these things don't get out. After I took a moment to regain myself, I looked at her. Let's go. We headed off the platform we were on and started through the observatory. The creatures were still tearing apart anyone in close proximity with no mercy whatsoever. I took Dr. Gray's hand and we made our way to the exit doors. Just as I was about to open them, one of the creatures swung at me leaving a deep gash in my left arm, and I let out a scream. That's when one of the guards started firing at the creature. It looked at me for a second more before going to rip that poor man to shreds. We made it through the door, and into the control room that's down the hall. We have locked and barricaded the door with whatever we could find. But it's not going to hold forever. There are fail-safes in this facility in case of an accident that will lock the place down. I tried to wrap my arm the best I could, using my lab coat, but the bleeding hasn't stopped yet. The control room has cameras that cover the building. I can't bring myself to look back into the observatory. Everyone's dead. The creatures are pacing around the building, and every once in a while one will walk by the room we are in. I know we can't undo what we have done, I think we went to another world that was owned by something older and much more powerful than us, and this is our punishment for trespassing. 
The gate is still open in the observatory, and every once in a while this low cry rocks the building. I hope we run out of power before something else tries to get through. One of the things is at the door now. Me and Dr. Gray have accepted our fates. I just hope this place is secured enough where nothing will get out. The cries from the gate are getting louder now. If you're reading this, I'm sorry. My name is Sydney White. I'm writing this because my therapist thinks it will help. I'm honestly willing to try anything to get a little peace of mind at this point. For some background, this incident began in April of my junior year of high school when I was 16. I'm about average height with blue eyes and long brown hair. My mom and I live alone in an old 19th century Victorian style home that has been passed down in our family for generations. Someday, I'm set to inherit the house. Though I'm not so sure I want it anymore. The house is complete with three stories, a basement, and a sizable front and backyard. There's a chest-high iron fence surrounding the property. My room is on the second floor. It has a white marble balcony with two elegant glass doors leading out of it. Ever since I was little, I had always adored the house. The ancient black and white photographs of my ancestors, outdated furniture, and relics gathered by family members throughout the years all instilled me with a longing sense of nostalgia. As a child, I would often just sit in the living room for hours daydreaming of what it would have been like to live decades or even centuries ago. I would let my imagination run wild with fantasies from times long since past until eventually mom would drag me out from my stupor and urge me to play with the other children in the area. That was my only qualm with my home. Due to its old and slightly dilapidated state, I found it very difficult to keep friends. The other kids constantly whispered amongst themselves, and rumors that the house was haunted spread like wildfire on a dry summer day. The creaking of floorboards and whistling of the AC unit through the empty corridors were sounds that I had grown accustomed to after residing there my entire life. To the other children, though, this was hard proof that there were ghosts roaming the halls, waiting to claim their next victims. The same routine would play out every time I brought a new friend over. After a little coaxing, they'd come inside, stay for all of two minutes, then make up some half-hearted excuse to hightail it back home. My humble abode repelled more children than Monster House. Due to this, I didn't have many friends growing up, and the trend continued well into my high school years. So you can imagine my excitement when Alex from my third period English class announced that he was throwing a party while his parents were out of town, and that the whole class was invited. I was ecstatic. I'd never even hung out with boys, let alone gone to a party. The days leading up to the event were filled with anxious anticipation. I was obsessing over the thought that I might meet a cute boy and have my first taste of alcohol all in one glorious night. When the date finally arrived, I was a bundle of nerves. I'd spent hours curling my hair and perfecting my makeup, convinced that at some point my knight in shining armor would glide in and sweep me off my feet. I had made arrangements to ride to the party with Stephanie, a somewhat nerdy girl who didn't have many friends of her own. I knew she only offered to take me so she wouldn't have to show up to the party by herself, but I didn't mind. Honestly, I didn't want to arrive alone either. After what felt like hours, Stephanie's blue Honda Civic inched into our driveway. I sauntered toward the vehicle, radiating confidence. Have fun, Sydney. Mom yelled after me as her gaze followed me down the drive from her spot in the doorway. And try not to drink too much. She mused with a wink. 
A smirk had spread across her face and I couldn't help but chuckle. I always thought my mom was gorgeous, a trait that she unfortunately did not pass down. I was reminded of the fact all too often, as it was a popular topic among school bullies. It's not that kind of party, mom. I lied as I rolled my eyes dramatically. Whatever you say. She shrugged, flashing me a toothy grin. Mom's long blonde hair fluttered in the breeze as she waved goodbye. Her deep green eyes shimmered with pride, hoping in vain that I'd form some semblance of a friendship. The party was a major letdown. I won't bore you with too many details, but only about ten people showed up, including us. I didn't realize how gross beer would taste, but I somehow managed to choke down a couple Budweiser's. After being hit on by nearly every guy at the party, I begged Stephanie to take me home. She was having more fun than I was, but after some pestering, she begrudgingly caved. The ride back to my house was marred by a tense, uncomfortable silence as Stephanie hurriedly peeled away. I stumbled up the driveway and fished in my pocket for my house key. I'd gotten a little more tipsy than I'd realized, and my already lackluster cognitive skills eluded me. I eventually located my keys. I jabbed at the keyhole, and after a couple sloppy attempts, the lock clicked open. I crept up the stairs as silently as I could in my inebriated state, putting forth my best effort not to wake mom. Once I made it upstairs, I ran through my nightly bedtime routine and retreated to my room. I plopped into bed and tried to drift off to sleep. The immense disappointment of the night still fresh in my mind. After a few minutes of restlessly tossing and turning, I picked up on a noise at my balcony doors. I perceived what sounded like a faint tapping on the glass. Tap, tap, tap. I drowsily glanced over at my alarm clock. Midnight. I ignored it and rolled onto my side facing the wall. Probably just a tree branch. But then the tapping escalated to three knocks in rapid succession. Tap, tap, tap. I shot up in bed as a pang of fear coursed through me. I whipped my head to the balcony, fully expecting to lock eyes with some horrid creature. And... Nothing. It must have just been the alcohol messing with my head. A little shaken up, I laid back down and somehow fell into a fitful slumber. The following morning I awoke to the tantalizing aroma of eggs and bacon, wafting upstairs from the kitchen. I stumbled out of bed and groggily traced the scent downstairs where mom was cooking breakfast. Good morning, sleepyhead. She giggled. Good morning. I croaked, trying and failing to rub the sleep out of my eyes. Did you have fun last night? Mom asked as she placed a mouth-watering concoction of eggs, bacon, and toast before me. Yeah, I guess. I wearily replied, shoveling food into my mouth. I wasn't feeling great from the night before, and a hot meal was just what the doctor ordered. Meet any cute guys? Mom prodded as a smile plastered itself across her face. Oh yeah, some real Leonardo DiCaprio's, I sarcastically remarked, mouth nearly overflowing with egg. By the way, Mom, you didn't hear knocking on any of the windows last night, did you? I inquired nonchalantly. No, when did you hear that? She asked quizzically concern washing over her countenance. Never mind. It was probably just a tree branch. I blubbered between chews, attempting to ease mom's tension. Okay, just please let me know if you hear it again. She requested sternly, seemingly relieved by my statement. The remainder of the day was mostly uneventful. After breakfast, I wasted the day watching Netflix. I finished off my evening by knocking out some homework. It was Saturday, but getting my work out of the way early provided me with a sense of productivity. After putting my books away and brushing my teeth, 
I hopped into bed. I'm usually off in dreamland no later than 10.30, and that night was no different. I laid down and shut my eyes, but I was having an uncharacteristically tough time falling asleep. I was overthinking, stressing myself out over an upcoming chemistry exam that I felt wildly unprepared for. I was finally starting to nod off when I heard it, that same rhythmic tapping on the balcony doors. Tap, tap, tap. I lazily turned to the clock. Midnight. Before I could divert my attention to the noise, it started again, but this time it was much louder. Tap, tap, tap. Again, I bolted upright and fixed my gaze on the balcony. My heart pounded against my rib cage, and I thought it would leap from my chest at any given moment. I could have sworn that for a split second, I glimpsed a shadow ducking out of view into the darkness. I was more than a little creeped out at this point. I shined my phone flashlight at the doors, and, discovering an absence of creepy shadow people, I laid back down and breathed deeply in an attempt to regulate my racing heart. I again wrote it off as a tree branch or my mind playing tricks on me, and eventually I managed to doze off. The tapping continued every night going forward. Right at midnight, I'd be ripped from a peaceful slumber to a commotion at my balcony that wouldn't seize until I'd inevitably turn to face it. And every time, nothing was there. After a couple weeks, it was beginning to take a toll on me. I was sleep deprived. My grades began to slip. People noticed. Concerned teachers pulled me aside and asked if everything was okay at home. Classmates were telling me I looked like a ghost. Mom repeatedly questioned me on it, but I just told her I was stressed about exams. I desperately needed to put a stop to that incessant tapping. One night, I'd had enough. As usual at midnight, I was yanked out of my restful state. I'd made up my mind. This time, I was going to ignore it. It started off light, tap, tap, tap. Then it grew louder and increased in frequency, tap, tap, tap. I was determined not to look. I kept my eyes firmly shut, even when the tapping turned to pounding, boom, boom, boom. I was beginning to worry that whatever or whoever it was would crack the glass. Irritated? I relented and my eyes wandered to the double doors. What I saw chilled me to my very core. There was a man standing on my balcony. Dirty, tattered clothing hung off his emaciated frame like rags. He was deathly thin, reminiscent of a skeleton the way his skin stretched tightly over bone. Stringy, greasy black hair fell past his shoulders. The wide smile that blossomed across his face revealed black gums and yellow rotting teeth. His manic expression never faltered, but worst of all were his eyes. Those black pinpoint pupils connected to mine and I could sense something behind them even through the glass. Hunger. A deep, animalistic drive that I can only describe as predatory. Then he spoke. Oh, Sydney, I can see you. He sang in a sickly sweet tone. Please let me in. I just want to play. He called, giddy with excitement. My heart dropped into my stomach. Something sinister lurked just beneath the surface of those words. He licked his lips, his disgusting gray tongue worming its way over the rim of his mouth. I tried to avert my gaze, but I was rooted in fear. Sweat pooled on my brow, and my hands shook uncontrollably. My breathing became rapid and shallow. A million thoughts raced through my brain in unison. Who was this man? How did he get onto my second floor balcony? And how the hell did he know my name? I was broken from my trance by forceful hammering against the doors. The man's smile was gone having devolved into an expression of pure hatred. Let me in, let me in, let me in. 
With each repetition, his fist smashed against the glass, rattling the doors in their frame. Then out of nowhere, he paused. His eyes eagerly lit up and his twisted smile returned, stretching so far that I thought the corners of his mouth might tear. It's okay, Sydney. If you won't let me in, then I'll do it myself, because I found where they hid the key. He could barely contain his elation as he produced an ancient rusted key from an indistinguishable pocket in his ragged clothes. My head spun and my vision blurred. This couldn't be happening. He slipped the key into the door and it unlocked with a nauseating click. At last, my body regained mobility and I went into full panic mode. I leapt out of bed and bolted down the hall to mom's room. The man's deranged cackling reverberating off the walls behind me. His thunderous footsteps were closing the distance. I burst through the door and slammed it shut, waking mom in the process. Sid, it's the middle of the night. What's going on? She groaned lazily. I locked the door and sputtered a nearly incoherent string of words. Mom, man, inside, police. I choked out before I broke down, tears streaming down my face. The hallway had grown eerily silent as I sobbed hysterically. Mom stared at me for a second bewildered, but she did call the cops. They took a statement from me and combed through the house. Of course, by then the man was long gone and there wasn't much they could do. The balcony doors were even shut and locked when they arrived, so there was no evidence that the man had been on the property at all. They urged us not to hesitate to call back if he returned, and reassured us that they'd send a cruiser down our street intermittently for the next few nights. I slept in Mom's room for a week after that. I questioned her about a hidden spare key, but she swore up and down that our two house keys were the only ones in existence. We installed cameras and a home security system, but even then I couldn't bring myself to sleep in that room again. I moved all my things down the hall into an unoccupied room, away from the balcony. Suddenly every resonance terrified me. Noises that I had previously attributed to the age of the house didn't sound like normal creaks and whistles anymore. I started going to therapy. After a few weeks, the therapist, my classmates, and even mom had begun to convince me that I had imagined the whole ordeal. I almost believed them. Almost. My therapist told me that I would never be able to fully heal until I stepped out onto that balcony. So about a month after the incident, I finally built up enough courage to walk out there. I rested my hands on the smooth white marble and peered out over the neighborhood. Spring was among us and the flowers were in full bloom. I soaked it all in as the wind blew my hair and dragonflies zipped past my face. I watched a robin feeding its babies in the tall oak tree in our front yard. Bushy-tailed squirrels bounced along, searching for acorns. It was picturesque. I felt completely at peace standing there, just observing nature. All the stress I'd built up from that night immediately washed away. Until I glanced down, because as I lifted my hands off the stone railing, a strand of long black hair clung to my fingers. Train drivers of Reddit, I'm looking for some advice on operating procedures. I've driven into a tunnel on my standard route, but after a few minutes, all lights and signaling went out on the track. Due to risk of collision, I've stopped the train and tried radioing control, but nobody is answering. Any help is appreciated. Edit 1. We've been stopped for 20 minutes now, and passengers are becoming impatient. One has even pressed the passenger alarm. I don't have a guard on board. I'm the only staff. I have some phone signal, but nobody is answering personal numbers. The situation is becoming pretty urgent here, so if anybody has any advice, I'm very open to it. 
Tunnel is completely dark aside from my headlights. Track ahead is clear. Edit 2. I've started to move the train at 5 miles per hour. As we've been stationary for 45 minutes and I'm concerned that the passengers are becoming uncomfortable or unwell. I am sure that this is a safe speed and I will be able to stop if there is any obstruction on the track. Have any other rail staff ever had anything like this happen to them? I'm concerned about what could be happening on the network. I've never been unable to contact the team before. Someone please let me know if there has been some kind of incident. News pages don't seem to be loading for me at the moment. I am continuing with caution. Edit 3. New request. Somehow we've managed to get lost within the tunnel. At some point, I'm not sure when, the track we are following transitioned. I must have missed a changeover, though I don't know how that's possible with the speed and the attention I'm paying. I was focused ahead making sure that there was no obstructions, and suddenly I realized the environment had changed. The walls of the tunnel have become rough, looking unfinished. The overhead electrical wires and lights have completely gone, and even the walls are free of graffiti. It's all unfinished stone, looking more like a mine shaft than anything designed for a train. I don't know what to do. All I can guess is that somehow I've taken us down a disused track, maybe very old or very new, and I'm at risk of derailing us if the condition degrades. Oddly, the rails are in good condition down here, and roll out as far as my headlights can pick out, but I don't know how long that will continue. It's believed it's too dangerous to continue, and I'm going to have to turn us around. I suppose my new question is what my liability is here. Passenger safety is the most important thing, and I'm doing everything I can, even though I've messed up. Something is not right with all of this. Again, I'm appealing for any help that can be offered. Final note is that the air is cold down here, much colder than the other tracks. The day has been mild so far, but nothing like this. I opened the window briefly, and I could swear my breath was fogging. I'm going to stop the train and drive us back out the way I came. Hopefully I can raise someone on the radio in that time. Edit 4. The situation has developed and I'm looking for any advice on how to get my passengers to safety. As many of you know, I have to walk through the train and access the second cockpit at the other end to change direction. I sent a PA message first informing the passengers that we were stopping due to unforeseen complications would be reversing, and that we would reach the next stop as soon as possible. I then let the driver carriage and entered the train proper. Unsurprisingly, the passengers were very agitated, and I had to spend longer than I liked trying to field questions and concerns from scared and angry people, with a number of them bringing up threats of lawsuits or similar. Luckily, I was able to push through the majority of the carriages stepping through the separating doors without too much issue. A point I should note here is that the carriages are not conjoined. The doors lead outside and I have to step across the gap to enter the next car, making sure to lock the doors behind me. This means that I spent time outside the train and I can confirm the air is icy and thin. Any thoughts of exploring the tunnel on foot are gone. I want to be out of here as soon as possible. The only other area of concern were the cars in the middle of the train. The people inside were frightened and jumped violently as I entered. They said that they had heard sound from outside the train, scraping in the tunnel, and even something banging against the walls of the carriage. Although I did my best to placate them and took a brief look around as I moved on, I couldn't find anything that would cause sounds like that. No loose wires or stones, no signs of animals. I'm sure it's nothing, but it is still a good reason to get moving quickly. I have taken my seat in the second cockpit and have begun driving back the way we came. It is disturbingly similar to the view I had driving into this awful tunnel, but I suppose Hewn Rock looks like Hewn Rock. I will update when I can. Edit 5. I have lost control. 
This forum is now for me to document that I took the best decisions I could under the circumstances. I am doing all I can to keep this train and the people inside it safe. We have been backtracking for longer than we were originally moving down this forsaken tunnel, and there have been no track switches, no changes, no way back to the correct route. All I can see is the cone of light in front of me as the train moves. It's colder too. Cold enough that there is condensation on the windows, that I can feel it seeping through the walls of my cabin, and we're descending. I am now also certain we are traveling downhill. There is a pull, gentle but very real, towards the windscreen, and I don't know where it's taking us. All I know is that I'm traveling at a safe speed to stop if I need to, but fast enough to get us away, because now I hear things too. I thought I had driven over something at first, but then I heard more. Thumps along the side, like we were hitting branches. But there was nothing ahead of us we could be hitting. Then it was the roof. A thud, followed by scraping. Something moving along over my head. I tracked it. Whatever it was sliding backwards towards the length of the train before disappearing. There were moments of silence after. Then the screech of the passenger alarm made me jump out of my skin. It came again and again, someone hammering the button. There's something outside, something on the train, came a panicked woman's voice before being immediately cut off by another alarm and a man's shout. We're in number three. Something is banging on the roof. What the hell is happening? You've got to stop this. The alarm went again and again, each time a new terrified voice being cut off by the next. There's something on. Help us, what are you doing? Between the doors, at the front of... Looking at me, you've got to do something, the windows. Police, now, call the police right now. Unlock the door. I can still hear them, even without the comms. The screams are coming from the carriage behind me. With the crashes and bangs still going. I've turned off the alarm though, turned off the radio. I have to concentrate. I have to get us out of here. What am I meant to do here? What am I meant to say to those poor people? I can't help them. All I can do is drive this cursed train and pray that we see sunlight again. 6. Christ help me. There are people. There's people on the tracks. I thought it was a mannequin when I saw the first. Pale and still, arms by its side. Staring as we went past, it turned its head though, turned its head and watched us go past. Then there was more, dozens of them, hundreds. They lined the track, only inches between them and the train that rushed past, not even a flinch from them, completely emotionless. Are they what is making that noise? Could they be climbing on the train? They are nothing like the squatters that we get. These things are unnatural. I no longer care about procedure, about safety. All I care about is getting this train somewhere else. If this is a mine shaft, a new track, even if it's hell itself, I don't care. I've maxed out the speed. Now I'm just watching those creatures and the track blur past. This has to end somewhere. The sounds from behind me seem to have stopped. I don't know if that's good or bad. I dare not ask on the radio. I'll update again if I can. Update 7. Apologies for the delay. Thank you to everyone that reached out by message asking after me. I apologize for the delay in getting back to you all. I am safe and as of yesterday I quit my job as a driver. I don't think I will ever set foot near a railway again. About an hour after my last post, there was suddenly a burst of sunlight. We came hurtling out of the tunnel, far faster than the legal limit, and I had to immediately slam on the emergency brake. Normally when you hit the brakes like that, you hear shouts from the passengers, but the cars behind me were dead silent. Slowly I began moving again, heading towards the nearest station, barely able to see in the harsh daylight after so long underground. My boss wanted to fire me. It's not like I can blame him. 
I was AWOL for two hours and reappeared with a dented train pulling the wrong way into a station on the wrong track. By all rights, I could have been arrested. The union had my back, though, talked her down to an immediate resignation if I didn't press charges for the faulty signaling. I expected hell when I opened the train doors at the station. As the train stopped, I felt light and shaky, trying to process what had just happened in the normality of a railway stop. In the moment, I tried to say something on the radio, to apologize or announce the situation, but my mouth was dry and my hands were trembling too badly, so instead I just opened the doors, opened my own, stepped out onto the platform and braced myself for the hell of shouting and screaming and threats that would come my way. But there were none. Instead, they just filed out, silent and pale, and stood there on the concrete staring at me. I'll never forget that as long as I live. How they watched me, hundreds of them, blank-faced as I just turned and ran. The photograph depicted six people joyfully smiling at the camera and posing in front of a beautifully decorated Christmas tree. Four of them were adults, my uncle, aunt, mother, and father. And the other two were a ten-year-old girl and a one-year-old baby, the young girl lovingly cradled in her arms. Ever since your mother got pregnant, Kylie wouldn't stop rambling about how impatient she was for you to be born. And when that finally happened, she then wanted you to grow up so quickly so you could both play together. My aunt explained as I stared at the picture. I had no memories of Kylie, so seeing a picture of myself right alongside her as a baby was fascinating. And emotional in a way I can't really put into words. It made me wonder what could have been had it not for her. The sudden tragedy that would befall upon my cousin and would devastate the whole family shortly after. Just a week after that cheerful Christmas day of 2005, Kylie would mysteriously go missing one dark and cold January night of 2006, never to be seen or heard from again. As for me, I'd since grown into an 18-year-old college student. I had come to stay at my aunt's house for a while because it was conveniently located near the college I studied at. After having lunch and chatting with my aunt and uncle, they took me upstairs to show me the room I'd be sleeping in. I recognized that locked door at first sight. Kylie's room. It had remained locked ever since Kylie disappeared and all my attempts to enter it when I was a kid had resulted in me getting scolded by my mother and aunt. Are you sure you can take it? I can sleep on the couch downstairs. You don't have to do this. I asked my aunt and uncle, knowing what that room meant for them, and knowing how they promised themselves to permanently keep that room shut ever since the day they lost Kylie. We've given it a lot of thought. Don't worry about us, Jane. Kylie loved you. It's what she would have wanted. They replied as they slowly opened the door to Kylie's room. My aunt and uncle had cleaned it up a bit the day before my arrival, but for the most part, it looked pretty much identical to how it did the day Kylie vanished. The pink flowery wallpaper that decorated the wall, the shelf filled with toys and children's books. The bed and even the bed sheets were also the same. It almost felt as if Kylie herself had just been there earlier that day, as if time had stopped flowing after she went missing. This room is yours now. Make yourself at home and feel free to call us if you need anything, my aunt and uncle proclaimed before leaving me alone in the room. I spent the remainder of that evening reading a book I had to write an essay about for college. After a couple of hours, I decided I had read enough for that day and opened a drawer next to the bed in order to store the book, only to find that there already was a book inside that drawer, a very special kind of book. 
It was considerably smaller than my book from college. Its cover was pink with the title being written in big purple letters that spelled My Diary. It didn't take a genius to figure out what this book was and who it most likely used to belong to. I did not hesitate to pick it up and began reading the first page. I was tired of reading the book from college, but how could I say no to the diary of my long-lost cousin? December 25th, 2005. Dear Diary, It's Christmas Day. I've received tons of presents this morning. I knew Santa Claus was proud of me. I've gotten the new Animal Crossing game from my DS, a pair of woolly earmuffs, and this diary. I wanted a doll like the one all the other girls in my class have. There's even a boy who has the doll too, but he told me to keep it a secret. Mommy says I have to be thankful for what I've gotten, and I guess she's right, so not having the doll doesn't bother me that much. Also, my aunt and uncle and baby Jane have visited us and we've all had lunch together. Baby Jane is the cutest. I promised my aunt I would take care of her just like mommy took care of me when I was a baby. Reading that first entry made me shed a few tears. I couldn't help it. I could picture the innocent smile on her face as she wrote on her brand new diary that Christmas day. And the way she talked about me as a baby was so heartwarming, it almost made me feel enraged about the fact I knew I had spent time with her, but was far too young to remember any of it. December 26th, 2005. Dear Diary, what a day. Mommy and Daddy have taken me to a snowy mountain. There were other kids with their parents and we've played together in the snow. It was so much fun. We made a snowman and I wanted to give him my earmuffs but Mommy said I needed them for myself so my ears can stay warm and cozy. I saw another girl with earmuffs, and hers were much cuter. They were pink and were shaped like hearts. Mine are just round and red. Anyway, the best part of the day was when I found a doll lost in the snow. She looks like an angel. She's not like the doll my friends have, but she's cute, so I've taken her home. And guess what? I've named her Jane, like the baby. That entry made me notice something I had first seen when I entered the room, but I hadn't really paid attention to it until Kylie's diary brought it up. The plush doll that was sitting on Kylie's bed, which was now my bed, I guess. It looked like a traditional angel with a pair of wings, white robes, and a small halo on its head. I had no doubt about it. This doll had to be the same one mentioned in the diary, which Kylie had named after myself. Kylie wrote that she had found the doll lost on a snowy mountain in late 2005, but it looked to be much older than that. It would have felt right at home in an antique store filled with memorabilia from the Victorian era. Who knows where it had come from? and what it had been through before being found by Kylie. I figured that continuing to read the diary would perhaps give me more information about that mysterious doll I shared my name with. December 27th, 2005 Dear Diary, Jane cried last night. She was sleeping by my side and she started crying, like a real kid. This morning, I've told mommy and daddy, but they believe I'm just playing pretend. But I'm not. I woke up and she wasn't in bed with me. Maybe she didn't want me to pick her up. I tried to cheer her up by bringing her to my friend Sarah's house. We played with our dolls and made a make-believe tea party. Sarah said Jane wasn't as cute as her doll. She said Jane was kind of creepy. I got upset because that made Jane feel sad, so she might cry tonight as well. Thanks a lot, Sarah. That last entry left me utterly baffled. A plethora of conflicting thoughts flooded my mind as I stared at that doll in the bed. 
No, it simply couldn't be possible. It didn't make rational sense for Kylie's diary entry to be taken literally. Surely it was nothing more than a child with a wild imagination. But still, the sudden tone shift compared to the previous two entries was striking. I had originally planned to sleep with the Jane doll next to me out of respect for Kylie, but after reading her diary, I instead opted to leave it on the shelf with the other toys. It just gave me some bad vibes I didn't quite know how to explain. But I knew there was something about her that felt off, and the fact it was named Jane just like me didn't help either. I woke up in the middle of the night as an odd, high-pitched sound broke the silence. I drowsily looked around the bedroom in pitch darkness in hopes of identifying where the sound had come from, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. I wiggled in bed for a couple seconds, trying to get in a comfortable position to get back to sleep. It was then when I felt something small and soft touching my arm. The Jane doll. There it was, laying next to me. I vaguely remembered having put her on the shelf before going to sleep, but it was late and I was pretty tired. So my sleepy brain assumed that I had just imagined leaving her on the shelf and had kept her in bed this whole time. A short while afterwards, I was woken up by a sudden noise once again. It sounded like a child was crying. I stood up only to see what looked like a small, shadowy figure in the darkness, standing right next to the bed. I also noticed the Jane doll was gone. It wasn't on the bed and it wasn't on the shelf, either. I rubbed my eyes, thinking this was just what they call a sleep paralysis demon. You know, an imaginary shadow creature our mind sometimes conjures when you wake up abruptly, and your senses are alert but your mind is still half asleep, and misinterprets reality. But those kinds of illusions are normally static and lifeless, and only last a couple seconds. No, that shadowy child was something else. I was sure I could hear them weep. I tried to turn on the lights, but they had inexplicably stopped working. The shadowy child lingered in the darkness sobbing right next to the bed with their hands covering their face. I sat on my bed, contemplating them in silence. My brain was still too sleepy and confused to move or react in any other way. Kylie? I faintly uttered the first thing that came to my mind as I slowly tried to process what was going on. Upon hearing my words, the child stopped weeping and put down their hands, which had been covering her face. The baby. The baby. Where is the baby? The child yelled in a voice that resembled that of a little girl as they lunged themselves towards me. I finally snapped out of my drowsy state as my survival instincts kicked in. I struggled as the child aggressively tried to grab my hair and tried to hold her arms. The baby. The baby. The child kept uttering. I gathered all the strength I could muster and pushed her out of the bed, causing her to tumble to the floor as I screamed in panic. My aunt and uncle came running in my room and I hopped out of bed. Jane, what's the matter? They asked worryingly. The doll. The doll disappeared and then there was a kid and they attacked me. I shouted in tears as I was trying to make sense of what had just happened. My uncle turned on the lights and it worked, unlike what had happened when I had tried it earlier. What doll? The one that's over there on the bed? It used to belong to Kylie. You must have had a nightmare. We understand better than anyone it must be emotionally intense for you to sleep in this room, but there's nothing to worry about. My aunt comforted me as I stared in disbelief at the doll, which had somehow reappeared on the bed. The shadowy kid had vanished without a trace. There were only 45 minutes left until 7am, which was the time I usually woke up at, so I decided not to go back to bed and to have breakfast early. 
My uncle accompanied me to the kitchen with his characteristic limp as my aunt stayed behind. Calm down, my dear. Calm down. I heard my aunt murmur. I initially thought she was talking to me until I noticed her eyes weren't directed towards me, but she instead was looking back at Kylie's room. I brought Kylie's diary with me to college. The last lecture of the day was considered the most boring one by practically the entire class. So plenty of students spent the hour distracting themselves with their computers, playing video games, or checking social media. I opted to spend it reading a few entries of Kylie's diary, desperate to find out more details about my cousin's fate, especially after the terrifying events I had experienced the previous night. December 28th, 2005. Dear Diary, I can't believe it. It's happening for real. First of all, I've lost my second milk tooth this morning while I was eating cereal for breakfast. I've put it under my pillow so the tooth fairy can come to pick it up, but I'm also excited for another thing. My aunt and uncle have gone on a trip to another country together and have left baby Jane with us in our house for a few days. Hooray. I convinced my mommy and daddy to let the baby sleep in my room with me. I'll ask the tooth fairy to bring me something I can give to baby Jane. Also, Jane the doll cried again when mommy and daddy brought baby Jane to my room in her crib. I think she wants me to put her right next to baby Jane. So I'll do that tonight, and the two Janes can sleep together. Isn't that cute? December 29th, 2005. Dear Diary, I don't understand what happened last night. Baby Jane wouldn't stop crying. Jane the doll was grabbing the baby's face, and Baby Jane started moving her adorable tiny hands and feet because she wanted the doll away from her. I grabbed the doll and told her, Bad, Jane, bad. Hurting babies is what naughty people do. Mommy and Daddy came running to my room to see why Baby Jane was crying, and they brought her to their room to sleep with them. Maybe Jane the doll doesn't like Baby Jane because they have the same name. I knew I should have named her Annabelle or something like that. My face went pale as I finished reading those two entries. For years, I'd believed that Christmas Day of 2005 was the last time Kylie and I had ever spent time together. But apparently I was wrong. I had spent my whole childhood and adolescence asking my family about Kylie, and not even once did they mention that I had spent several days alongside her after Christmas Day, right before her disappearance. It was a hard pill to swallow, but the diary confirmed that my family clearly knew more than they were letting out. But to what extent? Thinking about it sent shivers down my spine, but I had to accept it was a factor I needed to take into consideration if I really wanted to get to the bottom of this. Hey, are you okay? You look concerned, asked Cindy, a classmate of mine who sat right next to me upon seeing my reaction to Kylie's diary. It's nothing. I'm just reading a thriller novel with lots of suspense. I replied discreetly, putting the diary away so she wouldn't be able to see what I was truly reading. Cindy was really into creepy disappearances and paranormal experiences. One day she told me a really weird story about a paranormal phenomena occurring at a daycare, but I didn't really pay attention to her. I contemplated asking her for help in solving the case of my missing cousin and the doll, but I ultimately opted to keep investigating on my own. I didn't want to make this rabbit hole bigger than it already was by bringing in people who had nothing to do with it. I arrived at my uncle's house after college and found myself alone for a while. Since my aunt and uncle had gone to hang out with several other families, they had met at their collective therapy sessions for families who had lost their children. They were especially close with the parents of a little boy named Hugh as well as the parents of a teenage girl named Molly, both of whom had gone missing a few years earlier than Kylie in some incident I don't know much about. 
My aunt and uncle had left lunch prepared for me, so I ate on my own and thought about what I would do later that night. Since I didn't want to sleep with that Jane doll again, I figured reading more of Kylie's diary would give me a solution. December 30th, 2005 Dear Diary, Jane the doll is behaving very badly since baby Jane came to our house. I told my mommy and daddy about it, but they still don't believe that a doll is able to do all these things. Baby Jane sleeps in their room now, but Jane the doll is still causing trouble. Baby Jane and I were having a nap after lunch, but I was in my bedroom and she was in mommy and daddy's bedroom while they were in the living room. Jane the doll was in my room at first, but then I fell asleep for a little while and she wasn't there when I woke up. I ran to my mommy and daddy's room and Jane the doll was in baby Jane's crib and her hands were covering baby Jane's mouth so she couldn't cry. I grabbed Jane the doll and tossed her to the floor. Tonight, I'll bring baby Jane to my room and leave Jane the doll with my parents while they're asleep. They'll get mad at me, but I don't care. I must protect baby Jane. I was astonished. The experience with the Jane doll I had the previous night made it clear to me it was best to stay away from it, but I never could have imagined it had been after me since I was a literal baby. And Kylie caught on eventually and did her best to keep me safe. I had no doubt that a cursed doll was responsible for whatever had happened to her. It was then when I noticed there was only one last entry of the diary left to read. I eagerly turned the page in order to find out what secrets could Kylie's last testimony hold. January 26th, 2006. Dear Diary, The baby, the baby, where is the baby? Did Jane take the baby? Did Jane take Kylie? The baby is not with me. The baby. Protect the baby. Kylie must protect the baby. Kylie is here. Jane is here. But where is the baby? Kylie will always protect the baby. Always. If the previous entries had impressed me, this last one simply left me speechless to a point I cannot describe with words. The things Kylie had written up to that point had described outlandish situations, sure, but the events they narrated at least maintained a certain degree of cohesion and structure. In contrast, this last entry didn't really narrate any events at all, and instead seemed like the ramblings of someone who had gone mad and was in the middle of having a mental breakdown. It was hard to believe a little girl who had once been so innocent and cheerful could have written something like this. But its disturbing content wasn't the only thing that felt off about this last entry. The date. It was supposedly written in January 2nd of 2006, but the previous entry was dated December 30th of 2005. What happened between those two dates? It was apparent a couple of pages had been removed, but by who? Just when I was starting to theorize about the mysterious last diary entry and the pair of missing entries, my aunt and uncle arrived home. For that night, I decided to follow Kylie's plan and get the Jane doll away from my room by putting her in the attic. I also locked my bedroom's door for good measure. I was woken up in the middle of the night once again, only this time it wasn't because of something coming from inside the bedroom, but from the outside. I could have sworn I had heard the attic's door opening at the other side of the hallway. Tap, 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 tap. Footsteps. Someone was coming to my bedroom. It didn't take long before they knocked on the door. Who... who's there? I uttered, but received no response. They kept knocking, again and again, growing more and more impatient until what had started as normal knocking turned into aggressive banging. 
I lay on my bed, horrified as the entity at the other side of the door began to whisper some familiar words. The baby. A little girl's voice repeatedly uttered. I had no doubt it was the same shadowy child from the previous night. Tap, 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 tap. All of a sudden, the sound of footsteps echoed across the hallway once again. Someone else was heading to the bedroom. I felt shivers down my spine as the sound of rattling keys was followed by the slow and eerie creaking of my bedroom's door. Whoever was there. It was evident that second individual had come to open the door for the shadowy child. For... Kylie. I frantically hid under the bed as the door opened and the outline of the two individuals became barely visible in the dark hallway. Right in front of the bedroom, Kylie stepped inside the bedroom as the other individual, who was much taller, began to walk away with a very familiar limp. You won't take her away. Kylie murmured as she aimlessly roamed around the bedroom. I had tried to talk to her last time, and that had only resulted in her attacking me, so I opted to keep silent under the bed. After several minutes of roaming the bedroom filled with confusion and anger, Kylie crouched and crawled under the bed. My heart was racing as I thought she had found my hiding spot and was coming for me, but to my surprise, she curled into a ball and began weeping seemingly unaware of my presence just a few inches away. I held my breath as well as the tears that were flowing from my eyes, trying not to make a sound as I slowly wiggled away from Kylie, who was still quietly sobbing in a corner. Slowly but surely I began emerging from under the bed. The upper half of my body had made it out, but I was still struggling with my legs and feet. Bump. My face went pale as I felt my right foot hitting on the bed legs. Kylie yelled as she reached out with her arms to try and drag me back under the bed. She tried to get a hold of my feet, but by that point, I had stopped trying to be stealthy. I stood up and quickly sprinted out of the bedroom as I could see Kylie's blurry silhouette crawling from under the bed. Jane, what's wrong? Why aren't you in your room? My aunt and uncle exclaimed in confusion as I ran to their bedroom. You know what's going on. I replied in a combination of anger and fear. What are you talking about? Shouldn't you be asleep? You have to get up early to go to college tomorrow. They said, continuing to act clueless. I'm talking about Kylie. I can hardly believe it myself, but Kylie's still in there. And that creepy doll of hers has something to do with it. Oh, Jane. We get that Kylie's disappearance has affected you ever since you were a child. We're the first ones who wish we could see her again. We also sometimes imagine that she's still with us, but we have to face the truth and press on. We can't let our lives be consumed by grief. You're tired. You should really go back to sleep. We can talk about this tomorrow if you need to, okay? My aunt uttered in a soft, motherly voice as she hugged me. Seeing how trying to talk to them was futile, I ended up doing what they told me and going back to sleep, but not to Kylie's bedroom. I spent the remainder of that night sleeping on the couch downstairs. My aunt and uncle and I ate breakfast, gathered around the table in the kitchen, with all three of us eating in silence. Even if you had been a stranger randomly stumbling into the kitchen without the slightest idea of who we were and what was going on, you would have still been able to sense the palpable tension between us pretty clearly. As I finished eating my toast, I took a deep breath before finally deciding to break the ice. We need to talk. We need to talk about Kylie. I uttered. We returned to staring at each other silently for a couple seconds before my aunt responded. Sure, honey. If only Kylie could see you all grown up. 
she said as she shed a few tears. We can talk about what happened if that's what you want. Even though I'm not sure what we can tell you that you don't already know. My uncle added. Then why didn't you tell me about the fact I was there? I stoutly asked. Once again, they stayed silent. Judging by their stare, it was clear they were not expecting that question. I was there the week Kylie vanished. My parents were on a trip and I stayed at your house as a baby, alongside Kylie. I know this because I found her old diary in her room. I've read it all except for a few pages that are missing. Why did no one in my family ever tell me about this? I continued my interrogation, raising my voice to make it clear I was not joking around. You were just a baby. We thought that learning about it would be too traumatic for you, and since you had no memory of it anyway, we figured it would be best to omit that detail. My uncle answered once they realized I was going to stop at nothing to find out the truth. But I'm not a baby anymore. I have the right to find out what truly happened. Oh, and that fact you call a detail is much more than that. Kylie wrote about the time she spent with me. She wrote about that doll that she named after myself. I don't know how or why, but that thing wants something from me. It has wanted something from me ever since I was a baby, and Kylie knew and tried to protect me. Oh, hold on. Jane, you're taking this too far. Are you suggesting that a simple doll is responsible for my daughter's disappearance? My aunt asked. I'm not suggesting it. I'm sure of it. And Kylie? She might not be the same, but she's not entirely gone. That doll has gotten a hold of her. I've seen her. I've seen firsthand what happens in her room every night. I exclaimed. Oh, look at the time. You'd better get going or else you'll be late to college. My uncle said as he forcefully put an end to the conversation. Wait, you can't keep the truth away from me. I protested, but it was no use. My aunt and uncle refused to keep talking and practically dragged me outside of the house. I skipped the last two lectures of college and returned to my uncle's home earlier than usual. As I expected, my aunt and uncle hadn't arrived home yet. Great. That gave me some time to continue investigating without being disturbed. It had become evident that my aunt and uncle weren't too fond of me looking into Kylie's disappearance and finding out about things that were never intended for me to know about. That accursed Jane doll was the one behind everything. I had no doubt about it. No matter how much my aunt and uncle tried to deny it, I'm going to be honest. After what happened on my first night spent sleeping in Kylie's room, I originally thought that the Jane doll was haunted by Kylie, but while that assumption turned to be partially correct, I was now sure it wasn't the whole picture. Yes, it had become apparent that Kylie's spirit had somehow become attached to that doll, but Kylie herself wasn't the one in control. The doll was the one pulling the strings holding Kylie against her will. Indeed, Kylie's diary confirmed that the doll was already alive before Kylie disappeared, or rather, before the doll took her over. If I wanted all of this to end, I had to destroy that doll. I climbed the staircase and confidently marched towards Kylie's bedroom, ready to grab that Jane doll, bring her to the fireplace in the living room, and let her be consumed by the flames. But as I stepped foot inside the room, I realized that the doll was not there. And not only that, but there were no signs of Kylie's diary either. After scouring Kylie's room in search of the doll and the diary without success, I headed across the hallway to the first place that came to my mind. My uncle and aunt's bedroom. There was nothing of importance under the bed or at their nightstand, or inside their multiple drawers and closets, but I knew they had to be somewhere in that room, 
Where else could they possibly be? Who else could have been interested in hiding the doll and the diary away from me? Especially after I had explicitly told them I had an interest in those artifacts earlier that morning. I swung open a large wardrobe. At first glance, it seemed to serve no other purpose than to store my aunt's extensive collection of fur coats and scarves. But upon closer inspection, it became clear that there was something else. A small object discreetly tucked at the bottom of the wardrobe, hidden behind the dense row of bulky clothes. I stretched my arms and pulled the mysterious object out of the wardrobe, revealing a dusty wooden box. I opened it without hesitation, smiling of satisfaction as I glanced at its contents. The Jane doll, Kylie's diary, and something else. A pair of pages with something written on them which looked all too familiar. December 31st, 2005. Dear Diary, I've done it. It's the last day of the year, and me and baby Jane will be spending it together. I don't care about what mommy and daddy say. I've locked myself in my room with baby Jane right after having dinner. But we're not going to sleep. She's supposed to be at mommy and daddy's room, but I've swapped her for Jane the doll so I can protect her. Baby Jane makes it hard to focus on writing this because she's sitting on my lap right now being the cutest thing I've ever seen. Aw, she just smiled at me. Focus, Kylie. So anyways, Jane the doll is at mommy and daddy's room, but I know she'll try to come for us tonight. That's why I've locked the door. I will not let her harm baby Jane, no matter what. January 1st. 2006. Dear Diary, It's early in the morning. Baby Jane and I are doing our best to hold out. Jane the doll has been trying to get in for hours. All I can hear is banging and more banging. It's so loud it makes poor baby Jane cry, but mommy and daddy are still sleeping in their room. Don't be afraid, baby Jane. If that doll wants to get you, She'll have to go through the door first, and if she manages to do that, she'll have to go through me. Wait, the banging has stopped. I can hear Jane the doll going away. Yes, she's going back to Mommy and Daddy's room. Oh wait, I forgot there were more keys in Mommy and Daddy's room. Before I had enough time to process those two diary entries, I was shaken by the sound of footsteps. It sounded like someone was climbing the stairs. I tried to put everything inside the box and hide it away at the last second, but I was too late. My aunt and uncle walked into the room, catching me off guard. We expected you'd find this eventually. I guess there's no need to keep pretending at this point. It's best for us to tell you everything so we can start getting things done. My uncle said in a serious tone. Yes, forgive us, Jane, but we have to. It told us it's the only way, my aunt added as she pointed at the doll. What? What are you talking about? What do you want to do? I asked as my body started trembling in fear. You see, when that doll took our daughter that fateful January night over 17 years ago, the one it was truly after was you but Kylie would stop at nothing to protect you, and she put herself in between you and the doll. And so, the doll seized our beloved child, holding her spirit hostage for years, to the point she lost the ability to think rationally, and is now just angry and confused, eternally seeking to fulfill a purpose she's unaware that she already accomplished. But the doll always made us know what she was willing to give us back, in exchange for the child it actually wanted. My aunt explained in tears as she picked the doll up. You can't trust that thing. Don't you see it's manipulating you? I replied, but my aunt and uncle no longer listened to reason. We could have done this years ago, 
but we couldn't bring ourselves to do it when you were still a child. But after all those years spent knowing that our poor daughter was suffering every single day without us being able to do anything about it, we realized there was no other choice, my uncle said as he began advancing towards me. His limp gave me time to back away, but there wasn't anything else I could do. My uncle grabbed me by the neck and immobilized me as I helplessly struggled to liberate myself. Forgive us, Jane. Forgive us. He uttered as I slowly lost consciousness. As I gradually came to my senses, I glanced at the Jane doll which was sitting on the floor mere inches away from my face as a blurry figure materialized right next to it. Kylie. My parents watched in awe from a few feet away as I broke into tears, never having cried so hard in my entire life. It was then when something snapped in Kylie as she heard my tears. The baby. The baby. Kylie yelled as she grabbed the Jane doll with rage and began ripping it apart. She then walked towards me, gently wiping away my tears with her hands. Baby Jane, she whispered. Our daughter, our daughter is back. My aunt and uncle uttered in awe, but Kylie turned back and approached my uncle visibly enraged. My uncle and aunt were so shocked by that reaction, they were initially going to hug her, but decided to slowly back away. What's the matter, dear? They asked. But Kylie responded by aggressively lunging herself at the one she caught up to first. My uncle, who tripped and fell down the stairs, hitting his head and dying instantly. My aunt, overwhelmed by the current situation, attempted to jump down the balcony to end it all, but I was able to intercept her and retain her in the bedroom until the police arrived. Kylie and I hugged each other in a long embrace that felt so intense and emotional. It was almost as if we were trying to make up for all the hugs we missed when I was growing up. You are not a baby anymore. I like that. Kylie murmured before finally fading away. After my aunt got arrested for having assaulted me and held me hostage, the house was emptied out and sold to another family. Kylie's diary was the only thing I managed to keep for myself. Hey, how was your day? I've heard about what happened with your aunt and uncle. Cindy asked. Don't worry, I'm fine. I'm glad this mess has been resolved once and for all. I replied as I was trying to follow the teacher's lecture. It was then when I saw two of my classmates checking something on a computer. It was a listing for an old doll that was being sold online. It was in very bad shape and looked to have been crudely sewn back together and reassembled with stitches. The listing read, Jane the doll, warning. Vintage doll found at a crime scene said to have been haunted. Buy at your own risk. Hi guys. Not sure if this is the right place for it, but I thought that if anyone would be interested in my story, then it would probably be the people here. So I moved into a new place recently. It's a pretty good spot. Nice and quiet, and right on the edge of the city. The rent's really decent as well, especially for a newly renovated apartment in this area of London. Apparently the building's been around for ages, and the location isn't super ideal for a lot of people, so they had to keep the rent low. No complaints from me though. I don't have a car, and I can cycle pretty easily to the nearby station. Moving in was straightforward enough, and I'm pretty satisfied with the place so far. Here's where it gets weird. Shortly after settling in, I noticed that a patch of loose carpet, right at the threshold between where the bedroom connects to the living room. Now normally I would have just called the landlord to fix it up, 
but it didn't seem like a big deal at the time. Thought I'd take care of it myself. Save some cash in the process, right? Upon looking at the carpet more closely, I found something a bit unusual. There was a little gap where the carpet seemed to sag. When I pulled the carpet back, I found a little patch, no wider than my fist, where it looked like a floorboard had decayed, revealing the subfloor beneath. It was a bit like poking a hole in the top layer of foil on one of those prepackaged meals. A little peephole revealing everything that was underneath. I'm a pretty curious guy by nature, so I couldn't help but shine a torch in there to have a quick peek. I wasn't expecting much, but to my surprise, right beneath the hole there sat an unassuming little object, a squarish shape which barely stood out amongst the dust, dirt, and mold. When I first saw it, I thought it was a tablet, an iPad, or a Kindle, or something. With a coat hanger, some mounting tape, and a lot of patience, I eventually managed to fish it out. Out in the light, I could see that it was, in fact, not an iPad, like I had hoped, but a little hardcover bound book. Though the exterior was essentially eaten away by a blackish mold, I could still make out a single word. Impressed against the faded red cover, journal. Inside, the pages were in pretty bad shape. The first half of the journal was irretrievable. Mold stained and practically crumbling to the touch. I could barely leaf through them without causing irreversible damage. The back half wasn't much better, with a good portion of it torn out, or, strangely enough, burnt. In addition, a lot of the writing itself was illegible, either crossed out, faded, or too frantically scrawled to comprehend. Around the margins and in the spaces between the words, I can make out strange sketches, shapes, and figures which are hard to describe. I'll see if I can upload some photos later. The contents are unusual, if not a little disturbing. It's a little disparity, because of how much of the text was unreadable, but I've transcribed the parts I could make out, and ordered them chronologically here. Let me know what you guys think. Journal Entries Monday, April 4th, 1953 Recently I've been feeling unwell. Upon returning from my latest trip to the east, I found that my whole body aches, and I am constantly stricken by bouts of weakness and fatigue. I cannot stand for long, as the world spins when I am upright. Most concerningly, I seem to be experiencing hallucinations. Strange visual distortions which addle both my balance and my perception of depth. Strangely enough, I no longer dream. Doctors have attributed it to an exotic ailment, exposure to miasmus, a viral disease, an insect bite. The source varies with each practitioner I meet. I do not know when this started. I do not recall the reason I went to Asia. Friday, April 29th, 1953. The symptoms have descended upon me quickly like a fog. In addition, my recollection has become hazy as well. I am unable to recall what it feels like to be without malaise. I have no recollection of my travels now. If it were not for this journal, I would not have known I traveled at all. The doctors attribute this state of being to a range of ailments. It differs with every visit. Bilious fever, egg, illness of the ears, eyes, and brain. Even hormonal imbalances caused by states of panophobia and neurosis. Yet the tests have been fruitless. Physically, my body is not inconsistent with the body of a perfectly healthy human being. At this point, I care little about the cause. The symptoms are all I experience, and brief respite from these afflictions is my only desire. Wednesday, June 15th, 1953. As my condition worsens, more unique symptoms have begun to surface. 
In the past, I have written in my journal to distract myself from the turbulent environment around me. But now, when I put pen to paper, I have been unable to conjure neither the words nor images necessary to describe my past experience. I can only focus on my present state, of the world which appears before my sensations in the here and now. In the future, I might look back to these entries and recall this affliction which has ailed me for so long, but I am doubtful. Thoughts of the future are becoming hazy also. Sunday, June 19th, 1953. These visions, they have only grown in vividness and intensity. No longer are they simple distortions of shape and color in ordinary objects. Now, entirely new objects have emerged, like balloon animals being inflated, thin figures billow outwards, creating uneven, grotesque forms. Almost always they are bulbous, organic things, bulging and pulsating before my eyes. Day Uncertain July 2nd, 1953. As I grow more accustomed to these visions, their features become more distinguished. What once were just vague, opaque blobs have now become sharply defined substances, or perhaps even organisms of sorts, perhaps even flora. Although they vary greatly in shape, color, and size, it is clear that there exists a certain resemblance between some more than others. It is possible they even belong to specific and distinct genera. But enough of this. To categorize hallucinations like they were some undiscovered zoological species is an act that even my addled mind can recognize as insanity. July 1953. They have begun moving now. Soundlessly they creep across my sight line, some locomoting like caterpillars, while others sink on wireframe feet. These feet, thin feelers reminiscent of ant antenna, poke and probe the ground ahead, as if searching for stable ground. Dozens of these feelers extend from below their bodies. Globular, ovoid masses, which appear as smooth as they are pliant. Others sit upon stems like detached eyes floating in place. On more than one occasion, I have seen small ones collide, merge, and become one entity. Some of the larger ones, in fact, appear as a collection of small globules, orbs upon its body so numerous that it simulates fur. I can only wonder if they are a singular organism, or simply a congregation of them moving as one. In these pages, I see that I have once referred to them as flora. I now see that this was an error. Yet, neither. Are they fauna? They are a sort of combination. Not quite animal, not quite plant. July, I think. 1953. They are everywhere. I have seen them creep across my page. I have seen them loom outside my window. They are not visions. I have reached out and touched them. The one I felt was chewing gum colored. It was warm and fleshy to the touch. 1953. I think. Perhaps they have always been here. Silent, numerous, invisible to the human eye. Perhaps my affliction is not illness, but insight. I have gained access to a world truer than our own. But this is no blessing. To watch and feel these things creep over my body, pulse on my bed, cast shadows over my building. It is something no man should see. Date Uncertain I awoke with one in my mouth. It crawled out so easily, as mundane as a laborer leaving their family home for work. It felt like a slick and pungent trail behind it. Tastes like gasoline. How long had it resided within me? 
How many of these creatures had I unknowingly ingested in my lifetime? My throat burns as I retch. Amongst the remains of my last meal, things shift and slither. I don't know how much more of this I can take. Date uncertain. To my family, if I had one, please burn this diary if you were to ever find it. I would do it myself, but I fear to exit my drawing room. In fact, I am no longer able to stand at all. Fixed to my writing chair, I can only scrawl upon this page. I gaze out my window and watch the world become unrecognizable before my eyes. I see them. Even when I close my eyes, I see them. They live beneath my eyelids, beneath my skin. I fear that they see me. I woke up due to a burning sensation spreading to my bare skin. The floor felt hot, and hard as steel, but burning hot in the first place. As my sight focused, returning from the slumber, I've noticed an enraged, bearded face above me, shouting something. My head ached as if it was a piñata that managed to survive the party and the vision was all blurry and hazed. What the hell happened yesterday? I thought to myself. Wait, am I naked? Get to your feet, it's heating. The bearded face's voice finally broke through my sluggish perception. What? What are you? I felt that my bare buttocks and feet are getting stung by the heat, so I've rushed all the speed I had left to stand straight, almost losing conscious again as blood rushed from my head into my limp body. I quickly looked around. It seemed that we were inside of a room with no windows and all the surfaces covered in sheets of metal. A massive iron door with a valve and a speaker on the wall. A part of Beardy and me, there were four more naked men with us, all of them jumping from one foot to another, trying to avoid the burns from the heating up floor. What the hell, man? What's going on here? Who are you people? Why are we naked? I shot all the questions at once, looking into angry and somewhat confused face of the beard guy. I don't know. Anyone, do you remember your names? He shouted back over his shoulder. Silence was the answer. Which was interrupted by static from the speaker until somebody on the other side picked up and tuned the mic. Ah, so I see you're all up and performing. Good. That resulted in six angry men screaming chaotically things like, what the hell, show yourself, and let me out. But the voice continued. At this point, you might be thinking, why am I here? What is this place and why can't I remember anything, right, fellas? Right, well, the sweet treats I gave you should block most of the memories for, let's see, eight more hours, I think. By that time, I expect you to do a couple of things. One, repent for your sins, and two, make it while you still last. You, who do you think you are? A judge, Lord Almighty? Beardy shouted back, but no response followed. Meanwhile, I've started sweating like a pig. It was hot. Six of us were trapped in an improvised oven by a psychopath, who decided to execute his punishment on us, but... What for? We're gonna die either of suffocation or get roasted alive. The guy behind me said. I will call him Inky, as he had a massive chest tattoo of an eagle alongside many smaller ones. First of all, don't panic. We should be able to find our way out if we work together. The skinny old man replied, whom I will name Gramps. I've tried the door already. It won't budge an inch. Beardy replied, dropping sweat to the ground as he jumped up and down. You two, 
Any ideas? Gramps asked the rest of the men. As I looked over Beardy's shoulder, I suddenly realized that one of the two guys left had only a single leg. That made it extra hard for him to avoid the heat, so his partner was holding the crippled man's arm over his shoulders, helping him jump all together with him. Also, that Samaritan had long blonde hair that was soaked in sweat, so I've named those two Pirate and Bon Jovi. Don't ask. I wasn't thinking straight. And no, no fresh ideas from those two. The heat was still bearable, it burned, but like the desert sand when the sun is at its peak, some minutes passed and we didn't come up with anything. Guys tried the door a couple of times again. Joining forces didn't result in anything either. Solid. We discussed if we could use walls somehow, but those had no broad dents or holes, which we could hold on to, preventing our feet touching the frying pan below. The ceiling was out of reach too, way too high. That's where the dehydration started to kick in slowly, making my temples pound and my lips to crack. Losing all that water with sweat sped up the things in rapid manner. I saw Inky sucking on blood from his bruised, dry lips instinctively, and suddenly he said, I think I may have killed somebody, out of the blue. We all stared back at him. The taste of blood in my mouth? It reminds me. This metallic taste, you know? I remember it. And I'm sure the blood was not mine. Mine is less sweet. Or something. Everybody had to think. This didn't explain anything. But wait, is this the sin that jerk talked about? What does the rest of us have to do with it? Bon Jovi's son. Well, maybe we're a gang of mass murderers, and we're all involved in some slaughter. Just a guess. I've said. Yeah, especially this guy over there who can't stay straight for a minute. Gramps laughed back. The speaker broke our conversation with some more static, and then spew out next words. Oh, gentlemen. Having some good times, are we? I think it's time to speed up your thinking. Let's spice it up a bit, shall we? Jokes were over. In a course of the couple next minutes, I felt with my souls that the temperature went up. Now it was really hard to focus as the steel below me was burning like a thousand stings puncturing the harsh skin on my feet. All of us started to jump even more... intensively just to stay that half a second away from the smoldering surface. Lack of fresh air, dehydration, and extremely hot surroundings ripped the first victim. All of a sudden, Gramps collapsed to his knees, reaching out for his chest as if he was suffocating. Stand back. Give him space. Beardy rushed to the old man, raising him up, holding him over in the same manner Bon Jovi was treating the pirate. I've lowered my eyes to Gramp's knees. Those were reddish and swollen from contacting the hot surface with his tender, elderly skin. I think I'm a paramedic. Beardy son. What? Several of us replied. As I rushed to pick him up, I got a feeling that I did this many times before. Like a job, you know? He said. So we have a guy who thinks he killed somebody, and a guy claiming he is a paramedic? The pirate coughed with wheezy breath. Nice, well, I'll be a royal majesty then, lads. He laughed in a hoarse voice. We used all our brain power which was available to us, considering we had to jump constantly not to get burned too bad, especially considering there were two people who couldn't do this on their own now. It came back as nothing. The crackling silence of heating air was cut in half with the sudden microphone-to-speaker feedback noise and the message from our torturer. I could do this all day, but unfortunately I have other errands to care about. So how about we heat our thing a couple degrees up? 
That wild feedback sound gave me a numb feeling somewhere at the back of my skull, as if I've heard that sound many times before. I think I'm a sound technician, I said. That sound the speaker made? I think I've heard that millions of times before, but that's just my guess. Nobody was amused with this piece of information. It made things even harder. I think he passed away. Beardy said soon, checking the old man's pulse. Grim silence hung in the air as all of us stared at the skinny, lifeless body twitching intact of bearded man's jumps. Drop him. Let's use his body so others can survive. Inky quickly muttered, That's our chance. Everybody kept their thoughts on right and wrong to themselves and then Beardy just let the old man's arm go. The heated steel hissed quietly as the dead flesh landed on the ground. I guess I would throw up if I weren't so dehydrated at that point. Without consulting with the rest of us, Bon Jovi jumped towards the dead body, dragging the pirate with him, putting his only leg atop of Gramps' remains. He nodded to us as if in, I guess it's the right thing to do, and we nodded back, without saying a word. The body below hissed more intensively as pressure was applied. We were stuck in a nightmare. Though we were too confused and tired to break into mindless panic. Hold up, gentlemen. That's considered cheating. Plus, how are you going to see the whole picture now, as one of you, well, retired? You leave me no choice. Let's boost your thinking. The speaker cracked through. In the passing couple of minutes, it became just unbearable. I've checked the swollen skin on my feet, blisters started to form, which resonated with blind pain each time I landed back on the floor. The suffering was debilitating. Bon Jovi had enough. He climbed atop the broiling rests of the old man alongside the crippled guy, positioning his burnt feet on the head and the rib cage, while the pirate had his on the pelvis both of them balancing, trying not to fall. Moments later, Inky just snapped. I think hysteria got to him. He suddenly just started screaming something like, No, no, Jesus, no, no, I can't take it anymore. Then he ran towards the two atop the corpse, intending to kick them off and take their place, but something went wrong. He fell over and collapsed to the ground. What I heard next will probably haunt me for the rest of my life. That wasn't a scream. No, that was an animal roaring in pain. Inky rolled over the floor, with bits of his burnt skin sticking to hot steel here and there, tearing away from his naked body. Wailing, crying, bellowing of pain. He tried to get up a couple of times, though he slipped on the blood pouring from his numerous wounds. Until, in some confusing motion, he banged his head over the steel-covered wall and fell silent, leaving us with dread feeling of impending doom. As the pain became unbearable, I've checked that the guy was done and in a single rapid motion crossed the room, finishing atop of his back. It felt like running over razor blades soaked in acid. It was becoming harder to see around, as the liquids from the dead bodies evaporated, polluting the hot air. While I didn't pay much attention to my surroundings, I was finally able to focus. Beardy was quiet for quite some time now. I've checked to the left and to the right. The huge guy somehow managed to climb to the door, so to speak. He had both of his roasted feet soaking with ichor on the valve, balancing, fighting for his life. Or at least, that was my perception of things. Because in reality, that was still a question of, when will he snap? And then my brain reacted to the gruesome fact. He was not battling for his life. He was alternating the ending. Somehow that bear of a man was able to chew through the skin of his arms. One after another, and as the crimson stream fell down, 
seeming not to reach the floor. Evaporating on the fly, he stood there repeating, Just not like this, man. Just not like this. In a couple of minutes, that lasted like eternity. His eyes rolled back and his body hit the ground. The choking smell of his beard burning hit my nostrils. A couple of minutes passed. Three of us had nothing to say. Nobody was trying to remember. Nobody had the hope of surviving. We were just there, standing on the remains of unlucky strangers coping with the inevitable. Have you ever cut a whole baked turkey? Or a chicken, maybe? I won't ever in my life. Why? The meat produces this quiet sound of tissue ripping when you stick the knife with pressure. That's what just happened to Bon Jovi and the pirate. The old man's body cooked through, just as horrible as it sounds, but way much worse when you see it. It just ripped into two parts, separating the spine from all the conjoining tissues. It played against two exhausted men trying to balance, so both of them flew to their backs. I saw surprise and horror in their faces. They were not ready. Inhuman screams filled the room once again while two charred bodies rolled through the agony to the other side. I cried silently, grieving on their souls, unable to shed a single drop of tears, understanding that this fate keeps crawling towards me. Just please, open the door. Please let me out. I don't want to die. I whined to gods, celestial beings, and whomever could hear me in this situation. Static, and then the same voice. Well, I can't resist if you ask nicely. Go ahead. Something clicked at the back side of the door. You're free to go. I couldn't believe my ears. What kind of sick joke is this? This made no sense. What about repenting the sins and all that stuff? But I had no time to waste. What if all of this was just a bluff to prolong my suffering? I carefully balanced my way on roasted flesh of Inky, making every step count so I don't slip off to the immolating end of being burned alive. But the distance to Beardy's body was way too far to jump over to. Besides... The charred corpse couldn't take the pressure on impact. I bit my lower lip as hard as I could and ran across, leaving the skin of my soul sticking to the ground, leaving me with bleeding feet and bitten lip, but still alive. Standing on the massive corpse, I reached towards the valve and to my surprise, it turned easily, crack opening the door to my escape. Cool air hit hard on my face as I crawled on my floor away from the devilish room through a dark corridor. It still wasn't over. I wasn't safe yet. As I had not that many options, I just went forward until I got to the only source of light I could notice. There was a small room at the corridor ending with a table, some files, a monitor which showed the gruesome picture of roasted bodies and some audio equipment. While I was catching my breath, I couldn't help but pick up one of the files. It was Inky's. His name was Richard Adams. He was a barber, not a killer. Next came Beardy, or Ben Willis, the cook in a restaurant. The rest were Neil Scott, ex-construction worker who suffered a work incident, Graham Nelson, an old school teacher, and finally Josh Rudy, university student. And of course there was I, Philip Jones, the zookeeper. There was no connection. Our revelations about being paramedics and killers were just fake memories and guesses. This made absolutely no sense. You might wonder why I did this to you. I realized a hooded figure stood in the distance, hidden in dark shadows casted by the light on the table. I wanted to answer. I wanted to ask questions, but my mouth was too dry. 
I couldn't make a sound. I was too exhausted. Oh, not in the talking mood? Okay. I'll tell you anyways. The figure came closer. I still couldn't see his face as he leaned to me and said, No particular reason. I felt the sting of the needle to my neck and the world faded to black. After I recovered from the hospital, thought a lot about what happened. Police were all over the place, but with such poor data, the investigation is not going very fast. People keep going missing around the city. Somebody leaves. Somebody becomes the natural disaster victims. Some die to gunshots and end up in rivers and lakes with weight attached to them. That doesn't scare me anymore. I will never recover from being the last man standing. I'm afraid that he won't stop there. I am so afraid to wake up naked again. I live on the sixth floor of an apartment building. My bedroom window overlooks a large park directly across the street. That park is where I work, and it makes for a very easy commute. I only work part-time, and I do basic groundwork every single day, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. The park opens at 8 a.m. every day of the year, so I also unlock the gates. I never used to be a morning person. 8 a.m. is quite easy for me to be waking up, so I usually nap for an extra hour when I get back into my apartment. I'm also hired to close up. One hour before it closes, I have to lock up the toilets and empty all the public bins into the dumpster. 20 minutes before it closes, I have to start informing people that they should head out as the park is closing. Once everyone is out, I go around and lock up all the gates. There are five in total. I stay until 30 minutes after the park has closed. Overall, I work for two and a half hours a day. The opening shift is always 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., but the closing shift changes depending on the month. We're in December, so since it gets dark early, the park closes at 6 p.m. Meaning I'm from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. It's a pretty easy job, and for the past couple of months, I've been looking for a second job nearby. Of course, this would mean I'd have to give up my 9am hour-long power nap, but I figured I could manage. It's about time I stop that habit anyway. I recently got into contact with a company that hands out freelance work. Walk people's dogs in the neighborhood, deliver groceries, paint fences, etc. It's exactly the kind of extra work I was looking for, as it's flexible. I can change how much freelance work I do for the winter and summer months. The company is really great when you first sign up. You can give them the exact hours you're available. Last week I opened the park up as normal and did some freelance work after. It was three jobs and they were all dog walking. This meant I spent pretty much the whole day in the park for once, as that's where I tend to walk the dogs. 5 p.m. came around and I went to do all the closing shift stuff. I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, and the last person was out of the park just five minutes after closing time. Anyone who has tried to get people out of a place that's closing will tell you that it's not too bad at all. I finished up and was going to go home, but remembered that I still had one more freelance task for the day. I had to deliver a carton of six eggs from a local store to a place a few blocks over. Easy job. I went to the store and picked up some eggs. The job was specific on which brand it had to be. I should have probably checked the eggs, as when I tried to pay for them, the cashier apologized for the eggs being cracked and swapped them out. But I got them in the end and started making my way to the delivery address. I was walking on foot since it wasn't too far, and was extremely tired. Since starting the freelance work, there have been some days that I've been able to squeeze in my hour-long power nap. This was not one of those days. 
It seems silly that I can't operate properly without it, but it's just something I have to get used to. What happened next? I blamed on my fatigued mind. I now know that I shouldn't have. The store and delivery address were basically perfectly two blocks from the park in either direction. The park was exactly in the middle. As I walked past it, I noticed something moving from deep within through the trees. I shouted through, Hey, the park should be empty now, but got no response. I figured it was nothing, since my view was obstructed anyway, but as I walked past one of the main gates, no longer any trees blocking my view, I could still make something out. There were no lights on in the park. Thick, dense darkness shrouded it at night. It almost feels like you should be able to reach out and touch it. Like trying to walk through it would be physically impossible. Yet through it, I could make out a vaguely humanoid figure. There was no distinct color. In fact, almost a lack thereof. Just a gray, blurry blob. Dancing and moving. Changing and swaying. It looked familiar. Perhaps like the kind of things you see when you look directly at a bright light and then away. More like an imprint on the eye than anything physical. I work here. You need to leave. It's trespassing. The way that it didn't respond or even seem to move at my request. I decided I was just being silly. I think we've all seen things in the dark before. Especially when we're tired. So, as uneasy as I was feeling in that moment, I continued to walk past the park. The full journey along that side is about three minutes, and I spend most of it looking inwards through the fence. It seemed to move with me. I didn't pay a lot of attention to where I was walking and nearly tripped over a few times, especially when I nearly walked directly into a black cat. I made my way to the delivery address, delivered the eggs, and headed back home. I live right in the middle of that side of the park, so another two minutes of being able to peer in. I didn't spot the figure at first. I walked past someone who lives on my streets, and we stopped to chat. As we do occasionally. He was coming back from the store I had been to with some cleaning supplies. I asked why he desperately needed those and he just said that he needed to clean a mess in his kitchen. I laughed. It must be a hard job if you need that much. I felt calmer again now. I had human contact. There was something so eerie about darkness. Being in the dark, thinking I saw something, it just made me feel so alone. Having a conversation is what I needed. We said goodbye and I continued walking for the last minute of my journey. But right as I got to my apartment building, I turned around before I opened the door, and almost collapsed from fear. Right up against the fence, clear as day, was a tall, gray thing. It looked less humanoid this close up, less like it was dancing and swaying, and more like it was shaking and convulsing. Its gray skin was pulsing and shifting in a way that almost made me not notice the complete lack of eyes. I only realized it had no eyes. When eyes began to form right on its face, its skin seemed to open up on the head, allowing for two grotesque eyes to pierce through. I caught myself falling slightly and got through the building door. I didn't wait for the elevator. I ran up the stairs and didn't look back. I got to the sixth floor, got into my place, and peered out my bedroom window. There was nothing at the fence, and it almost spooked me just as much to see a lack of anything there, like I was crazy. For the past week, I've phoned in sick to my park job. My boss keeps asking if I even had the energy to just lock and unlock the gates. I keep claiming I don't. I continue to do my freelance work during the bright hours, just hoping my boss and colleagues don't spot me. I just don't want to be in the park in the dark again. I've not even so much as peered out my bedroom window at night. 
but this morning, I tried. Today at about 4 a.m., I got up to go to the toilet. As I was about to get back into bed, I just felt like I should peer out again. I did, and I saw it, right up against the fence, shaking, convulsing, and pulsing, like it was almost trying to pass through the bars. Maybe it's just because I'm six floors up and couldn't see it properly, but sometimes it even looked like parts of it were passing right through the solid metal of the fence. I spotted a woman walking down the street on her phone. I saw she was carrying a carton of eggs, and then it clicked. I've seen her around before. I was pretty sure she worked for the same freelance company as me, but she was about to walk past the figure. Could she not hear it? I realized at that moment that I must be crazy. Nobody else can even see this thing. Then it grabbed her. Right as she walked past, it grabbed her. After that, they both vanished into the darkness. I don't mean to say the figure ran off. They quite literally vanished. They morphed until they were nothing. As if this thing was able to just conjure up ways to move that were beyond comprehension. I was half sure that I was asleep at that point. Right then, I noticed, pulled up on the side of the road nearby, a black car. A man and a woman stood next to it, looking directly at the figure, talking about something to each other. It brought an odd sense of slight relief to know I wasn't the only person seeing this. I knew them from somewhere, but couldn't quite put my finger on where. But then it dawned on me. They were the first people I met from the freelance company. They just watched in silence as one of their employees was abducted in front of them. By a paranormal figure, no less. They must be involved somehow. I don't know how or why, but they must be. Everything going on in my life suddenly slotted together. I just haven't figured out how yet. My park job, my freelance job, this figure. How do they all connect? Today the woman was on the local news, reported as missing. I can't do anything. Who is going to believe me? If I tell anyone, I suddenly become the prime suspect. I do have another freelance job today though. I now know the job is dangerous and that my bosses do not have my best interests in mind at all, but they can't know that I know. My only job today is to paint a fence white. Usually I only have to do some of the fence. Someone comes along after to do the rest. I'm going to write something to warn them, and then I'm going to quit. I have scheduled this to post in a few weeks so that I can be long gone before the company knows I've said this all. If I quit, they can't hurt me, but they can still hurt others. I hope whoever sees my warning takes it seriously, and that I make a difference in some way. I am an avid hiker, and happen to live near a national park that I think it's best not to name. Me and my friends go hiking there often, or I guess, did. If you have ever been to a national park, you might have noticed certain areas were restricted for one reason or another. This one was no different, and the reason we were given was that the terrain was too dangerous. To me and my friends, this only made it sound more fun. When you spend as much time in a park as I, you begin to catch on to the ranger's routines. Soon you are able to avoid them with ease, and so... We made our way into the restricted area. We were soon met with disappointment as the terrain was quite flat and boring. It may have been safer there than other parts of the park. My friends and I started speculating why they might want to keep people out of here, and then we started getting shot out. We started running, I made the mistake of looking back. I didn't see the shooter, and I didn't see the hole in front of me either. After falling a good ten feet, I began examining my legs to see if I had broken them. 
my eye caught something. Behind some rocks was an old and deteriorating satchel contained within it was some shotgun shells and what appeared to be a journal. Soon my friends came back and helped me out of the hole. We all escaped without taking any shots. One of my friends proposed the idea that they were simply trying to scare us away and may have only been using blanks, but that didn't make any sense. What could they be trying to hide, and why would they keep it in such a public area? Now I think I know the answer. Once home, I began looking through the journal and found that many of the pages, although frail, were still intact. The name Ellie Johnson is written on the front. The remaining pages read as follows. October 6th, 1915. The trees are all beautiful this time of year. It's a shame the leaves don't last long. I'd rather they look this way all year. I used some of the leaves to make beds for the sheep. I thought they could use them as it's getting colder. Dad says it will be even colder this year because our new land is up higher than the old. At first that didn't make much sense to me, but now I can feel he's right. October 8th, 1915. I've noticed my chores get done a fair bit faster now that there ain't as much more than a cow and some sheep to feed. But this has left me with nothing much to do. My friends are all miles away now, and there ain't nobody out here but us. I try to help mom when I can, especially since she's carrying my little sister, or brother, but most of the time she insists on doing things herself. I never thought I'd want more chores. October 9th, 1915. Nothing much happened today other than a sheep escaped for about a half minute before dad caught her. Ain't really sure why I opened this book. October 12th, 1915. Dad's bringing a friend of his up here to go hunting. His name's Stan. Can't say I know him too well. I only met him once at church. I asked dad if I could come with them. He said someone had to stay back and help mom. He was right, I suppose, but that don't make me happy about it. October 13th, 1915. I woke up this morning and found it snowed in the night. It's got to be at least three inches. I went to see what dad might have brought home, but he hasn't gotten back yet. Mom's real worried, and so am I. Dad's usually only gone a few hours, never all night. He's never gone hunting in those woods before, neither. I told Mom I should go out and see if I can find him, but she didn't care much for that idea at all. Says I'll get lost, too. Says we should just wait. So I suppose that's what we're gonna do. October 14th, 1915. Dad's still gone. I told mom that someone was going to have to be looking for them, and since she's pregnant, it was going to have to be me. She began to cry, saying she ain't going to lose her entire family. Then she said if he wasn't back tomorrow, she'd send me into town to get help. I didn't want her any more upset than she already was, so I agreed. But I know he ain't going to be back tomorrow, and if he's hurt, he's going to need help quick. So when mom went to bed, I grabbed the shotgun by the door and some shells. I took a lantern, too. If I find dad and Stan, I'll help them back home and mom will be happy. And if I don't, I'll come home and she'll never know. October 16th, 1915. I think I'm lost. I followed the footprints leading into the forest thinking I'll find them in no time, but that damn snow kept falling and the footprints began to fade, till I couldn't see them anymore, at least not with my little lantern. But I wasn't going to let this stop me. I kept walking where I figured they must have been going. This foolish idea went as well as one might suspect. That lantern ain't worth dirt. I didn't know I was on a hill till I was rolling down it. 
I hit my head against a rock on the way down. Everything went black. I woke up the next morning half buried in snow, but by the good grace of the Lord, I didn't break any bones. I climbed back up the hill to find that the snow had erased my tracks, just the same as the others. I thought if I had just kept walking straight, I'd end up back home, but after a half hour, I was still in the woods. I kept on wandering in every direction without finding nothing but more trees and snow. Like the damn thing goes on forever. Didn't see a single animal either. Not one squirrel, nor a bird. Like these woods are dead. I did find a small cave. I reckoned it'd be better than sleeping under a tree, but I didn't get any sleep. Something strange started howling soon as I closed my eyes. It didn't sound like any wolf I know of. Ain't really sure how to describe it. But it was close. Much closer than I would have liked. I thought I might have been trying to sleep in its home, so I kept the gun ready. It didn't stop until the sun began to peek through the trees. Only then could I rest. I awoke about midday. I wonder if mom is alright. Probably not too happy. I hope she didn't come looking for me like a fool. Like me. I hope she goes and gets help. October 17th, 1915, I think. I think it's the next day, but I ain't sure. Ain't sure of anything. I began another day of hopelessly trying to escape the woods. I don't think they ever end. I think home may be a thousand miles away. If even that close. I came across some footprints. They were bigger than a bear and had inch-long claws. Next to them seemed to be the marks from something being dragged along. I followed them. I know it wasn't smart, but it was something. Something in a forest of nothing. As I followed, I'd find blood around the tracks every now and again. I kept walking till I came across a cave. This one was much larger than the one I used for a shelter. There was something inside. It was a giant beast, hunched over, eating something. There was blood all around the mouth of the cave. I saw the bones of the creature's back poking through its gray skin. I stood frozen and started to cry. I wasn't sure why at the time, but now I believe it was because I knew who it was eating. Before I could make too much noise, a hand went over my mouth and I was dragged behind a nearby rock. It was Stan. He gestured for me to be quiet and asked for the shotgun. I gave him it. I asked him what happened to his gun. He told me he dropped it while running away from that beast. Then I asked where Dad was. He didn't answer. I tried keeping my tears quiet, but I failed. In the blink of an eye, that antlered monster had its jaws in my leg. I screamed in pain before Stan shot it in the face. It released me and turned toward him. He then shot it in the chest. This didn't seem to do much good other than making it mad. The gun was now empty, but the monster was enraged. Stan ran off into the never-ending forest with the abomination gaining behind him, leaving me alone. It was going to catch him, and kill him, and drag him back here. And then it was going to do the same to me. I got up and began limping away. I kept my eyes closed until I was past the cave. I didn't want to see what was inside. I didn't get far before falling through the earth. Now I'm stuck in a hole. I don't think it's a work of nature. It's much too deep for that. It seems instead to be a trap, dug by a demon. I'm not sure how long it will be before it finds me. One of my legs are broken, and the other has been badly wounded by that beast. I can't get out. The skin around the bite wound is beginning to turn gray, and I feel sick as a dog. Mom, if you find this, I love you. And also... Run.
I work the night shift at Pine Falls Mall doing security. Pine Falls is a funny town to have a mall, considering it's mostly woods. But in the mid-80s, the town saw a large population boom, and the entire downtown was built up as this modern, urban center. Today it's mostly a bunch of offices and other industrial businesses. But the mall is still popular as the only one in town. The mall itself is tucked into the side of the mountains, making it a divisive structure in the community. Some say it's an eyesore that ruins the natural landscape, but I always thought the architecture complemented the scenery well and made a beautiful shopping center, but I digress. The point is, this mall was essentially in the woods. I was night watch and my job was to do occasional rounds and watch cameras. The only other people there were usually the day security people for about an hour until I left, my boss for a bit longer, and the custodians until about 2am. From 2 to 6 the entire property was quiet. My usual duties included doing hourly rounds and watching the camera in between. Every other hour I would begin my rounds where I'd go to several checkpoints and sign a clipboard. There were six total on all different areas of the property, and signing them all took me about an hour. 45 minutes if I was quick about it. I would arrive back at my post and wait another hour to do it again. Exciting, right? That night was like any other night. Around 1.30am, my radio rang out with a familiar voice. It was my boss. Hey, uh... Can you come outside for a second? This shocked me because I thought he had gone home over an hour ago. It was also strange because he didn't specify why or which door. Just to come outside. Hey chief, what can I do for you? Which door are you at? I can buzz you in if you need. I replied to no answer. I continued checking the cameras when I saw some lights flicker. The camera was on the west side, which is back entrance of the mall. The door led out to the employee lot. Can you come outside for a second? The voice on the radio echoed again. It sounded strange, but I couldn't put my finger on what was so odd about the voice. I was about to unlock the door remotely when the voice came again. Can you come outside? It was the same cadence and timbre every time he said it. I watched the camera closely and saw the lights change again, and I noticed they weren't flickering, but instead it was something moving out there. These lights were 8 to 10 feet up, and there isn't much that could block them. Come outside. My running theory was that someone was trying to get in by faking his voice. I considered putting in a call to the police, but I decided to check out the door for myself first. The door was a short turn and all the way down to the hall. I marched to the edge of the door. Looking out into the dark, I saw a movement at the edge of the lawn. A figure meandering around lazily facing away from me. He didn't look like a burglar. Especially not the kind that would go as far as to copy voices on our radios. I decided the safe thing to do would be call it in, and I dialed the police on my phone. I called the non-emergency line. Pine Falls Police Department, how can I help you? The voice answered. Hi, I'm over at the mall and we've got a suspicious person on the premises. He hasn't really done anything yet, but just to be safe. I was cut off. Hello? The voice questioned. Yes, hi, I'm at the... Again, the voice interrupted me. Is anyone there? I hung up. Frustrated and growing fearful, I tried the emergency line. The second I heard the phone pick up, I spouted off. I'm at the mall and we've got a suspicious person. I... I became aware of the blaring silence on the other line and hung up again. When I looked up, I just about jumped out of my skin. My boss was against the glass. He had one hand awkwardly pressing against the window, and his face was nearly pressed into the glass. His face was emotionless and flat, but his eyes? God, his eyes. They were dark and crooked. 
As I stared in disbelief, I couldn't exactly figure out what was wrong with them. They looked like an ape's eyes, having a sort of animalistic primal stare. I can still see them in my mind as I type this up. Before I could move out of my paralysis, he spoke. Unlock the door. Please unlock the door. His voice was strange. As if he were trying to speak through a yawn, or if he couldn't control his jaw or lips, right? Let me in. I need to come inside. His hand gently slapped against the glass, leaving a wet, muddy print. I retreated to my office and locked myself inside. Trying the landline phone? It was also down. I was completely cut off with three hours until daylight. I don't know if it was me coming off the adrenaline or just the overall stress, but I fell asleep. What had brought me back was the smell of wet earth. After slowly waking up to the strange smell, I jumped, recalling the events. I checked the cameras to find the door wide open, the first rays of sunlight shining in. My shift was over and I decided to make a run for it seeing as both phones weren't working. I left a basic version of this note as well as the security footage timestamps so my boss can see for himself what happened. Walking out of my room, I saw the hallway. Muddy handprints and footprints all over the walls, floor, and even ceiling. The smell was so overpowering, like mud and rain. I basically sprinted to my car and sped home. So, that's my story. Update. After last night's post, I got up this morning to a voicemail from my boss claiming the security footage shows nothing but me opening the door after I fell asleep at my post. He's absolutely furious. I think I'm going to call and apologize for sleepwalking. Maybe I'll blame it on a new medication I'm on. I'll post more if anything else happens. Update. Well, I think I can keep my job, but I am on thin ice. I worked last night and my boss stayed for my entire shift making sure I did my job. I was scared all night. I kept thinking I saw something out of the corner of my eye, but nothing else. Update. I got up this morning and went to my car only to find the trunk was wide open and that black earth was everywhere. The thing was in my car. I drove home with it. Who knows where it could be. I searched my entire house like 10 times, but there's no sign of it. I'll let it again if I see it again. Update. I haven't slept for two days. It's raining hard tonight. I'm wide awake, shaking as that smell creeps into my house. I can hear shuffling out in the darkness. Stones moving around in the garden. It's talking, and I'm trying so hard not to make a sound. The thing I've noticed about how it talks is this. Humans have a natural ability to pace a sentence. We know when to stop to breathe or naturally pause. This creature can't copy that. It stops between words or talks during a breath. It's very unnatural. No one talks like this thing. I hear it at the door and I feel myself falling asleep. I'm gonna post this as it is and do another update tomorrow morning. I took in the morning. The fog so thoroughly obscured the landscape that I felt like I was in a new world. When you have lived somewhere for some time, you become accommodated to your environment. I had stopped seeing with the eyes of a newcomer. It was only on days of extreme weather that I could still feel the wonder. More than anything else, the trees took on an awesome dimension. Usually trees seem to reach into the open sky, but this morning, in the thick fog, the trees appeared to be hanging in the air and reaching down to me. I wasn't the only one impressed by the shift in the atmosphere, but Freddy didn't seem to like it so much. She needs at least two walks a day. Even when the weather is unpleasant or extreme, she becomes restless otherwise. The barking can actually be painful. She protested a lot when I put her harness on, but she is a very good dog. She trusts me. 
Together we exited my front garden and stepped into the fog. Opposite my house there is a large, open field. It extends out into endless miles of countryside. Most farmers allow you on their land, provided you stick to the designated footpaths. If there is no path, they usually let you walk around the edges. The first field has a public footpath right through the middle. Often we find there are livestock, cows, or sheep in this field, so we usually stick to the path. At the end of the track, there are three stiles. The one to the right takes us to our favorite field. There are gates on all sides and no animals. This means I can let Fred off her lead, and she can run around freely. She likes to have a good run in the morning. When we stepped out into the first field, we could see maybe 25 meters all around us. Anything beyond that receded into obscurity. This made me a little nervous because I couldn't tell if the cows were in the field or not. Freddy and I had a little incident a few weeks back with the cows. One of them seemed to think we were there to feed them. Mostly, I like cows. They are naturally inquisitive and have sweet eyes. This cow in particular was very intrigued by us and pursued us relentlessly. Something about this seemed to spook the other cows and more appeared. I felt uncomfortable, but I continued to walk with Fred happily bouncing away next to me. The next time I turned my head, to look I saw my two very genuine horror. All the cows in the field running downhill, charging at me and Fred. For those of you that don't live in the countryside, you should know. There are many deaths by trampling each year, often dog walkers. The thing you must do is let your dog run. They will be fine. They are much faster and nimbler than cows. It is you, the human, who is in danger. Fred and I were fortunate. We had been heading downhill, and cows struggle to maintain such high speeds on gradients like that one. Their knees are not built for it at all. With this knowledge, I knew I had time to run to the bottom of the field and make it back to the entrance. Bless Fred. I don't think she had a clue. She was just happy to run. Not being able to see the cows in today's fog put me slightly on edge, but we made it to the stiles without an incident. At this end of the field, we could scarcely see 10 meters ahead. I wondered why Fred was so bothered by the fog. Dogs seem to use their noses and ears more than their eyes anyway. Crossing over into our favorite field, I let her off the lead. She seemed hesitant to leave my side. I sat down next to her. The grass was wet. I wanted to let her know it was alright. We sat there together for a while. When she was young, I taught her to give paw. To this day, when she needs my attention or is trying to make some kind of communication with me, she offers me her paw. She gave me her paw to hold in that field and lent her head in the resting spot between my elbow and forearm. I knew she was feeling uneasy, but I needed her to get a good run in before we went back home. It wouldn't do to have her barking all day as she can. Sometimes she doesn't know what's best for her. I picked up a stick and coaxed her into playing a game of fetch with me. Gradually I threw the stick further and further. Fred seemed less tense, once I got her adrenaline going. She brought me back the stick, and this time I really threw that thing. She shot off, bouncing from left to right in that funny way she does, bouncing until she too was engulfed by the fog. I couldn't see her, but I could hear her running around and panting a lot. I thought maybe she couldn't find the stick. She did seem to be getting agitated by something. I could hear her running in strange directions all around me. I called out to her. She was nowhere near where I had thrown the stick. I called out to her again. Her bark was very distant. She had gone too far, and soon would be lost in the fog. I had been stupid. I got her all worked up. She had run off, and now we were apart from each other. She couldn't see me. She probably couldn't hear me either. The fog was dampening the sounds. Why did I encourage her to go run around like that? That was really, really stupid. And now I would have to wander around this murky landscape looking for her. 
It could take quite some time. I heard her again. She didn't bark this time. It wasn't a sound she made often at all. It was a clipped yelp, a pained cry. Had something bad happened? It was far away, somewhere in the first field maybe. I called out to Fred, told her I was coming and I ran. The fog was almost the only thing I could see, but I knew these fields very well. I thought she must have hurt herself somehow, and that I needed to find her. My hands found the top of the stile, and I quickly clambered over. I almost slipped over a little, but caught myself in time. Panic was not going to help. I tried to steady my mind as well. She had left the other field. She had somehow come into this one. I had heard her over there. What now? I called again. No response. Freddy was fine. She was fine. I kept walking in the direction that I thought she was. It was swampy off the path. There had been large rainfall recently. The cows had churned the field into mud. My feet were being sucked down, and it was getting harder to pull them out without the mud, taking my shoes also. I was looking around, trying to spot some dry ground when I saw the first one, a rotting cow. Flesh and bones somehow inverted. The rib cage sat on top of the sinew, protecting it like an exoskeleton. The unprotected stomach, however, was being picked apart by crows. It was spilling out and mixing with the swampy water in the mud. In between the birds, I glimpsed the inside of the cow, filled with writhing and convolving larva. I did not stop to have a good think about what was going on. I did not go up for a closer inspection. No. I ran. I bolted. I left with such force I pulled my left foot right out of its shoe, leaving it behind, stuck in the mud. As I ran through the field, I saw briefly three more cows in a similar state. I took generous detours around them, and they disappeared into the gray void. I was lost. I had run in many strange directions since I saw the first cow. Fortunately, I had found solid ground to stand on. A moment to get my bearings. I turned to my right. There was nothing I could see that indicated where I was. I turned to my left and let out my own cry. There, looming toward me was a bull. His eyes were open and misty. Patches of his side had worn away, revealing the tender muscle structure of his head. Some of the sinew and muscle seemed to have fallen off. In these cavities, the white bone of his skull. His body had also undergone the disgusting inversion I had seen on the other dead cows. His guts and organs were swinging under his belly, and with every step he took, another little piece of viscera fell off into the mud. He was very alive. He lowered his head, maintaining eye contact as if he was going to charge. In that split second, I ran through my options in my mind. If this were an ordinary bull showing aggression, I would not have the advantage. The ground here was flat, Whatever running speed I could reach, an ordinary bull would likely double, and in half the time. I suspected, however, that this twisted bull was a little incapacitated. I could try to run, but I didn't know where the nearest stile was, and the ground was marshy in places. Another advantage to the bull. I decided my best option was to make myself very large to shout and scream in a way that might intimidate the creature. I put my arms up outstretched and made harsh loud noises I hadn't known I was capable of making. The bull was unperturbed. It kicked a leg back in preparation for its charge. Perhaps I should have run in the first place, but I ran now, as fast as I could trying to sidestep the monstrosity. I figured if I had to turn again to start its charge in another direction, then that would buy me some seconds. Another mistake. The bull simply turned, jerking its head and body at me. A glancing blow. But it knocked me to the ground. I tried to drag myself away and made it onto the soft, marshy ground. 
but it brought one of its front legs down on my right elbow, splattering me with muddy water and dirt, shooting sharp pain up and down my arm. I screamed. I could hardly see. The pain was blinding and there was mud in my eyes, but I could make out well enough what was about to happen. The bull was rearing, ready to strike a final blow. I closed my eyes. What happened next I can only make sense of now. At the time I heard a terrible snarling, the sound of tearing flesh, and then I felt the full weight of the bull on my body and lost consciousness. I knew that some time had passed. For a while, I wasn't sure if I was alive at all. Then I heard a steady breathing. I thought perhaps I was on the verge of death. Only I seemed to be getting more lucid. My thoughts less abstract. After a while, I even managed to separate what was me from what was external. The breathing was not my own. It was warm. It was over my head. It was... Fred? I opened my eyes. She was over me, keeping watch. One paw on my head. I managed to say her name hoarsely and she looked down. She licked me. Her tongue was soft. She had blood on her face. I wanted to get up, to check if she was okay, but there was a weight on my body stopping me from moving. I bent my neck. There was the upper half of the bull lying across my torso and legs. It was very dead. Its throat had been ripped out, creating a cavernous space in its neck. The bull's eyes were open, unmoving. I wanted to be sick. Fred seemed pretty relaxed given the circumstances. She had a considerable amount of blood on her. Me too. I asked her if she was okay and she just pawed at me again. She was a good girl. I tried to slide out from under the bull. I couldn't put pressure on my right arm, so I pulled myself out with my left. I was in a bad way. Messed up arm, missing shoe, covered in blood. The fog was receding, but I couldn't see the path. It hardly mattered anyway. Fred walked just in front of me. She knew the way home. The mist is still thick this evening. We have locked all the doors and windows. Fred has been given a double portion of her dinner, but unfortunately for her, I don't think we will go out for a walk tomorrow. For purposes of covering my identity, you can refer to me as Tom. I'm the son of one of the hundreds of scientists scouring the universe for signs of life though he did it through a lesser-known medium, a blacklisted group which has had its reputation tarnished at the hands of the international community. They are on watch lists in over 50 countries, and their activities are monitored 24-7. I already know what you're thinking. That means they're collective families as well. You are correct, but I can't take it anymore. The truth must be known. Anyone who knows anything about space knows that among the countless stars, there exist violent regions. Black holes. We are all taught that these points are masses which enact a gravity so strong not even light can escape. This is true and has been allowed to be shared with the public for decades, but there is a truth to it which has been hidden away. I only just learned of this over a month ago, and all eyes are on me now. They already have my family in custody and are trying to track me down to my undisclosed location. I doubt I will have a week once this goes public. The truth is, black holes aren't just infinitely small points with infinite gravity. They are gateways to an alternate side of reality. You could call it the ethereal verse. Once on that side, there is no going back. Yet. More on that in a minute. The ethereal verse transforms matter, regardless of if organic or not, into a special energy which we can neither see nor detect. This is what scientists have called dark energy. It's not literally dark, but rather just invisible to those of us not within their circle. 
The governments of the world have been in collusion with each other to develop a way to pass through these gateways freely. Technology has become much more advanced than people may think. They have hidden facilities all over the globe in places you wouldn't think to look. Cloaking technology is real, and is just like you'd see in the movies. Ever wonder why people blather on about objects seen moving faster than possible in conventional or militarized aircraft? There you go. It goes deeper than that, though. But I can't sidetrack anymore. There's no time. Back to the ethereal verse. So, anything that goes through becomes dark energy, which means it cannot be seen or detected or touched by us. Why does that matter? Well, true, we cannot do any of those things. That energy does have an invisible effect on us, our minds. They can be tampered with and manipulated in ways traditional science has not managed. Memories, emotions, thoughts. It's mind control beyond limitation. They've managed to tap into that and are running experiments even as we speak. But this is not the full extent of the revelation. I mentioned at the beginning that my father was one of the hundreds of scientists looking for life in the stars. We have. The ethereal verse is where they lie. We don't know what they look like, but they know what we look like. They found us 77 years ago, and if you do the math, you'll know exactly why. The Manhattan Project was the point of no return. We attacked them, and they've sown their influence into those in power. It won't be long before our reckoning comes. My father discovered this, and a little over a month ago, he met his end with a bullet. I don't know why I myself have not been taken over, but I can feel the influence. It takes time to corrode a mind into total submission to their call, but once it's done, that's game over. Forget the person you once knew. They are monstrous puppets manipulated by invisible strings which can't be cut. They toy with us and seek our destruction. They can't directly kill us, so they have us do it ourselves. Proliferation of nuclear warheads, pollution, war. Even certain counties are the public face of their control. Why am I telling you all of this? Because there is a way out of this, and one to stop it? No. I'm afraid there's not. Once they got control of the leaders, there was no chance anymore. Their facilities are so defended and secure that it would make Fort Knox look like a padlock. There is nothing to be done. Try to ignore your intrusive thoughts and live what life you can while you're able to. Pray you're not around when they've figured out how to make the gateways accessible from both sides and these beings manage to take physical form. The blacklisted group made analysis that they are moon-sized and likely have a cellular makeup that absorbs nuclear and reactive energy. They will swallow the sun and stars until there is nothing left. When I last saw my father, he had told me it wouldn't be long before they took over his mind. He told me what they spoke to him in his thoughts. We see you always. The look on his face told me all I need to know. Even death will not remove their gaze from you. And before he left, he closed the door with parting words. Eye contact is the end. Dreams. Dreams can sometimes be pleasant. Sometimes they are just completely random things your mind can conjure up while you sleep. Most of us forget dreams once we wake up. A majority of them. Some do stick though. I think everyone has at least one dream that stuck. From what I hear it's mostly nightmares that stick. A scary experience is what we remember. It can be completely random. Or it can be due to some horror movie you watched. I didn't have so much a dream or a nightmare, as I did have a... vision of sorts. Let me go back a bit. This happened about a week ago. I just came back from a visit to my mom's place, needed to help her with some groceries. She has back problems. Anyways, I get back home and I am exhausted. 
more than I'd anticipated. I'm not a pro athlete or something, but I do have some good stamina. I also had a considerable amount of caffeine in my blood, which, in normal circumstances, would keep me awake. These were, I'm pretty sure, not normal circumstances. It was Friday, so I figured a quick nap wouldn't hurt. It was still early, around 10 in the morning. I do have to mention that I was on vacation, so I didn't have to go to work. Well, my vacation was mostly lounging at home and just resting, occasionally visiting my mom or going out for a drink with my friends. But I digress. I set up my alarm clock to wake up at around 12 or 12.30. Can't remember exactly. After that, I just collapsed on my bed, feeling more exhausted than ever for no discernible reason. The moment I closed my eyes, all of that tiredness just disappeared. I opened my eyes once again. I felt normal, as if nothing happened. I checked my phone and it was still 10 a.m. 10, 13, if I remember correctly. Strange. I mutter to myself and get back up. I felt rested from just closing my eyes for a few moments. Wish that were the case always. I went into my living room and grabbed the remote to turn on the TV. It didn't. I just replaced the batteries. I muttered to myself as I threw the remote back onto the couch and went to the fridge to grab something to snack on. I opened the fridge to find it... empty. Not just empty. Do you know that sound a fridge makes when it's working? Yeah, none of that. It was as if it were unplugged or something. And not only that, the fridge was slightly more to the right than I remember it being. Confused, I leaned forward on the adjacent counter to look if it was plugged, and after squinting my eyes for a few moments, I saw that it wasn't. After that, I decided to test something out. I tried flicking the light switch on and off, and my hunch was correct. There was an outage. That still didn't explain why my fridge was empty. I am absolutely certain that it was filled with food and drinks a few hours ago. I checked inside once again. I even reached my hand to the back. The temperature inside was the same as the room temperature. Surely it would have been colder in the fridge for some time, despite it not working for some time. Lost for any options, I grabbed my phone. It was 10.20. I tried going into Google to see if there were any local power outages or some construction in the local area which might have caused the outage. No reception, no internet connection. I checked if I was connected to my router, which of course wouldn't work without electricity. I wasn't. I was on mobile data. I'm pretty sure the numbers on the router were a bit different. I thought to myself for a second after registering that the numbers on the back of the router were slightly off as well, but I had more pressing matters to worry about. I tried calling my mom to see if she knows what's going on. No reception. I was just rerouted to an automated voice message. I was starting to be a little freaked out at this point. My throat was dry. I wasn't thirsty, but my throat was simply dry. I didn't have any soda to drink, so I opted on drinking regular old tap water, and to my surprise, there was no running water. Then I started noticing other things, such as the fact that there were no car sounds on the outside, and I can guarantee to myself my neighbor was mowing his lawn the moment I laid down, and then abruptly stopped. What's going on? I posed the rhetorical question to myself, knowing I won't have any answers anytime soon, so I decided to go outside to see what was up. Maybe the neighbors had some idea of what was going on. I thought. Going outside, I saw that the neighborhood was... different. There were no cars driving around, there were no pedestrians. The cars that were parked, including my own, looked as if they weren't turned on in ages. The grass outside was overgrown, and the entire place looked as if no one maintained it in months. 
The sky as well was gray and cloudy. It was a sunny, clear sky this morning. The weather broadcast didn't say it would be cloudy. I ran to one of my neighbor's houses and knocked on the door with no response. I banged on the door, shouting for someone, anyone to open the door or just give some sort of response. None came, and my voice just echoed in what seemed like an empty world. I just sulked down the door and sat down, trying to rationalize what was happening. I slapped myself multiple times, but nothing happened. I didn't wake up. Then I saw someone. I saw someone walking, limping down the road. It was a woman, it seemed. She looked to be dressed in business attire. I quickly got up and shouted, Hey, excuse me, ma'am? There was no response. I thought she didn't hear me, so I shouted once more this time louder. Hello? Excuse me? Nothing. She didn't so much as flinch at my voice or turn her head. I decided to walk up to her. As I got closer, I started noticing some more details. Worrying details. I noticed her suit was torn at some parts. She looked pale as a ghost as well. I stopped, I would say, 10 meters from her, now a bit cautious. I don't know what the hell... I stopped mid-sentence. She lifted her head up toward me, still limping, inching toward me. Her eyes, her sunken eyes had no pupils. Well, she did, but it looked like she had severe cataracts. Her eyes were completely clouded. She groaned as she approached me. I noticed a wound on her neck. The wound was old, yet it didn't heal. There was a maggot sticking out of it. I stepped back, and like in a cliche horror flick, tripped and fell on my ass. I was backing away, but she was faster. She got closer and closer until... She stepped on my foot. Well, she didn't so much as step on it, as much as she stepped through it. I froze when I saw that. She, on the other hand, continued walking and groaning as if nothing happened. She acted as if I wasn't there. She continued walking. With each step, she phased through me as if through thin air. I quickly got up and got out of her way, watching her in bewilderment. Uh, am I dead? I tried to say to myself in a whisper, thinking that some sort of zombie apocalypse happened and I was killed in my sleep. I was confused as you were the first time, friend. I jumped in fear, turning around on a dime when I heard someone's voice behind me. What? I exclaimed. Once I turned around, I saw a man. He was, I would guess, in his mid-fifties. He had a long and unkempt graying beard, and I would guess messy gray hair. He had a cap on his head. He had a long, dark green jacket going down halfway to his knees and dark blue jeans. Slightly torn at some parts, all dirty and bloodied. Who are you? What happened? I asked. I'll answer your questions one at a time. Let me just assure you one thing. You are not dead. He said with a slight smile on his face. It didn't seem to have malice in it. If anything, it was an amused smile. Okay. I really didn't have anything else to add. I was a bit speechless. There was a period of silence between me and him. The sound of wind and occasional bird chirp could be heard. Not much of a talker, I see, the man said. All right, follow me. He added as he started walking in a seemingly random direction. What? Wait a minute. Where to? And who are you? I asked. He turned around and gave me a smile once more. Come on, we ain't got all day, and it's not like those guys can eat you. He pointed to the limping woman. Zombie, I guess, still walking down the street. 
I nodded, and I started following behind him. We were walking through my neighborhood, which was now dead, overgrown, and abandoned. I saw some houses were boarded up, some were burned down, and some looked like they'd been robbed and looted a dozen times. After some time, the man began to speak. This was about a month after all went downhill. Most people were turned. No saving them, unfortunately. Electricity and water were shut off, as I believe you saw yourself. What you're meaning to say is... That a zombie apocalypse started? When? How? I asked. When I had forgotten, how I don't know, it just happened one day without warning. He continued his brisk walk as he paused and continued. I remember the day when I heard the news. I had woken up from a nap and suddenly people were dropping dead like flies. Then they got back up. The military was overwhelmed and governments collapsed. All went to hell. He stopped abruptly. My eyes were irritated for some reason and I rubbed them. When I opened them back up again, we were somewhere else. What? Where are we? I asked. The convenience store, remember? The man said as I looked around and sure as hell, this was the store I went to regularly. Though it saw better days, I must admit. The shelves were empty, there was all sorts of junk on the floor, and a couple of corpses. What caught my attention was an old sign for Coca-Cola. It was written with a K instead of a C. What? I said to myself, but before I could inquire further, I heard movement behind us. A small group of four people entered the store in a hurry. Barricade it, now! A familiar voice shouted to the others, as everyone was barricading the entrance of the door with whatever they could. A horde of zombies was fast approaching the store. Then I realized the guy who shouted, though now with stubble and longer hair, was me. They, and I, didn't seem to notice us. We were invisible to them. The man who accompanied me started speaking once more. Some of us survived, barely. Their numbers were swelling by the day. No matter how many we downed, another ten took its place. Supplies were running short. We didn't know what to do, but we pushed on despite all the odds. For the simple experience of seeing the sunrise once more, we pushed on for each other. I saw myself, my other self, and the three others which I didn't recognize barricade the entrance and run toward the back of the store. One of the others was limping. It looked like he was wounded. The wounded guy called for the others. Hey guys! My other self and the two others turned around. Come on, get going! One woman in the group said, I'm bit. I'm bit. That thing under the car got me a few minutes ago. Everyone looked at each other, not sure as to what to do. I'm staying. The guy who was bitten said, Don't waste bullets on me. You'll attract even more of them here. He added. I looked at my other self, reaching for his side. Presumably a pistol. Everyone simply nodded and ran off. Well, the guy who was bitten turned around and raised his crowbar as the horde was tearing down the makeshift barricade, if you could even call it that. This happens. People died. The bearded man said. Then my eyes irritated once again. Once I rubbed them, we were somewhere else. This time we were in a town. A small town. The sky was clear and the town itself was overgrown and abandoned. There were a few stragglers on the streets. They were severely decomposed and barely walking. The bearded man started speaking once again. Riverside's the name, a town which was once home to around 5,000 residents. Tight-knit families, a single police station, two schools, fire department, and a shooting range. 
Lots of farmland on the outskirts, and a small forest not too far from here as a nature reserve of sorts. Despite the name being Riverside, the river is about five miles east of the town itself. As soon as he finished his sentence, I could hear car engines in the distance. I turned around to see a column of cars. As they neared, I could see that they were old and beaten down, but drivable. As I could see, of course, there were six or seven of them, and as they drew closer to me, they weren't slowing down. I exclaimed as I tried to move my legs, but they weren't budging. As if I was frozen in one place, I put my hands up and closed my eyes, bracing for impact. Which... didn't come. The cars simply phased through me. Aha, I forgot. I said as the bearded man had a blank expression looking at me, then at the cars. Once the cars stopped, people started exiting. Some of the stragglers started walking towards the cars, but were quickly cut down by the people. Some had guns, but most of them used blunt weapons. Out of the driver's side of one gray sedan exited a familiar figure. Now with a full beard and rifle in hand was me. My other self, that is. How are we doing on gas? My other self asked. Soon another person which I didn't recognize. Well, I didn't recognize anyone, but I digress. Bad. Our car's running on fumes. I saw as my other self swore under his breath. Right. Guys, let's clear the area. Take anything that could be useful. Food, medicine, weapons, you know the gist. My other self said in a confident tone. I can't believe I would be a leader in this kind of situation. I always thought I would be dead within the first week. Huh. I said to myself, kind of surprised at my ability to adapt and survive, to even lead. The bearded man chimed in. Yes, I too was surprised, but you kind of get used to it. Believe me. I didn't pay much attention to him, as I did to the group of 20 or so people systemically going from building to building, looting it, and killing unsuspecting undead inside. Unbeknownst to them, for now at least, is that store down the street, see it? The bearded man pointed down the street to some small corner store. I nodded and he continued. That small store has a basement which is under lock and key. Good thing that guy over there. He pointed to a guy coming out of the building with a handful of some tools. That guy is a good lockpick. And behind that locked door, and down the stairs, is an untouched store of canned food. Enough to last half a year. Maybe more. That was enough time to establish some kind of permanent settlement. A farm not too far from here still had some seeds. We used that to kickstart some kind of agriculture, and life seemed to be better and better from there on out. As soon as he finished his sentence, time began to speed up. Like a time lapse, I saw people become lines in the air, moving too fast to perceive. I saw as day and night lasted for mere seconds each. I saw some days were sunny, some cloudy, sometimes it rained. Sometimes it snowed. I saw as the buildings were slowly repaired. I saw makeshift walls erected around the small town. And I saw more and more people come. I saw as the seasons came and went. I saw the harvest and I saw how the fields were plowed each year. I saw life return to normal. Time slowed down to normal speed this time, and I saw that the once abandoned and overgrown town grew to a lively settlement with people going about their lives with little worry. Though in the distance I saw a small group of people gathered around something. Rather, it was someone. There were two people arguing about something, and the argument was quite heated. I couldn't tell what they were arguing about, but I could see from that distance that the people in question were an older fellow and some younger guy. The older guy seemed familiar. Long, dark, green jacket, a cap on his head, slightly torn jeans. 
just when it clicked. Bang. The younger guy pulled out a pistol and shot the bearded man point blank in the chest. I looked to my right to see what I would now call a ghost. The bloody patch on his jacket was on the same spot where he'd been shot. I looked back at the growing commotion that was happening. The people nearest to us were now alerted because of the gunshot. They rushed to see what happened, though despite the shouts and overall chaos that was now happening, I could hear a woman's voice scream someone's name, shriek in pain, but not the kind of pain where she is physically hurt. No, it sounded like that time my mother screamed when she heard dad was dead. She screamed his name, but this time, the name which the woman was screaming was... It was my name. The bearded man, the ghost, whilst gazing into the forming crowd, though it looked like he was gazing through them, spoke. All living things live, and they die. No matter if there is no more room in hell, room shall be made. Every life is a story, be it an apocalypse and cataclysm, or in times of abundance and prosperity. It is always a story of life and death. One day you will awake and you will find yourself in another world. A world that is completely different from where you once were. And you will relive the story. Your world will not be gone. You will simply be yanked from your comfort and thrown into chaos like you were today. But then you will not be as untouchable. He said, turning his head to look at me. This is the story of how I died. He paused. I felt something tug on my arms forcefully, launching me backwards. This is the story of how you died. I opened my eyes. My alarm was blaring and my heart was just about ready to catapult itself out of my chest. I looked at my phone and saw that it was 12.30. I quickly got up and turned on my TV. It worked and my fridge was as how I remember it. Full. It took me a good hour to completely recover from that... Dream? No, it felt all too real. But it wasn't reality. Something was off. Yes, there was some sort of apocalypse. Zombies roamed the earth for God's sake. But something was off. The K on the Coca-Cola sign and the signs on the roads were not in the same place. Though withered and beaten, I could see the difference. And my house. The fridge. The numbers on the router. It was as if I was in another alternate universe. And most importantly, the older and dead version of myself, what he told me was that I will be awoken in that place. That I will be thrown into chaos. I couldn't ask him when, why, or how. Just when I felt that I calmed down, I noticed something. I looked down at my arms to see red handprints right at the place where I was grabbed by... something. I feel as if I am going insane. Almost a week has passed. Everything seems normal. The internet is working fine. The news is nothing out of the ordinary, and I can't help myself but be constantly anxious. I can't sleep. I'm afraid if I fall asleep and wake in that place again, and that I will feel that bullet one day hit my own chest, in that dirty, dark, green jacket. Miss Lucy's opened last month across the street from my apartment. It's the only restaurant in town that serves fried zucchini, so I was in love from the start. Plus, the place looks amazing. The spherical glass building is designed so customers can look out, but no one can see inside. And it lights up and changes colors at night like an oversized disco ball. My balcony overlooks the entire restaurant and I can even see the underground parking garage entrance in the back. But I've noticed something strange about Miss Lucy's. Not everyone who goes in, comes out. 
One night, my buddies Cole, Steven, and I watched from the balcony as customers arrived. Hey, Will, do you think there's another exit? Cole asked. Doubt it. You can see everything from here. As far as I knew, there was one way in and one way out. Once, I counted the incoming and outgoing traffic, and sure enough, 26 cars arrived between dinner and closing time, but only 7 left. There has to be a rational explanation. But what? Regardless, I was craving fried zucchini, so Stephen and I stopped by one weeknight. After a quick trek across the intersection, we arrived. Inside, dance music played. Neon lamps and wall-to-wall -wall aquariums lit up the room, and massive chandeliers hung above velvet, lounge chairs, and antique mirrors. Cool place, Stephen said, but the hostess scowled when we approached. She had hawk-like eyes and a fierce perm. Her name tag read Helga O. Are you on the list? She asked. What list? The... List? I don't know. You have to be on the list to enter. We need reservations on a Tuesday? I glanced around seeing no one but giant room dividers sectioned off the dining area, so I couldn't see how many people were there. No, you need to be on the list. I turned back to the surly hostess. Okay, can you put us on? The list? No, that is not how we operate. You have to call at least two days before to put your name on the list. I can't just tell you my name and have you add it to the list now? No. Steven nudged me and whispered, Come on, man, let's go. But this lady wasn't going to ruin my plans. Okay, we'll be in touch. Forget this place. Stephen said as we left. But I wasn't giving up, so I called the restaurant, and Helga answered right away. I'd like to put my name on your list. This time, Helga sounded professional and polite. Certainly, sir. For how many guests? Stephen, me, Kiera, Layla, and Cole. Five. For which night? Friday. Your guests' first names, please? I gave her all five names. Very good. You're on the list. Give your server the password 4355 when you arrive. Friday night, Stephen, Kiera, Cole, Layla, and I walked to Miss Lucy's from my place. Unfortunately, Helga O greeted us. But this time, Helga was all smiles. Yes, I see you're on the list. Your password, please? It's 4355. Perfect. Right this way. Then, when Helga pulled back the giant room divider and let us into the bar area, it felt like entering another world. Bright purple lights lit up the space, which looked three times larger than I'd imagined. There were wall-to-wall -wall aquariums with tropical fish, massive flat-screen TVs, velvet lounge chairs, and a revolving bar. It looked like something in Vegas. I couldn't believe I lived across the street from this place. Dang. Cole said as we followed Helga up a spiral glass staircase into another room. The upstairs floor resembled a library, with large bookshelves and sofas. We were so enamored with the surroundings. We hardly noticed we were the only people there. We followed Helga all the way to the back until we reached a bookshelf against a brick wall. Then, Helga opened a book on the middle shelf and pressed a large button inside. As if on cue, the bookshelf crept open, revealing a spacious private dining room and bar. Unbelievable, Kiera said. Inside was a lit, translucent glass floor with a koi pond, and there were more chandeliers, mirrored tables, and velvet chairs, along with a private bar. We even had a private server. This is for all of us? 
I asked, my jaw dropping. The place looked like a cross between a 1920s speakeasy and an ultra-modern lounge. And with the ambient lighting, the space had an otherworldly feel. How much is this going to cost? Cole whispered. I shrugged. The online menu didn't look too expensive. Then again, I'd only check the fried zucchini price. Check out these seats, Layla said, running her hands along the black velvet chairs. Unbelievable. Kiera said, and check this out. The velvet seats and tables sat on a revolving platform that switched on and off. I've never seen anything like this. Steven said, playing with the switches. Helga switched off the revolving platform, motioned for us to sit, and handed us the menus. Your server will be with you soon. Then she handed me a mini pad. You can use this to customize your experience. She said, pointing to a text box. Type in your request in this box, and your server will send you a confirmation and an estimated delivery time. You can also change the music. She showed me a music library with tons of playlists, and we could even change the light colors. No way. Kiera said, pressing the buttons as the chandelier lights changed from white to green to red. Even the floor bulbs changed colors. Cole glanced around, taking it all in. Will, are you sure this place isn't expensive? I don't think so. Helga left, and the bookshelf door closed behind her, leaving us to enjoy our secret space. We opened the menus, but no prices were listed. That's strange. I grabbed the iPad and typed a note to the server. Where are the prices listed? After a moment, the server responded, They aren't. My buddies and I exchanged nervous glances. What does he mean, the prices aren't listed? Cole said. I typed, how much are the drinks? He wrote, one minute. But he never replied. What the hell? Cole asked. My heart raced. What did I get us into? What if this place is over the top expensive? My friends will kill me. I watched the iPad, waiting for the server to reply, but he never did. Minutes later, a man wearing a tuxedo arrived with a tray of cocktails and appetizers we didn't order. Chocolate martinis, Red Bulls, veggies, and hummus. And fried zucchini. Fried zucchini? I filled my plate. Cole nudged me. We need to see the prices first. I looked up at the server. Hey, could we please see the prices before we order more? But he didn't say a word. Sir? Cole started. But the server ignored him. Instead, he pulled out a list, but I couldn't see what was on it. Then the server walked over to the wall and flipped a switch. At that moment... The music stopped and the room went black. Even the iPad screen went dark. Someone gasped. What the hell? Steven said, nudging me. Hello? I said. Silence. Moments later, the lights switched back on and the music returned. But the server and Cole were gone. What the hell? I whipped my head around looking for Cole, but he was nowhere. Cole? I said, still searching. I looked behind chairs, the bar, everywhere, but no Cole. My heart raced and my stomach sank. Layla squealed. Where's Cole, you guys? He was just right here. Cole? I called again as my stomach fluttered. We ran through the room, searching again, but he was nowhere to be found. I grabbed the iPad, my hands trembling as I typed. Help, our friend is gone. Two seconds, ten seconds, one minute, five minutes. No response. 
Layla rushed to the bookshelf looking for a button to open the door. How do we get out of here? I don't know, I said grabbing the iPad. Maybe we can find a button on here. But there was no button for the door. Just switches for music, lights, and food, but nothing else. Someone called the restaurant and asked the hostess, Kiera Sun. I pulled out my cell phone and called the restaurant. After what seemed like a hundred rings, Helga the hostess answered. Our friend is missing, and we need to open the door to look for him. I tried to keep my voice steady, but Helga was no help. You'll have to wait until your server returns. But he isn't answering. Then you have to wait until he returns. She sounded like a robot, as though she'd been pre-programmed to give the same useless responses no matter what customers asked. But the server didn't answer my last questions. He's going by the list. Helga snapped and then hung up. Huh? What does that even mean? You guys? I said, I don't know what's going on, but... At that moment, the secret door opened, and our server reappeared with another tray, even though we hadn't ordered anything else. Sir, where is our friend? Kiera asked, her eyes frightened. But the server refused to answer. He wouldn't even look at her, at any of us. Instead, he placed the items on the table, then he pulled out his list again, scanned it, walked back to the wall, and flipped the switch again. And once more, the music stopped and the room went black. And when the lights and music came back on, the server and Kiera were gone. We hadn't heard a peep. What the hell? I shouted. My heart thumped as we searched the room again, panicking. Steven's eyes bulged and Layla froze, looking too terrified to speak. Kiera? We called, but silence. Moments later, the server returned with another tray of items we hadn't ordered. Once again, he set the items on the table, scanned the list, walked to the wall, and flipped a switch. Again, the music stopped and the room went dark. A small gasp was the only sound. And when the lights and music returned, the server and Layla were gone. Holy crap, Steven said. Let's get the... We've got to get out of here, I said. I'm calling the police. My fingers shook as I called 911, but the call dropped before it rang. I lost the signal, I shouted. You try. Stephen tried, but the call dropped for him, too. Why won't it go through? He shouted. I don't know. I said, dialing the front desk again. Apparently that was the only number that worked. After a few rings, Helga answered, sounding unmoved as I explained the situation. Three of our friends have vanished. We need help now. Let us out of this room. But the hostess remained calm. You'll have to wait until your server returns. But he won't talk to us. I shouted, my anxiety surging. I checked the wall for the button he was pressing, but it only controlled the lights. Then Steven's face turned paper white. Dude, I think they're going in alphabetical order. First Cole, then Kiera, then Layla. We've got to get out of here. But when the server returned this time, there was no tray. He simply placed a bill in front of me. Where are our friends? I shouted. He shrugged. He'll be back. He said. His voice was flat, emotionless, and robotic. Please pay your bill, sir. The server just stood there. Not a hint of anxiety or discomfort. But where are our friends? Sir, please pay your bill. My eyes popped when I saw the bill. It's over $200, even though half the guests vanished. What the? But Steven stopped me. 
Dude, screw the money. Just pay the man. Let's get out of here. I didn't argue. I handed the server my credit card. He ran it and handed it back without another word. Then he opened the door and we ran out. Our friends were nowhere to be found, and no other customers were dining when we left. Stephen and I dialed the police right away, but the cops were no help. We can't do anything unless they've been missing 24 hours. Your friends are probably playing a prank. He obviously didn't know our friends. The next morning, a knock sounded at the door. I shuffled to the door and peeked out. Layla! I flung the door open. I threw my arms around her. What the hell happened to you? She wore the same clothes from the night before. Her face was ghost white and terror stricken, and her voice sounded flat like she was in shock. Where is Kiera? Cole? She stared at the wall, hardly blinking. I held her close, happy she was safe, but worried about my other friends. Those people? She said, pointing toward the restaurant. I don't know who or what they are, but... Her voice trailed off and I hugged her. An hour later, Stephen came over and pressed for details. Layla, I know you've been through a lot. I can't imagine, but we really need to know what happened. And we need to know if Cole and Kiera are okay. After a moment, she spoke. When the lights went out, someone pressed a cloth over my mouth, and everything went black. And next thing I knew, I woke up in a dark room. Couldn't see anything. Where did he take you? I asked. She shrugged. I have no idea where we were. What happened to Cole and Kiera? Stephen asked. Layla shrugged. At one point, another man came in. I don't know who, and he pushed Kiera through a doorway. It looked like a long hallway with this creepy blue light blazing inside. I don't know. I only got a quick glimpse before he shut the door. Layla's eyes welled with tears as she continued, and I handed her a Kleenex. A few minutes later... The guy opened the door again and pulled Kiera back into the dark room where I was, but the person who came back, she... it wasn't Kiera. Layla sobbed. Stephen patted her shoulder, and his voice softened. What do you mean it wasn't Kiera? Layla's whole body shook with sobs. She could barely speak, but after a moment, she calmed and continued. I don't know. It wasn't her, her voice, her energy. It just wasn't her. I don't know who or what took her place, but she isn't Kiara anymore. That's all I know. I hugged Layla, imagining myself running across the street to bash the server's head in, but getting pissed would only lead to more problems. Instead, I had to stay calm and think clearly. How did you get away? Stephen asked. It was so weird. The server just said, The bill has been paid and let me go. I have no idea what that was supposed to mean. None of it made sense to us either. But after 24 hours, I called the police to report Cole and Kiera missing. Perhaps the strangest part about this experience is what happened several days later when police called with an update. Your friends didn't go missing, the officer said. They said they told you they were leaving early, and your friend Kiera is working at Miss Lucy's now. Wait, what? No way. That's impossible. That didn't sound like her, and it wasn't like either of them not to call or text for days. So after I hung up, I called Miss Lucy's. Sure enough, Kiera answered, but her voice sounded flat and robotic. I barely recognized it. Miss Lucy's, Kiera speaking. Kiera, it's Will. What happened to you? And why are you working there? But it was like she didn't know me. All she said was, I'm sorry, sir. 
Are you on the list? I hung up. I never did find out everything that happened to Cole, Layla, and Kiera that night, but I was grateful Layla had been spared. After that night, Cole and Kiera changed. I felt like I hardly knew them anymore, and they spent all their time with their creepy new friends from the restaurant. Since then I've talked to other people who have been to Miss Lucy's and they all have similar stories. And some people's friends vanished, but never returned. Unfortunately, the police didn't believe their stories. However, everyone says their friends are different now. Maybe what really happens at Miss Lucy's will always remain a mystery, but one thing we do know is we're never going back. I've never been good at making friends, or any type of bond with people in general. I'm not even close to most of my family members, like I'm close to Jessie. Jessie is my best friend. I've known her only for a year and a half, but she's literally my world. She's the only person I can speak to. The only person who understands me. I've never slept over at anyone's house that isn't mine. And even when I'm supposed to be staying at a family member's house, I get anxious and they have to call my parents to collect me. This results in my parents having to cancel everything they planned. My parents resent me. I'm a huge burden to them because of how anxious I am. Jessie asked if I wanted to have a sleepover at her house. I'd never been to her house, or anyone for that matter, and I'll admit I was ecstatic, but also hesitant. In case I got anxious and ruined the sleepover and my friendship, I knew I was probably overthinking, but it still scared me. Jesse gave me some time to think, and I agreed. I told my parents, and they were pretty shocked, but decided to let me go because I had an actual shot at making a best friend for life. The car pulled up onto a large driveway, connected to an even larger house. It was huge, like mansion-sized. Probably the biggest house I'd ever laid eyes on. Me and my parents made our way over to the front door, which was about twice my dad's size, and he was six foot seven. There was no doorbell. Instead, there was an abnormally large silver knocker in the middle of the door. I knocked. Jessie answered the door. When she saw me, her face seemed to light up and her smile grew larger. She instantly leaned in for a hug. Jessie's mother and father also approached the door and stood behind Jessie also with a comforting smile on their face. Jesse's father was also tall like my dad. He was your typical dad-looking person. It was the same with her mother, too. It was almost surreal. Jesse toured me around her huge house, which took about an hour in itself. Then we ventured off into Jesse's bedroom, which was huge and pink. Very pink. Like, every object was pink. After staying in Jessie's room playing games and eating candy for a while, her mother walked into the room and placed a sheet of A4 paper on Jessie's bed. The way she walked was so elegant and graceful, like a ballerina. I took off my headphones and grabbed the sheet of paper. It read, Sleepover Rules. Follow these rules to ensure you have a safe and happy sleepover. 1. Don't eat too much candy. They can smell it from miles away. 2. Do not leave the bedroom after 1.45 a.m. Please remember this rule. Your life depends on it. 3. If you happen to wake up during the night for no apparent reason, hide under the bed within 25 seconds. That way they cannot see you. 4. Do not get snacks from the mini fridge during 8.56 p.m. and 9.47 p.m. You will not like what you find. 5. Make sure to turn off any light source apart from the TV. You must keep this on all through the night. I can't emphasize how important this is. 6. If you wake up randomly and see Jessie sitting upright, awake in her bed, run. Lock yourself in the ensuite, 
and do not come out for the rest of the night. If Jessie knocks and says she hurt herself and needs help, ignore her and do not reply. 7. If you wake up and hear the baby crying, ignore it completely. Don't even move. It isn't the baby. 8. Do not attempt to speak to Jessie during the night, and if she speaks to you, do not reply. This is crucial if you want to stay safe. 9. If you hear a dog whimpering and scratching on the bedroom door, drag Jesse under the bed and then hide behind the bookshelf. We do not own a dog. 10. If you hear a ringing in your ear, run. Leave the house. This is the only exception. If you don't, we all die. Have a safe sleepover, Tina. It had to be some kind of joke. These couldn't have been real, but I still have a gut feeling that I should follow these creepy rules. I folded the piece of paper and placed it on my right pocket, then sat down again to play with Jesse. After about an hour, Jesse's dad opened the door. It's bedtime, girls. You must go to sleep now. I suddenly got very anxious, because this is when I had to start following the creepy rules. I held back all of my emotion because I didn't want to lose a friend like Jesse. Me and Jesse both got into bed. We top and tailed so my head was at the bottom end of her bed. Night, Tina. Sweet dreams. She said in between yawns. I don't know how my dreams were going to be sweet after what I'd read. Surprisingly, I fell asleep pretty quick. My sleep was pretty deep and I didn't have any nightmares like most nights. And that's when I woke up. My stomach sank. I turned to see Jessie sitting upright in her bed, wide awake. I didn't want to believe that these rules were true, but my instinct was to just run. I bolted into the end suite and locked the door behind me. After a few solid minutes of hyperventilating in Jessie's ensuite, I decided to unlock the door. I thought it was all probably stupid anyway. Just before my hand reached the lock, someone knocked on the door. I froze. Tina, help me. I've hurt my head and my vision's going blurry. I desperately wanted to open the door, but something in my head advised me against it. Jessie kept screaming for help. I slumped into the corner, shaking with every breath I took. She was screaming for hours. It was unbearable. Her voice got less human-like and more distorted with every screech. By the time she stopped, I was already half asleep. To put it into perspective just how long her screaming went on for, I woke up. The light from the sun outside made my eyes sting. My ears were still throbbing. I slowly got up from the corner of the bathroom and unlocked the door. Jessie was playing on her PS5. Everything was totally normal. Hey, Tina, she said in her usual jaunty tone. I think your mom and dad are already outside waiting for you in their car. I couldn't take speaking. Everywhere in my body ached. I picked up my stuff and started walking downstairs. Jesse's parents waited at the bottom of the stairs to greet me. Your parents are outside waiting for you, Tina, said her mother with a smile. How did they get here so quickly? It was only a quarter to nine. I could see the open door and my parents' car outside. I was so relieved. I was going to leave this place finally. Jesse's dad showed me out and I hopped into my parents' car. I can't begin to explain how relieved I was to see my parents' smiling faces again. Jesse and her family waved at me as I drove away. How was the sleepover, sweetie? Asked my dad. I was about to reply when I got a notification on my phone. It was a message from my mom. It said, Hey Tina, I was just messaging to ask what time you wanted me and your dad to pick you up from Jesse's house. I looked back up at my mom, who was driving, and then my dad, who was smiling eerily at me. I forgot to leave on the TV. I felt sick to my stomach. Forgot something? asked my dad.
My wife, Antonia, disappeared on June 9th last year. She was supposed to be at home taking care of the kids while I was at work, but no, she wasn't home. I took care of the house and the kids without worrying about my job because I was given paid leave due to the sudden disappearance of my wife. Antonia was loved by everyone in the neighborhood. She opened a cheap daycare center right next to our house, allowing parents who couldn't afford to put their children in a normal nursing home to finally rest easy. She used to also host parties and barbecues in our house and invite everyone in the neighborhood to join in without worrying about any costs. She was so loved that even the mayor of our town showed up to her empty casket funeral. I knew Antonia for just over 12 years before she disappeared. We were high school lovers who had everything work out well for them. We argued every once in a while, but what couple doesn't? I asked her to marry me four years ago. We had two kids together, a boy and a girl. The oldest, Jeremy, is seven years old, while his sister is four years old. A lot of people seem to be sadder than I was that she was gone. I was adjusting well to her being gone. Yet today, when she walked into our front yard and stood in front of our front door while holding her hands behind her back, I couldn't believe it. I thought I was seeing a ghost. She was still wearing the same clothes she was wearing the last time anyone saw her alive, and she seemed... normal. There was no blood, no cuts, no anything. Her limbs were all attached and she seemed human. I knew this couldn't be real. I remember vividly that I cut her limbs off while she was screaming and begging for mercy. I remember putting what remained of her into a bag of rocks and dumping it into the ocean. I made sure nobody saw me, and I made sure to tell nobody. Yet there she was, standing on our front porch, looking straight into the doorbell camera and smiling. I have to admit that I was scared. Not for the kids, not for myself, but by what this thing was. I got even more scared when my son saw his mother through the window and opened the door for her. I locked and barricaded my office door before I got my gun from the safe in my desk's drawer. Forget about the kids, I thought to myself. I never really loved them anyway. I looked at the monitor that displayed my doorbell camera feed. She was no longer there. I heard the kids talking with her downstairs, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. Not like it mattered, because then I heard screaming. I felt my entire body vibrate. My ears were blasted with shrieks of terror and pain that I never want to hear again. A second later and there was no noise in the house. Not even the air conditioning unit or the creaking floorboard of this old house made a noise. Nothing apart from my heart punching through my stomach in a thud that repeated every other second. I knew that sound. It was the sound of something slowly walking up the staircase. That thing wasn't my wife. I never had a true wife. I never had kids. All of the evidence lined up. Antonia was cheating on me with my best friend. I was sterile. I couldn't have kids. She hired two people to take care of the daycare while her and Matthew were playing together while I was out at work. That's why I saw his car on my driveway one day. That's why I called her asking what she was doing that same day. And she sounded exhausted. I never called her out for it. I just poisoned her drink one night while the kids were sleeping. I took her into an abandoned cabin on the outskirts of the small town we lived in and did my deed there. Once I was done, I took all the evidence to a lake and dumped it into the ocean, making sure that it sunk in. Some people suspected I didn't. I was the cause of her disappearance, but there was no evidence of any wrongdoings on my part. They had nothing that could pinpoint it to me. Not even her parents suspected a thing. They told me they were sorry for my loss at her empty casket funeral. 
I kept in touch with them for a while before they both died in their sleep within a week of each other. They were good people. The only good involved in this story. I relived all of our memories together in my head. Our first date. Our first kiss. Our wedding. Everything was going well. We didn't even want kids. I don't know why she didn't. Why did she betray me in such a way? Especially with my best friend. I heard slamming on the door and felt the entire house shaking. I knew I didn't have time and had to act fast, but what could I do? I thought of calling the cops, but would they believe me if I tell them that my wife is back from the dead and trying to kill me? I could try and shoot it once, it makes it past the doorway, but if cutting her into several pieces and dumping her into the ocean was not enough to kill her, several bullets will definitely be of no help. I could fight it, and try to knock it out and run out the door, but the entire house shakes every time it slams on the door. Even I couldn't do that with all of my strength, and even if I am successful, wouldn't it just find me again? I could jump through the window of my small office and make a run to my car, but wouldn't it be suspicious if I was in my pajamas driving out of state while my house has two dead kids in it? I thought of my last option. I had no chance of escaping without ruining my entire reputation or getting killed. At some point the truth will come out. People will find out what really happened to Antonia. So why not finish the job myself? By the time you are reading this, I would have hopefully put an end to myself. Holy crap! An unfamiliar voice called out. Is that you? I had been so focused on my GPS that I hadn't been paying attention to my surroundings. Not the wisest choice at midnight in an unfamiliar town. I looked up and saw her walking towards me. As I met her gaze, she smiled and began walking faster. I said nothing as she embraced me on the sidewalk, holding me for what felt like ages. When she finally let go, I mustered a quiet, hey, with a degree of fake enthusiasm that felt appropriate. She laughed. How are you? I haven't seen you in so long. She spoke loudly, as if we weren't just inches apart. I paused as I studied her face, trying to remember how we knew each other. I'm usually pretty good with faces, and hers wasn't one I could easily forget. Her jet black hair, porcelain skin, and large brown eyes reflected the moonlight in a way that was eerily hypnotizing. She was roughly my age, if I had to guess, and absolutely gorgeous. I've been good, I said, admittedly a little creeped out, but nevertheless entranced. You know, same old, same old. She circled around behind me and placed herself to my right, locking her arm with mine. Without another word, we both started walking forward, synchronized in step. My heart pounded in my chest, due to an equal mix of unease and infatuation. She was petite and seemingly harmless. So, I silently steadied my breath. Just as I was preparing to apologize for my poor memory and ask her where we had met, I saw them. On the other side of the street to my left were two young men, leaning against a wall. They were tall and fit, dressed in pastel polo shirts and khaki shorts. Their dirty blonde hair and matching sharp jawlines suggested that they may have been brothers, but you could pluck any two jockish frat boys off the street in this town, and they would probably look pretty similar. Their eyes darted around deliberately trying and failing to hide the fact that they were watching her. We continued walking forward, and in my periphery, I noticed that the two men did as well. Their pace was just barely slower than ours. When they were finally out of earshot, she spoke again. I'm so sorry, she said, practically whispering. 
I know this is super weird. I just left a party and these guys have been following me for like two miles. I would have called someone, but I must have left my phone at the house. Don't be sorry. I said. Have they said anything? Oh yeah. She chuckled. All kinds of disgusting stuff. They've made their intentions pretty clear. Do you want me to call the cops? Can I just walk with you? She asked. I told her, of course, and we carried on for a minute in silence. I'm Lily, by the way. Sorry if I creeped you out back there. I didn't know what else to do. Tyler, and really, it's no problem at all. I'm just sorry you had to deal with that. You get used to it. She laughed again, this time more forced than the last. Nice to officially meet you, Tyler. A whistle sounded from behind us. I snapped my head to face our followers and shot them a dirty look in a feeble attempt to intimidate them. They could almost certainly see the panic in my face when I realized that they had crossed to our side of the street. The distance between us had become much shorter. So, she began, her voice wavering as she attempted a playful tone. Where are you headed on this fine Saturday night? Well, it's not exactly an exciting outing. My roommate accidentally used my toothbrush, so I was going to buy a new one from the corner store on Franklin. And do you need your GPS for that? She smirked as she gestured to my phone. I stifled a laugh, still weary of the people creeping along behind us. I just transferred here from summer school. This town is kind of confusing, you have to admit. I'm kidding. I'm just looking forward to being surrounded by people. Maybe I can hang out in the store and wait for these two to screw off. I admired her ability to seem so nonchalant. I was secretly terrified, and I could only imagine how she felt. We rounded the corner to the shop. A knot formed in my stomach as I saw the dark storefront. A sign on the door read, Due to short staffing, we will be closing nightly at 10 p.m. Sorry for the inconvenience. Crap. It said online that they're open all night. I said. I guess they couldn't afford a spell checker either. Lily didn't laugh. Summer hours, I guess. This place is a ghost town right now. As we stood planted in front of the store, one of the men behind us clicked his tongue with sarcastic pity and spoke in a raspy voice. You should go back where you came from, buddy. Lily squeezed my arm to preemptively silence me before I could speak. Don't, she said. They just want a reaction. The voice called out from behind us again. She'll make you think she wants you and then ruin your fucking night. She'll get what's coming to her. The two of them had stopped as well, just a few yards down the sidewalk from us. Although it was the middle of the summer, the air felt cold. I know this is weird, I whispered, but you can come back to my dorm if you want, just until it's safe. Uh, I don't think so, she said. I trust you, I really do. It's just, you said you have a roommate and I think I've hit my quota for interacting with strangers tonight. I then offered to call an Uber, which she also refused. I'm worried that they'll get even more aggressive if we wait around. Let me walk back to your place then. She begrudgingly agreed, and we continued on our way. She apologized three more times for inconveniencing me, and reassured me that her dorm wasn't far away. The frat boys followed quietly in tandem as we made our way across the campus. When we arrived at the entrance to Carter Hall, Lily paused and glanced over her shoulder. I followed suit, and saw the two of them standing eerily still in the middle of the quad. They were much further away now, watching silently. You sure you don't want me to call anyone? I asked. Yeah, she said, biting her lower lip. But would you come inside with me until they leave? I'm scared to be alone. She reached out and stroked my arm. My heart raced once again. 
There was nothing I wanted more than to be alone in a dorm room with a girl like Lily, but I knew I couldn't relax with these creeps lurking nearby. I'm gonna go talk to them. As the words left my mouth, I thought I must have lost my mind. Please don't. She said. Best case scenario, they feed you a bunch of crap. Worst case scenario. She trailed off. And I didn't know how to respond. Deep down, I knew she was right. My mind considered all of the horrible things that might happen to me. But I couldn't shake my desire to confront them. I spun around with another word and marched across the grass to meet them. Tyler! Lily's voice called out behind me. I wanted to turn back and spend the night with her, but my legs just kept carrying me forward. I was on autopilot. As I neared the two men, they remained completely still, staring straight through me. Hey! I shouted, doing my best impression of a confident man who could hold his own in a fight. You guys need to get out of here. My voice cracked a little bit. One of them was significantly taller than the other, but they both towered above me. Now that we were within spitting distance, I saw that both of their shirts were soaking wet. The shorter of the two men turned his head ever so slightly to face me and opened his mouth. No words came out. Instead, he emitted a soft, unsettling gurgle. Then the taller man spoke. You're out of your element, man. I'm gonna call the cops. The cops can't help you. He continued. She knows what you want. The shorter man continued to gurgle. Why are you doing this? I asked. I was no longer trying to sound tough. I was afraid and it showed in my voice. She flirted with us all night. She said she'd never been with two guys at once before. She told us to meet her in the basement. He still stared beyond me, refusing to meet my gaze. She had no right to do what she did, to leave us there like that. She doesn't owe you anything, I said. She owes us everything. I turned around and started back to the dorm entrance. The taller man called out to me once more. If you go back to her, you're dead. I'm not scared of you. I lied. As I made my way back to the door, I saw that Lily was nowhere to be found. I yanked on the door handle to no avail. Noticing the access card reader on the wall, I let out a sigh. I had missed my chance. I couldn't blame her, of course. It was stupid of me to confront them. I should have gone inside and called the cops, but of course I had to play the hero card. I glanced back to where they had been standing. The quad was empty and dead silent. I waited outside for a few minutes before shamefully making my way back to my own dorm. I'm embarrassed to admit that I faked a phone call the entire way as an attempt to ensure my own safety. Fortunately for me, the guys were nowhere in sight. For the first time since I had met Lily, a wave of calm rushed over me as I entered the building and hurriedly shut the steel door behind me. Trudging up the stairs and down the hall to my cramped room, I made a last ditch effort to search for her on every social media app I could think to try. No luck. I didn't even know her last name. My head barely touched my pillow when I drifted into a deep sleep, despite my crushing disappointment and my roommate's deafening snores. In what felt like the blink of an eye, I awoke to my roommate standing over me and jostling my shoulder. Hey. He said, his eyes were wide, his demeanor noticeably frantic. Did you know them? He was shoving his phone in my face, still half asleep. I struggled to focus my eyes. He and I had barely spoken to each other all summer. What could be so important that he felt the need to wake me up so urgently on a Sunday morning? No who? What are you talking about? I asked, rubbing my eyes and sitting up on my elbows. Dylan Gregory and Max Humboldt. Here. He shoved his phone even closer to my face. The picture on his phone screen became clear as I adjusted to the light pouring through our window. 
It was a photo of the creeps from last night standing in a field. They were wearing lacrosse uniforms and smiling ear to ear. Their arms around each other's shoulders. Their jerseys were drenched in sweat. I felt a lump in my throat. Had something happened to Lily? I knew I should have called the cops. Kind of, yeah. I mean, not really. I just met them. I grabbed his phone from his hands to study the picture more carefully. Why? What's going on? It's been all over the news this morning. They were murdered this weekend at a house party. Real gruesome stuff. One of them had his throat slit. I know it's callous, but I couldn't bring myself to feel sorry for them after what I had witnessed. I mostly just felt relief that Lily was safe. Good riddance. My son. I saw those guys last night. They were total assholes. Probably had it coming. That's messed up, he said with a laugh. Nobody deserves that. Besides, it's not the same guys. How would you know? I asked. This party was on Friday. Their frat brothers found them in the basement last night. First responders said that they had been dead for over 24 hours. I stared at the picture again. A soft, gurgling sound filled my ears, growing louder and louder. When my roommate spoke again, it sounded like he was underwater. Hey, I'm sorry again about the toothbrush. Did you get a new one? Since I was young, my grandfather always told me not to go into the woods during the winter. He meant the Hodakin Woods, located near the border of our reserve and not just any old forest. This always struck me as a scare tactic to keep the children from getting lost, or climbing the trees which were so tall, you might think they were brushing against the clouds. That was, until this morning. The day was going as per usual. I woke up and walked over to my grandparents' house to greet her for our morning cup of coffee, but something felt off this morning. I am not sure if it was just me still being tired from a shortened sleep due to the storm that had practically terrorized our grounds, but nonetheless, something was wrong. When I walked up those old steps on the front porch, it reminded me of the days I would go there as a young kid and jump up as many steps as possible because I was scared of something living under the porch grabbing my ankle as I was walking up. Of course, this was just a nonsense fear and I haven't done that for years. I knocked on the door in a way that wouldn't startle them in their older age, and after about 15 seconds, my grandmother opened the door. This is where I noticed something wasn't the same. As she pulled the door open, she looked up at me with an almost confused look. She opened her mouth as if she were about to speak and ask what I was doing here, but her mouth closed and she remained silent. Good morning, Grandma. How was your sleep? I asked her to break the silence so we could move on with our morning routine. She looked at me once again. This time, her eyes appeared deluded and scared. Your grandfather hasn't come home since yesterday evening, she said in a timber voice. With this news, I didn't immediately know what to say. My grandfather was practically a seasoned veteran around these grounds and rarely got lost. I took the initiative to ask the question that I feared I already knew the answer to. Where did he go last? I said shyly. When I asked this question, she stared into my eyes once again and said, He went into the forest. My stomach dropped. My brain suddenly filled with all the memories of him telling me how dangerous it was during the winter. I told her not to worry and that he probably just got invested into a hunt and lost track of time. She still seemed off and was barely speaking to me as if she was coming in and out of a daydream. Finally, I told her I was going to look for him. After all, what did I have to fear? 
It was the middle of the day, and I have never been one to believe in these kinds of myths and stories that grandparents tell the youth to scare them. I should have believed them. I began to walk away, climbing down those porch stairs again, when I heard my grandmother finally speak up once again. He always liked those trees. She mumbled from behind me. I turned my head to see her staring up in the sky, smiling, and she slowly lowered her eyes down and met my own, still smiling. I would be lying if I said that this didn't at least creep me out. I mean, your husband is missing, and you are smiling and remembering how he enjoyed the trees. I don't understand. Regardless, I will do my duty and see if I can find him. I walked for about 30 minutes, give or take, until I finally reached the border of the infamous woods which I had been so repeatedly warned about. Seemed normal to me, just a beautiful winter day where the bare trees held a couple inches of snow on each branch. A small amount of wind in the air, just enough to blow the snow around from time to time, but not enough to whistle. I began walking. Luckily, the snow was only a few inches deep, and my boots were high enough to cover until just below my knees. I walked and I walked, calling out, Grandpa! Grandpa! over and over again in hopes he would hear me. He didn't respond. That was until I could have sworn that I heard someone whistling near the large oak tree, about a hundred feet in front of me. I began walking towards the whistle, but I started getting a strange feeling and the hairs on my body began to stand up as I got closer. The whistle was not caused by wind, but it didn't sound like it was created by a person either. It was a single note, dragged out for about 10 seconds at a time, never changing. I neared the tree but didn't see anyone. I did the only thing left that I could do. I began to raise my head and look up. There he was, tangled in the branches with what looked like every limb on his body being broken as if he had fallen from the top but got stuck on the way to the ground. I began to cry and scream for help, but then I heard that whistle again. Same note, same length. I looked up again, but this time his eyes were wide open and his pupils were dilated just like my grandmother's this morning when I met her for coffee. I am not proud of what happened next, but honestly, I don't know what anyone else would have done. I ran as fast as I could back to the reserve. I was running, crying, screaming, and just hoping to see another pair of eyes that looked normal so I could get that image out of my head. I wanted to see my grandmother, but... I was scared of her, and I was not sure if I could handle it, but of course I had to tell someone that my grandfather is in that tree, and potentially alive. I went back to my place first, to calm myself down as I was not even entirely sure what just happened was real. It took about five minutes to calm down, have some water, and get prepared to handle this situation I am now directly in the middle of. Finally, I opened my front door ready to deal with whatever I had just experienced. I began to run over to my grandparents' house again, almost tripping because my boots were not great for running, but I didn't care. I just had to get to their house. I got to the stairs of the porch and began to climb them just like I do every morning, and just as I was about to knock on the front door, I heard something I couldn't believe. The whistle, the same one I heard in the woods not long ago. My body froze. Every hair on my body stood up once again, and I was struck with the most fear I had ever felt in my life as I saw my grandmother and grandfather staring at me through the front window, both smiling with huge black eyes, and then whistling that same note in unison. I turned and ran as fast as I could still hearing that same note being whistled in the distance, not stopping until I reached my house. I slammed the door behind me and locked it immediately. 
There was immediate silence. The kind of silence that makes you feel uneasy and anxious. A silence that is so loud it was deafening. I shut the blinds and sat in my house alone, left to think about what I had just experienced. The only thing I could think to do was write about it so I could reflect and see if I am going crazy or not. Maybe I am. Who knows? Maybe I imagined the entire thing because honestly, that would be better than it being real. Update. It's been many hours since it happened and it's getting dark outside, which makes me feel scared. But I am going to try and sleep so I can figure out what I am going to do tomorrow. I hope I go to my grandparents' house and everything is normal. I just want my normal life back. Nothing strange has happened since I've been home. It's just been silent. At one point, I could have sworn I heard something moving under my bed. But that just makes me sound like a paranoid kid, and I'm sure it was just my imagination. Update 2. I heard the moving again. This time it was more aggressive and audible. I screamed when I heard it, but I am too scared to check. It has been about 30 minutes since it happened, and I don't know what else to do other than write. I'm scared to run. I'm scared to check. I am scared to even make any noise, but I need someone to know what happened to me if I go missing. Update 3. Someone just whistled. Same note. Same length. And it's coming from under my bed. Windows boarded, doors padlocked, lights snuffed out, chimney barricaded. With heart pounding, I press myself between my parents' legs, backs against the living room wall, straining to hear for any sound beyond the house, but so far, it appeared as nothing was stirring, not even a mouse. From across the room, I can see there are gaps in the wood, giving an obscured look at the two closest houses across the street. Like ours, their house is pitch black, but I knew that the Johnsons and the Yangs are cowering in their homes just like we are. The whole street is. It feels like hours have passed, but soon I hear the faint sound of sleigh bells, and suddenly my shoulders are gripped tight by my mom and dad. He's come. All of a sudden, it's harder to breathe. I suck the air up, but it doesn't feel like enough, and my breathing is so loud. Is it normally that loud? Is he going to hear me? My mom crouches in front of me, wipes away tears I didn't realize had fallen and cradles me in her arms. She tells me I have to remain quiet, that I have to be good. I have heard this from her countless times. The bells grow louder but remain slow, each beat painfully drawn out as it passes overhead and circles back around. It's going to stop at our street tonight. I can't help it. A squeak of a cry escapes my mouth before my dad covers it tightly with his hand. I watch as my mother silently prays for our house to not be chosen. Her lips moving frantically and eyes shut painfully tight. A thud sounds as a heavy object touches down on the roof, but it's not ours. Dad breathes out a hard sigh of relief, but he's still trembling. The three of us creep towards the window and peer out the few inches gap between the two boards. I can't see the sleigh or the reindeers, but I know it must be there. We can't see much at all at first. As my eyes adjust, I can finally make out some obscure shapes. A wide shadow figure on the roof of the Johnson's house. It's heavy steps shaking fresh snow off the tiles as it walks. Then with all its force, it slams itself into the chimney, brick pieces exploding into the air as he bellows in a voice that sounds like a painfully slow, warped record. Hang your stockings and say your prayers, cause Santa Claus comes tonight. I have never witnessed an attack with my own eyes before, just the videos people have posted online. My parents don't know about those. 
They don't know that I have seen what is about to happen before. But even so, it hasn't prepared me for the real thing. A warmth runs down my legs as my terror escapes in physical form. But my wide eyes stay glued to the window. The three of us are paralyzed. Forced to watch what is about to happen. He knows he can't get down the chimney. So he's smashing it to pieces in frustration. The Johnsons block their chimney too, but it will only be a delay for the inevitable. He will get inside. He gets on all fours and crawls over the edge of the roof and down the side of the house. Peering into each of the windows as he chuckles his trademark, ho ho ho. Searching for the room that the family are hiding inside. He must have found what he was looking for as once he gets to one of the bedroom windows, he begins to relentlessly pound his fists into the brick while staring into the window. All the while he jovially sings, let it snow. With each punch, the hole in the wall gets larger and larger until he can tear his way inside the house. We can just about hear the guttural screams of the family now that there is a large hole in their house. Wave after wave of screaming, it pierces the silent night. We see nothing for a long time and eventually it falls quiet once more. Minutes pass until a faint glowing can be seen in the otherwise dark house, moving from one window to another, back to the hole. Out he comes with the two children, Jack and Harry, no more than five years old, wrapped up in Christmas lights and dangling by their feet. Their backs are bent back painfully and stockings stuffed into their mouths to keep their screams in. He has hold of them as he climbs back out and up to the roof again. He's covered in blood, but most noticeably, his mouth has the worst of it. His whole face is covered in red gore, which only showcases the whites of his wide, unblinking eyes. As he looks out over the neighborhood, he knows everyone is watching. Just like we know, he is always watching. He throws them into his sleigh. Jack and Harry weren't good this year, and they are never seen again. I had just moved again, which was a tedious and not unusual occurrence. We'd been living overseas because of my dad's job, and he'd experienced some trouble at work. None of it his fault. His manager was just particularly terrible. And he exercised his return rights back to where we'd come from. It hadn't even been a year. None of us were happy with the situation, but we put up with it and headed back to the US, finding a house after a little over a month and moving right in. I won't bore you with what happened after that. It was just the regular moving things like getting our household goods, and seeing a mountain of boxes everywhere we looked. It was a month after we moved in that it happened. I was unwrapping some of my things in my room. I'd picked the basement since I was older and needed my own space. I wasn't completely alone. The cat's food was in the next room, so my cat would be down there with me a lot, but for the most part, I was alone. The movers had used a lot of paper, maybe more than necessary and I noticed too late that the paper I was holding had a strange bulge in the bottom, and the bulge turned out to be my smallest snow globe, which fell to the ground and shattered at my feet. I wasn't particularly upset. It wasn't an expensive one, just annoyed. So I went to get something to clean up the water and the glass before tossing it out. It was just a stupid little Christmas-themed thing, with a cheery reindeer depicted inside. I didn't give it a second thought as I tossed it in the trash can. The way it shattered stuck with me though. It barely made a noise, and since it had landed right on the glass part, the shards had gone everywhere. I didn't know why. Maybe it was just that it still annoyed me, since there was still glitter on the floor. I started to have weird dreams not long after of the snow globe shattering just over and over again. 
The smiling reindeer's face slowly moving to the floor. Once I'd wake up in a cold sweat, but I wasn't sure why. The weirdness started after that. I'd find pieces of glass in places the snow globe never was, like under the bookcase and by my vanity. The snow globe had shattered at the foot of my bed in front of my dresser. And like I said, it wasn't that big. The dome was barely the size of a bouncy ball. At first, I thought maybe I'd drag the pieces with me when I walked, but that seemed unlikely because I didn't wear shoes in the house. So if I stepped on a piece of glass, it probably would have just gone into my foot. Then I began noticing other things, mainly at night. There was a subtle, gentle knocking at the glass door in the next room that started a week after I found the glass. It was always at around 8, and honestly, I didn't even notice it at first since I'm usually awake on my phone watching videos. I didn't get worried until it started to get louder and more frequent, lasting almost all night and causing me to spend most nights paralyzed in my bed. I didn't know what it was, but I'd seen enough horror movies to know not to get up. Some nights when I could get up, I went and slept on the couch, but the noise just followed me to the living room window. The blinds were always closed, so I never saw who or what it was, and I had no desire to open it. After spending a few weeks in this anxiety-ridden existence, I decided that enough was enough. I waited until the sun went down, and when the knocking started, I gathered the courage to creep into the room next to mine. It was the laundry room, and it wasn't completely finished. The ceiling was just insulation, and the floor was gray concrete. There were a lot of boxes in there, and it was a little difficult to maneuver my way to the glass door, but I got there. There were quite a few boxes blocking it, but I could see the top half of the door, and what I saw stopped me in my tracks. There was a giant, grinning reindeer tapping its forehead rhythmically against the glass. It was the exact mirror of the one that had been in my snow globe, and I knew that one was plastic, and if this was the same reindeer, then that meant it could easily shatter the glass if it wanted to, but... It didn't. It just stood there, knocking its head against the glass over and over. I didn't remember screaming or running, but when I woke up I was on the floor of the laundry room. My head hurt and there was daylight streaming in through the glass door. The reindeer was gone. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't tell my family about it, so I had to do something about this myself. I didn't know why it was after me specifically, but I figured it was because I'd broken the snow globe. Maybe it had been a cage. Or capsule of some kind. Had I freed it, and now it was after me? This was what I settled on. The next night, I grabbed my old softball bat, which I'd found earlier, and crept upstairs in nothing but my sloth pajama pants and bright yellow sleep shirt. I didn't know what I was expecting to do with the bat, but as I slipped on my flip-flops and headed out the front door, my grip on it tightened. I knew the deer would find me. It had before. I heard it before I saw it, its large plastic feet making noises in the grass behind me. I turned slowly, finding its grinning face looking down at me. It rushed me all at once, and I ran my heart pounding in my chest into the woods to the side of my house. Branches bended and snapped all around me as I heard its crashing footsteps grow closer and closer. I could hear my heartbeat thumping in my ears as it got closer. Thump, thump, thump. That scared me a little more than the deer did, but I didn't have much time to process that before it knocked me face first into the leaf-covered dirt. I desperately grabbed at the ground with my free hand, while the other gripped the bat tightly. I was screaming, I was begging, I was pleading as it lifted me up in the air with... what I didn't know since it had hooves rather than hands, and turned me to look at its grinning face. 
That smile contorted and stretched until it was past its eyes. The mouth opening with a crack of plastic to reveal sharp teeth you wouldn't find on a deer. It also had a surprisingly moist looking black tongue that writhed and squirmed in its gaping maw. I was nearly paralyzed with fear at this point. My wide eyes looking directly at those sharp teeth. I reacted just before it could put me in its mouth. A little jolt making me realize what was happening and causing me to swing my bat with all my might. A large crack was heard and it dropped me back on the ground. When I finally managed to look up, I saw that it now had a crack across its face. The mouth had closed back into that cheery grin and it simply lumbered off into the woods without a care in the world. I didn't see it again after that. And it's been years since this incident happened, but even now, long after I've moved out of my parents' house and married my long-term boyfriend, I can still hear it occasionally, tapping gently against the glass. I don't know what sort of monster I released when I dropped a carelessly wrapped snow globe on the ground by accident in my cold basement room all those years ago, but I hope my husband never notices because I wouldn't want anyone else to see that large, gaping maw. Hello there. Let me share my experience which resulted in major childhood trauma. All thanks to Mountain Lodge Psychiatric Center in Magaliesberg. Before I start, I have to warn you that my story contains mentions of suicide. Please delete this if you are sensitive to this subject. So to give you some background, my grandmother and grandfather have been working at psychiatric hospitals since they were 16. So we basically grew up in and around psychiatric facilities and were used to anything and everything, or so we thought. In 2002, my grandfather took on a position at Mountain Lodge Psychiatric Center where they stayed on the premises. During school holidays, my cousin and I would go visit and explore the grounds. From the moment they moved in there, weird stuff started happening. It was a four bedroom house with one long hallway stretched straight down the middle of the house. So you could basically see from the front door to the back door. The girls' room was right at the back of the house across from the bathroom. The bathroom was divided into three separate rooms consisting of the loo, the shower room, and a room with a bath. There was two basins with vanity cabinets in the communal area of the bathroom. This is important to remember. During the April school holidays in 2003, my cousin and I went to visit my granny and grandfather. We went on one of our adventures and found a waterfall. At the foot of the waterfall, we found a skull. The skull turned out to belong to a female patient who offed herself and the hospital thought she ran away because they couldn't find her. The paranormal things were amped up from there. Not too sure if the spirit of this girl maybe followed us home. That night we went home and we were minding our business in our room and started hearing someone in the kitchen boiling the kettle on the stove, taking out mugs, the teaspoon tinkling on the side of the mug, chairs being moved and so on. My cousin and I then slowly tiptoed to the kitchen to surprise my granny, but the joke was on us because there was no one there. And everything was in its place. Kettle ice cold, and grandma and grandpa fast asleep. We went back to our room, obviously freaked out, and tried to distract ourselves by coloring in some coloring books. We didn't want to go to sleep and decided to pull an all-nighter. The house was quiet until about 3 a.m. We heard the taps in the bathroom opening. I popped my head out of our room and saw that the lights were off and there is nobody there. I convinced my cousin to investigate with me. 
We checked everything out, and just as we wanted to go back to our room, the toilet flushed and I saw the silhouette of a girl in the reflection of the mirror right behind me. Needless to say, we cuddled up next to each other with every light on we could possibly find. The next day we found out there was a girl who offed herself with a piece of broken mirror. Things were quiet for a while with the paranormal shenanigans, but it was simply the calm before the storm. My grandparents never had the best relationship and fought regularly, but we kind of grew used to it. After my cousin went home, their fights grew worse and worse by the day. One night, I was in bed when I heard one hell of a commotion. My grandmother came stumbling out of her room trying to hold her neck together, blood gushing and dripping everywhere. My grandfather cut her throat with a bread knife and tried to off himself by slitting his wrists. My mind blocked out what happened next. My next memory was when we visited my gran in hospital. My grandfather only a few rooms away in recovery. His only explanation for his actions were that he was taken over by something, and he had no control over his hands and his body. Our family moved all their stuff that same weekend. We found out there was a group of individuals who were doing rituals trying to summon something on the property next to my grandparents' house. I guess they were successful. Lately, sleep paralysis has become some sort of meme or normality on the internet. It's been reduced to seeing an imaginary monster while laying in bed not being able to move or do anything. But I can assure you, it's much more than just that. Ever since I was four years old, I've been having to go through that intense pain of not wanting to sleep. Staying whole nights awake as a little kid, often crying for hours at a time about the shadows coming to get me. That feeling of pressure every time you even think about nighttime. Like a car standing on top of your heart ready to squish it in the most painful way possible, is something that can't even be described in text. It all started as the exact opposite for me. Long nights of insomnia that I wish I could get back. Times of me wanting to sleep. At the age when I'd only just learned to walk. I remember being unable to communicate with my parents in any way other than crying. Loud babbling that only made my heart hurt more. The only times that I was able to sleep, my parents recall having to stop me from falling out of bed and walking around the house. At first, they thought I just had a bad case of both insomnia and sleepwalking. But as the years moved on, it turned out to be a lot more than that. On my third or fourth birthday, I started sleeping a lot more often like a normal kid would. It was a good sign at first, and the doctors even said the sleepwalking might be over soon. Unlucky me, however, it wasn't. My parents started having to stay awake at night, mostly because little sleeping me had found his way to the sliding glass backyard door. The first time they found out about this, they woke up with me crying outside, having have smashed a chair against the now broken door. Fortunately, I was unharmed. At least that time. As I grew up, I became more scared of the night. I mostly tried to sleep during the day, but it still wasn't enough. I remember asking my parents to tie a rope around my hand and to my bed. Once they tried, however, they had to drive me to the hospital that same night. I had eaten part of the rope to get out, and I'd swallowed part of it. I'm guessing you know now that this wasn't a normal thing to happen to anyone. Don't worry, it gets worse. When I was 10 years old, we developed some sort of system. At night, everyone had to close all the doors and windows in the house. Any object or piece of furniture except my bed had to be more than one meter away from where I slept. This was to ensure I didn't scratch or eat anything. 
I had to keep both arms tied with some expert climber's rope to the bed. If possible, the sheets should be too tight for me to move easily, mostly to delay myself trying to get out of bed. It was a full moon night. I needed to have some sort of protection to stop myself from biting myself. Along with some other stuff, this was the safest way to keep myself from rising up, smashing one of the windows and running into the wild. We live next to a small forest in California, and that was my favorite place to hide when I slept. We even got the police searching for me quite a few times. By then, they were almost used to my parents calling them at night. This was around the time when I just tried to stop sleeping. I'd just stare at the walls full of moving shadows until the sun rose and my parents came to let me out. At some point, I started thinking of me when I sleepwalked as a whole different person. I was a kid and that was the best thing I came up with to understand such madness. I called that version of me Epialis, the Greek god or interpretation of nightmares. Ten years later I developed some sort of sleep paralysis. I'd wake up wherever Epialis left me, unable to move. I'd just have to stay there, often in an uncomfortable position, with the sinking feeling that I was being watched. The worst thing is, that thing that watched me, Epialis. I see it now. Him. I don't know how, but I just know he's there. I've talked about this to professionals who told me it's just a hallucination. The thing is, lately, his presence has been getting stronger. I feel him now, I see his shadow, and even have an idea of how he looks like. Behind me, even as I'm writing this, I can now feel his warm breaths on my neck. At nights, his presence is getting bigger, harder to control. Every time I wake up, he's watching me. Those red eyes are almost impossible to describe in words. They're just beautifully terrifying. Able to turn your heart upside down with one glance, literally. Every time I go to sleep, I'm closer and closer to escaping. More and more. I see myself moving without wanting to, and I think soon, he'll take over me when I'm awake. He's watching me right now. He's going to make me pay for this, and it's almost turning nighttime. Please be careful out there. And if you see a young man in the middle of the forest, don't approach me. Epialis might try to take you too. I moved into a new house in a new town in a new state. I'm a recently divorced woman and not used to being on my own after seven years of marriage. Me and my ex never had kids, so it made the process a little easier. I did my best to make sure I put as many miles between us as I could afford. I don't know anyone in town, and my neighbors are pretty quiet. Nobody even welcomed me to the neighborhood. But maybe I'm expecting too much from strangers. The house next door to me looks vacant on the exterior, but I notice lights on through my kitchen window at night that faces the house. I thought nothing of it until my second day there at dusk, I got a knock at my front door. I didn't know who to expect seeing as how nobody is knowing that I'm here. I opened the door, and it was an old man. Maybe late 70s or early 80s, greeting me with a friendly smile. Uh, yes? How may I help you? I said in a friendly but confused manner. I'm sorry to bother you, he said. But I was wondering if you had any sugar I can borrow. I wanted a hot cup of tea before bed, but I neglected to go to the grocery store. I smiled out of the sheer cuteness of a nice old man borrowing sugar from a neighbor. No bother at all, sir. If you wait right here, I'll go get you a few cups so you won't have to go to the store so soon. He smiled a little wider and said, Thank you. It really means a lot to me. I left the door open as he waited for me on the porch to get the sugar. 
I walked in the kitchen past the window facing his house and vaguely noticed his light was on. I opened my cabinet and measured out two cups of coffee and put it on one of the three Tupperware bowls I brought from my last house and sealed it up. I then walked back to the front door. Here you go, sir. But he was gone. I walked a little further on the porch to look for him and... nothing. He wasn't even standing in his yard. I walked over and knocked on his door to see if he still wanted or needed the sugar when I noticed the lights were off in his house. Nobody answered the door. I walked back to my house kind of worried and kind of irritated at the same time with this man wasting my time. Maybe I'm just frustrated because he was the first smiling face I've seen in a few months after the divorce I went through. Being needed for something as small as sugar meant the world to me at this time. But regardless, I went back to the kitchen to put the Tupperware bowl in the cabinet in case he came back. When I noticed that the bag of sugar was put back in the cabinet and the cabinet was closed, I didn't understand. I left out in a hurry to get back to the door. Even the little bit that I spilled on the counter was cleaned up. I pause as I try to remember if I did it before I went back outside, but no, I couldn't have. The next day, I plan to go to the store. As I'm leaving the house, about to get in the car, I was greeted by a lady who told me she lives across the street. She introduced herself and asked me how I was enjoying the neighborhood so far. I told her, I've only met two so far, but you both seem very nice. She then said, well, thank you, and asked who the first person I met was. I told her, the older man who lives next door. He came to borrow sugar last night. Her face turned pale as she stared directly in my eyes for about two seconds before she asked, which neighbor? I pointed at the house he lived in, and her breath got labored. She placed her hand on her chest and said, Nobody lives there anymore. An old man lived there for about 30 years alone. No wife, no kids, just drinking tea in his den. She pointed at the room that faces my kitchen that I see lit up every night and said, In that room there. He would come ask us for sugar every now and then as well. I interrupted. What do you mean he doesn't live there anymore? He just came to my door last night. That den light has been on every night. I said slightly panicked, but what she said next, I never expected. Sweetie, he died three months ago. Before she wished me well and walked away confused. I went back in the house thinking about what she said and feeling frightened, but not as scared as you'd think I'd be. I'm actually kind of happy that a lonely soul needed a lonely soul like me even after death. Now I keep the sugar out in case the friendly old man ever needs it. As a child, I always had an imaginary friend of sorts. His name was Benjamin and he was very friendly, often keeping me company while my parents were out for errands or work. He looked to be in his mid-forties and had always struck me as a father. The catch is, mom and dad were never able to see him, and just assumed that I was playing around and that Benjamin was a figment of my imagination. As years passed and I grew older, Benjamin's image seemed to... distort. His face seemed to change ever so slightly year after year. His nose would look broken, one of his eyes slightly higher than the other. His fingers would look increasingly gnarled. He did not look like the Benjamin I once knew. It got to a point where I had to block him out. I ignored him, his presence, and his voice. I constantly pestered my parents so much about Benjamin being a nuisance that we moved out when I was about 12. Safe to say, Benjamin was never seen or heard from again, and I slowly forgot about my former imaginary friend. 
Fast forward to the present. I'm now 18, and I'm still living in the new house with my parents. I also now have a beautiful baby sister, Margaret, who is five years old today. I was in the process of building my life, preparing to enter society as an adult. I took a job, was studying harder in school, and although I don't have a girlfriend yet, I was quite content with my achievements so far. Things started going downhill from there. I returned home one day, and I had a sense that something was wrong. There was an awful, unexplainable pressure and malignant presence that had the air in the house feel heavy. It felt suffocating. Although it was around 3pm, the house looked eerie and dim, with the sunlight barely making it past the windows. I didn't think much of it. That was a mistake. Everything I worked for started crumbling slowly. I got fired from my job for some unreasonable excuse. My friends started distancing themselves after hearing a rumor about me, and my sister was constantly falling ill. My health was also deteriorating, barely getting enough sleep and losing my appetite despite feeling hungry just minutes before. I was also losing my focus in class, and my grades plummeted. That's when I saw him again. His dark hair plastered to his forehead, his bony fingers, his imposing frame, that ear-to-ear -ear grin that looked as if his lips should have been there to cover those teeth covered in dried blood, and those eyes, those empty, soulless eyes that still somehow radiated anger. He only started showing up in my peripheral vision. I'd notice him, then blink and look again, and he was gone. I took it as severe sleep deprivation and that I was hallucinating. God, I thought to myself. I should really fix my sleep schedule. Right before I was going to sleep one night, I saw him again in the corner of my room. I tried to ignore him again, but this time he spoke. Why did you leave? His raspy voice broke from what was left of his vocal cords. I gave you all my time and you... You abandoned me in that hellhole. It was true. The old house was unusually run down and I overheard my parents talking about some jar of human remains found behind a fake wall in the attic. However, my parents were young and in need of a place to stay while they worked out their finances. I couldn't move. I watched as he floated over to me. My chest got heavier. I felt each breath become increasingly harder to take. I watched as he came closer and closer, his bony fingers reaching for my chest. I did the only thing I could. I prayed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I've never been particularly religious, but found myself praying over and over again. As he screamed and retreated back into the darkness, I felt control of my body return. I didn't sleep a wink that night. I told my parents everything that happened. We ended up calling a priest who got the entire house cleansed. However, he said that it would only be temporary, and the only way to get rid of it is... Please save me. Please picture Benjamin, a rotting corpse with bony fingers, a skeleton-like frame, with patches of decaying skin falling off his arms, neck, and face. Picture what little strands of hair he has left, clinging on to his peeling scalp. Picture his bottomless eyes. Those dark spheres that are completely devoid of life, and most importantly, that wide, wide grin that stretches from his cheeks down to his chin. With sharp teeth, no, fangs that are caked with blood, picture him staring at you out of the corner of your eye. His name is Benjamin, and he hung himself after killing and cannibalizing children to avoid capture by the police. Please picture him and remember the details. Everything about him. That is the only way to get rid of the curse. 
I'm sorry to have passed him on to you, but I've already lost everything. I don't want him to take more of my life away. I'm sorry. I'm so... very sorry. Every time I die, the world comes back a little bit clearer. Exactly like it sounds. The first time I died, I hardly noticed the change. I was too busy focusing on other things. Like the fact that I was alive, and not a wicked red stain on the side of the road. I'd been blasting Brittany's Hit Me Baby one more time. And yes, the irony is not lost on me. When out of the corner of my eye, I saw a semi-truck blare past the red light. I barely had time to process what this meant when an awful screeching sound assaulted my senses. Metal tore through metal, and for a fraction of a second, I felt the worst pain I'd ever felt in my life. The driver's side door bulged inwards, tearing into my left rib cage, and my head slammed into the steering wheel, wedging my front teeth up and into my gums. And when I woke up in my bed, sweat-stained and heaving, but perfectly unharmed. I glanced at my phone. Midnight, the 21st. Hadn't yesterday been the 21st? I licked perspiration from my upper lip. Had it all been a dream? If so, the human capacity is way too good at imagining pain. Or I swallowed thickly. What if it hadn't been a dream, but a premonition? I had never believed in that kind of stuff before, but then again, I had never felt such real, visceral pain before either. To be honest, the notion that I had actually died didn't even cross my mind. Not that time. I called in sick to work and ordered Uber Eats, determined to stay away from the wheel for the day. And when the 22nd came and passed, I deemed myself officially truck driver safe and went on with my life. I did notice the world seemed a little brighter, a little more colorful, but I chalked that up to gratitude that I was alive. It wasn't until 18 months later, when I had one too many drinks at my friend Taylor's wedding and decided to mess around and find out in the ocean that I really noticed the change. Like before, I died painfully. Even now, I can taste the salt water burning in my lungs, can picture the dark nothingness of the sea as it dragged me closer into its stifling embrace. It's an image that gives you relief, but at the same time, I was ecstatic to wake up, safe and dry in my bed. The day had reset to midnight the previous morning, the day of Taylor's wedding. At the reception, I steered clear of alcohol. Like before, the world I had awoken to seemed clearer than before, crisper, more vibrant. Not by a good measure, but noticeable, like changing a YouTube video resolution from 720p to 1080p. Is that Veronica Miller, without a drink in her hand? As I googled things like, can your vision improve with age, and do dreams of death make you appreciate life more, one of my college friends, Luke, wandered over. Celebrating an early Lent, I told him. I started to pocket my phone, but he managed to get a glimpse of my search results before I could. Dreams of death? He leaned in. You doing okay, Miller? Could be a lot worse, I said truthfully. Nothing was better than my family finding my bloated body at the bottom of the Pacific. Speaking of which, I cleared my throat. Hey, you haven't had any bad dreams lately, have you? When I had drowned in the ocean yesterday, Luke had been one of the friends who had ran for help. Would he be able to sense that somehow? Luke frowned, thinking, thinking. I could see when the bulb inside his mind flashed on. 
shining light through the Aperol induced haze. You know what? Yeah. Just last week I woke up in our old psych class, except I hadn't prepared for the final at all, and our professor kept complaining at me because I was naked. And oh, there were three clowns in a trench coat lurking over my shoulder. They all had faces like my mother. It was horrifying. Luke grimaced, shuddered a bit. Why are you asking? Oh, no reason, I said. Forget I asked. It wasn't until three years later that I realized what I was experiencing was something more intense than dreams or premonitions. That time, it was a freak accident. Bolt of lightning, if you can believe it. What are the odds? Less than a million, according to the CDC. Although, since I had died quite a few times, my odds were starting to stack up. Maybe. I'm not actually sure if that math checks out, but again, bigger things to worry about. This time, the resolution of the universe jumped from YouTube quality to independent cinema. Lines were crisper, colors more saturated. In a way, it reminded me of Plato's theory of forms. It had been a while since I learned about that in Philosophy 101, but the basic gist is that the world we see, the physical world, isn't the real world, but a flattened shadow of true reality. And now, it seemed I was climbing the ladder for a glimpse at that truer reality. The blankets on my bed absolutely embodied the form of a blanket. The scent of my morning coffee was stronger than the inside of a Starbucks. Every apple I tasted was the fullest, reddest apple I had ever tasted, tempting enough to trick Snow White for a second time. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. That's why the fourth time I died, it wasn't an accident. I didn't know what was happening to me, but I did know that every time I died, I woke up just fine. And every time I woke up, I saw the universe a little bit more as it was. I didn't worry about schematics. I just wanted more. So I borrowed my friend Xanax prescription and popped them into my mouth until my cheeks resembled a squirrel hoarding nuts. This death was a lot less painful than the other deaths, although I wouldn't describe it as pleasant. Still, it was worth it to wake up in Technicolor, like our world had been merged with the color palette of Rainbow Road from Mario Kart. I ate a simple breakfast of oatmeal and berries that morning, and it was better than any Michelin star restaurant I had dined at. The textures of the oats was earthy and pure. I could almost taste the freshness of the wheat stalk it had been milled from. The berries burst in my mouth, an explosion of tart and sweet that was better than any orgasm I had experienced before. And then I decided to play around with that idea a little more, and realized that it wasn't only taste and color that was enhanced. Everything was. I know, I should have been content with that. Or I mean, obviously I didn't know. But I should have. But I wanted more needed more, craved more. So over the course of the next few weeks, I died as many times as I could. I found overdosing to be the most effective method, but I also played around with carbon monoxide poisoning, diving onto train tracks, hypothermia, and even skydiving without a parachute. I had so much fun with the skydiving method that I did it again the next day just for fun. And with each death, the world came back a little clearer, a little closer to its true form. For the most part, the changes were delightful. It was like I was dosing on shrooms all the time. High on life, for the first time that phrase made sense. It wasn't until around death number 27 that things became a little strange. When I woke up, safely tucked into my bed, I never panicked anymore. I inhaled the scent of the automatic coffee machine cranking out my morning brew, 
It was incredibly rich and sweet as always, but underneath it, I sensed a different smell. A bitter one. I couldn't place it and assume the coffee beans were going stale. By death 33, I saw things so clearly that a sweater wasn't just a sweater to me. It was an amalgamation of every tiny strand of fabric threaded together. The sweater was whole, but at the same time, I could see the micro gaps in the cotton itself. It was like that for everything. Or most things. Around death 38, I woke up confused because the world looked blurrier than usual, like it was overlaid with static. For a moment, I panicked, thinking I had hit the edge of a counter of sorts, and now everything was resetting back to the first level. But when I looked at my door, I could see the wood grain in impeccable detail. I could smell the earthiness of the trees themselves. The blurriness was something else. Something deeper. I was starting to see the very fabric of the universe on a molecular level. And I was so intrigued that I barely noticed that the bitter smell lingered everywhere now. Arsenic, cliff diving, toaster in the bathtub. That last one was an awful mistake. Especially because pain seemed to be more real. More vivid now, too. But after a dozen more deaths, the blurry shapes started to resemble odd, geometric shapes. Shapes that buzzed and writhed. Shapes that almost resembled the shapes we were taught in geometry. Hexagons, pentagons, 13 pointed stars, but somehow were also completely other. I couldn't have sketched them for you if I tried. Shapes that seemed... hostile. I was so obsessed with seeing a clear picture that I ignored my other senses, like the scent of sulfur infiltrating my nostrils or the pounding of my scared human heart. The sound of constant screaming. Oh sure, I realized that something was wrong. Something was off, but I didn't care anymore. I was a scientist searching for the truth. One horrible death at a time. Bullets of the temple. Black widow bite. Suffocation. I began to hear noises underneath the screaming. They didn't resemble words in any language that I knew, but somehow, I understood. Closer, 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 closer to us. And helplessly, I obeyed. The universe was offering me its secrets, and I was determined to know them. And today, after waking up from my 100th death, I have finally succeeded. I looked the universe in the eye, and the universe looked back, and that's why I'm here writing to all of you. My name is Veronica Miller, and I've died 100 times, 100 times in every way imaginable, and now, all I want is a real way out. Please, someone, anyone, tell me how to die for real. I don't know how much time I have, but this time when I die, I need to stay dead. Please. I want to thank everyone who gave me suggestions on how to die, and more importantly, how to stay dead in my last post. If you don't remember me, I'm the girl who had a lot of fun dying until it stopped being so fun and started becoming terrifying. With every death, the universe became a little clearer to me, and now... Well, I have a few interesting abilities, like the power to take a sip of apple juice and tell you exactly which tree the apples grew on. I can't enjoy any of it. How can I? Each moment is a sensory nightmare, every waking moment of every day. The sound of hoarse screaming and demented laughter clogs my ears. Bitterness and rot fill my nostrils. And everywhere I look, God. Everywhere I look, I see them. Tangled, demonic-looking creatures the color of television static. Creatures that are watching me, stalking me, waiting for me. Waiting for what? 
I'm not sure. But I sure as hell don't want to find out. And that's why this time when I die, I need to stay dead. So, starting today, I'm going to keep a log of all the different ways I'll be attempting to die. Of course a log will be futile to me if I do succeed. But if anyone else out there is like me, bless your wretched soul, then perhaps it will be of use to you. Before I start, I will add that before attempting any of the proposed solutions, I did attempt to track down the person who originally killed me, but it ended up being a lot harder than I thought it would be. My town isn't New York City or Los Angeles big, but it's sizable enough that after roaming the streets for days in my little Volkswagen bug, I was still at square one. I even checked in at all the local truck stops, although to be fair, I wasn't coasting off a lot of information. The conversations mostly went something like this. Name of driver? No idea. Appearance? Blurry, but I think white. Maybe. But like tanned white and brown hair. Or maybe sandy blonde. Well, he had hair in any case. Unless it was a wig. Right. Plate number? I barely remember if the dude had hair, and you think I remember a license plate? At that point in the conversation, whatever underpaid, overworked cashier manning the gas station would start to get upset. A few of them thought I was playing a practical joke on them for YouTube views, and the less jaded ones thought I was delusional. I'm pretty sure I confirmed that belief at the last gas station when, in a moment of weakness, I finally snapped at the annoyed cashier and told him that while I might not remember petty details like plate numbers or truck models, I definitely remember the sensation of metal slicing through my rib cage and piercing my lungs. The cashier kicked me out after that. And I decided to give up on that side of the equation altogether. And that leads us to now. I have a pen in hand. A letter titled, Post to my account in case of death, and a hopeful smile on my face. And since I'm dying to get dying, let's dive in. Death 101. Burn her like a witch. December 1st, 2022. 6.30pm. Technically, someone suggested I cremate myself but it's quite hard to find a mortician willing to do this to someone who is alive. I guess old habits are hard to break, but that's okay. I'm just going to soak my house in gasoline, smoke a Newport to calm myself, and then flick some of the ashes onto the ground. You know, the old-fashioned way to set yourself on fire. Simple enough, right? Okay, let's do this. December 1st. 2022. 12 a.m. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I really wanted that one to work, but honestly, it was a little less painful than I expected. Still really painful, don't get me wrong, but I think that was user error more than anything else. The first 60 seconds were hellish, but after I exhaled enough smoke, I passed out from lack of oxygen. And from there, it was just your standard death via suffocation. And honestly, the red-hot flames licking up my calves and melting through my epidermis wasn't even the worst bit. No, the worst part was the way they laughed at me as I burned. They don't have mouths like we do. Don't have expressions like we do either. But I can always tell when they're laughing. They make this high-pitched keening noise like a rabbit bleeding out in an alleyway. Disturbing pieces of crap. Death 102. The Killing Joke. December 4th, 2022. 11.30pm. Seeing how difficult it was to find a crematorium, I thought finding a vat of acid to dissolve my entire body in would be equally hard. But after doing a little research online, I realized that acid is a lot more common than you'd think. 
I thought about pouring a cocktail of chemicals into my bathtub, but after the fire incident, I decided I wanted to treat myself a little instead. I read some horrific tales online about people falling into acidic hot springs, so I used my credit card to book a first class ticket to a national park that I had always wanted to visit, along with a one night stay in a luxury hotel. They thought it was luxurious too. The money, of course, will all reset like everything else does once I die, and if it doesn't reset, I won't have to worry about that, or anything else, ever again. Well, time to take a bath, I suppose. December 4th, 2022, 12am. That hurts, Jesus. It was like going to a Korean body scrub if the gloves were made of chicken wire, and if the water they poured over you was battery acid, which would have been fine except for the fact that I'm still here. Sorry. I don't mean to sound heated. It's just, someone said that acid would destroy me on a molecular level. And that sounded really smart, and like, maybe it would actually make a difference, and I guess I just... Well, I guess I just let myself hope. And instead, all I got was a whole lot of pain and a little bit more clarity. When I woke up this morning, those things were already gathered on the foot of my bed waiting for me. I always thought they didn't have expressions, but now I'm starting to realize they do. And I don't like that. Not one bit. Death 103. Jesus take the wheel. Although no one suggested another car accident, Part of me wonders if dying in a second car accident will somehow complete the cycle or something. I don't know. It sounds improbable, but I'll try anything once. Or twice now, I guess. But at least I've learned from my previous deaths. This time, I'm popping a handful of ibuprofens before I get behind the wheel and... I'm sorry that I stopped the log mid-sentence like that but I'm putting the death records to rest for now. I have to, because as I was writing that, someone knocked on my door. No, not knocked. Someone pounded on my door so hard that the entire frame shook. For a moment, I actually thought death 103 was going to be via violent home invasion. And honestly, I was fine with that. I haven't been murdered in that way before. So might as well add it to the log, right? Only when I swung open the door, it wasn't a robber, or a murderer, or a Jehovah's Witness at the door. Instead, it was a tall man with light brown hair and a desperate expression in his eyes. An expression that I recognized clearly, intimately. An expression I saw reflected back at me every time I glanced in a mirror. Without a word, the man stepped into my apartment and shut the door behind him. You, he said, his voice gruff. Are you the one who's been looking for me? Are you? He cleared his throat. Are you the one I killed?